like this. Yes. And then Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to start the first session of the morning. Uh, everyone who should be connected now is connected, I heard from the speakers. So let me just say very briefly, so that we don't lose too much time, that this session will be about fertility. And fertility, of course, has been very high on the agenda of many countries in Europe and in East Asia. Uh, with many policymakers concerned about very low fertility rates, especially in countries which have been facing uh, also a lot of out-migration, so a double effect of out-migration and low fertility. Uh, so this concern is, of course, to a large extent justified. But we also know from the data that many women, men and couples are not able uh, to realize their reproductive plans uh, even in uh, highly developed countries with highly developed family policies. And we don't want to focus this session just on discussing low fertility, because we are convinced that governments shouldn't simply just try to increase fertility rates. That's not the main role of the governments to try to make the populations of countries larger, to solve future problems in labor force, by having more babies today, because we don't know what the labor force needs will be in 20, 30 years. But we are convinced that the government should rather take a somewhat different approach to look what are the obstacles, what are the factors, what are the things which women, men and couples need to realize their reproductive choices. And with this perspective, we think the governments would be also much more focused on improving well-being and happiness of their population. And as a side effect of, of this, if the governments can crack this issue properly and can implement the right policies to support individual reproductive rights and choices, they will also, in the end of the day, reach somewhat higher fertility rates, possibly, or likely, than countries where the governments will not be able to properly address the needs of women, men and couples. I am Tomáš Sobotka from the Vienna Institute of Demography. I will be co-moderating this session. And I will introduce the speakers in a few minutes after a short video. But now I would like to give, word, give over the word to Alana Armitage, who will co-moderate the session with me. The floor is yours, Alana. Thank you, Thomas. Good morning, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is really a great pleasure to be co-moderating this session together with Dr. Thomas Sobotka. My name is Alana Armitage. I'm the Regional Director for UNFPA for Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and very excited about this panel. Uh, we have a stellar panel, as you can see, who we will introduce shortly. We have a number of panelists online with us, and I'd also like to welcome the hundreds of people who are online following us right now for the conference. Um, we're going to begin with a short video that brings voices from the region on this issue of fertility and family aspirations. If we can show that video, please. Pa imam jedno dijete, a voljela bih da imam dvoje, čisto iz razloga što sam i ja odrastala sa bratom i znam koliko to znači. Tako da još uvijek jedno. A ne mogu nikako zanemariti ni ekonomsku stabilnost koja je neophodna jer imam jedno dijete i znam koliko košta i ono sve što ide prije vrtića, njega djeteta i vrtić i škola, tako da kad to pomnožim sa dva, prilično je bitna i ekonomska stabilnost. Ša pas da šime pasa da mašom fmi, pa rašuje se vi preni familije pa je gdje tmode, da je na ritmeni ambijent šum tmir, 
gjithmon ku ka ma shumë fmi, ka ma shumë gzim, ma shumë hare, ushqimet janë ma të mira, ka ma shumë qeshura. Realisht, fmija është një kosta, pa e geni kosta e madhe. Po gjithashtu, edhe një një brengë që mu si si nanë, ka ka prej këtu tjetë, në thonë, gjdo lindje të fmijës tem, është betët si femë, betët është si pengë në karierë. Nuk është ma, nuk sot, bëhet një luft e madhe për të sistemuar me punë, mundësit nuk janë, bëhet një luft e gjatë, do më thënë, nëse në, nëse më parë baroj e fakultetin dhe ti koha e sistemimi të në punë ishte më shkurëtër, ta një luftojnë me vite, duke që mund pa punë, pa të anuras, nuk mund të sjeli në jetë një fmi. Sepse vite më përpara një vajzë nëse kalion të të 22-3 dhe më betje në shtëpi ajo shuaj si e ngellur në shtëpi dhe duaj pa tjetër të bëjnë nuset, të bënd të një fmi, ndërkoj që në ditë të sot me, Gratë dhe vajzë da duan më shumë bëjnë karierë, fokusojnë të këvetja, fokusojnë të këpuna, dhe tjetëra më e përhapura që në nge parë së fundë, një është që ke dhe shumë gratë që janë bërë nëna pa pasë një partner ma shku fare, pra janë bërë nëna dhe kanë fëmi të vetëve. Kështu që mund themi që është zbehur, nuk ka humbur, sigurisht, sepse ne duam shumë kohë që të arrim në këtë fazën që të humbi komplet stigma, po që është zbehur, është zbehur gëgja. Unem i arra shumë jetë ku jere ka të proqë më të asëma, e të arru më. Se pa kanë jere ka i masin dherë luqë që në më të acel, a që karë që më më vërë shatë anka më në këtë nërë kanë, vërë në karë vënë, të e në pastel, të e në stipet më të acel e të masin. Ara që në herë të njëre vite, sociala kanë i qakë, në shurë që ka të arbo vënë të anë, apës të ramë atë rëtë që në asën këtë esnë e lëvërë, ka lafë këtë anë, ma karë këtë, ka lafë vjerë, kira o paho vjerë, kira. Karë që më me të porër banë edhe asë më, e pjesë e lirë, porë o shumë ka e cënë, këtë më datë me të anë nga manë këtë nëri masi në arë që në përë. Once again, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome at the Plenary Ministerial Dialogue on Fertility, Choices, Opportunities and Policies. Before I introduce the speakers, I would like to liven up a little bit also the session by introducing an online poll. So you are very welcome to participate in an online poll at menti.com. I hope you will see. Yes, you see the link right behind. So menti.com. If you write the code which you see right there, but I can read it once, 27794086, you will get access to the website. And we have one very simple question. It's short. We have been discussing it seven times or ten times to make it shorter. So it's really short. What is the most important family policy that should be implemented in your country? Very simple question. So please participate in the poll. Uh, we will look at your answers, and if time allows, somewhere in the middle, we will also read some of your answers, including those, of course, from our online guests and participants. Now, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce you the speakers for today, and I will introduce them in the order in which they will respond to the first question. So, joining us online is a Deputy Minister for Labour and Social Policy, um, from, from Poland, Miss Barbara Socha. Joining here uh, in person is Miss Olga Batalina, Deputy Minister of Labor and Social Protection. Welcome. Joining us here also in person is Dr. Abduholik Amirzoda, Deputy Minister of Health and Social Protection of Population from Tajikistan. Joining us also here in the panel is Ms. Merita Jafai, General Director for Policy and Development from the Ministry of Health and Social Protection in Albania. Joining us online will be Ms. Jinkyong Park, Head of Secretariat of the Presidential Committee on Aging Society and Population. Joining our discussion online will be also Dr. Professor Anna Matisiak from the University of Warsaw. S 
Joining us here in person is Dr. Anna Daneva Markova, who is president of the Safe Motherhood Committee from North Macedonia. And last but not least, joining us virtually is Miss Adriana Radu from the Sex versus the Stork Association in Romania. Now I would like to kick off the discussion by welcoming, uh, welcoming our Polish guest, Miss Barbara Socha, uh, online with us. And I would like to ask the first question to, to the Deputy Minister for uh, Family, Labor and Social Policy. Miss Socha, Poland has launched an ambitious program called Family 500 Plus of providing each family a monthly benefit of 500 zloty per child. This program has improved the income situation of many families. How is the ministry ensuring that in addition to the income, families also have access to childcare, good quality education, healthcare and services, and that many mothers want to continue working and at the same time ensure uh, that their children have good quality education from early years onwards. Which policies do you introduce in order to improve access to these services, improve work-family balance of parents and human capital of the children? Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure and honor to join this uh, debate, this conference today. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation where there is a lot of uh, policies being implemented now for the current government in Poland, the family is a very important uh, thing. This is our priority to, to make family a center of our uh, social life, to treat family as a center of our, our uh, social life. Well, the program that you have mentioned, 500 plus, is, uh, is a big uh, challenging for us. It was... Uh, um, big challenge for us to implement it. It's costly, it's a huge investment in the Polish families, but this is what I would like to stress here. This is just one of the measures, one of the instruments that we implemented uh, five years ago, almost six years ago. So in terms of demography and the demographic uh, consequences or results, it is uh, still a new instrument. It is very similar to the ones that we see in some of the Western countries, some of the other European countries. So uh, what, uh, what is the next step for, for our gov government uh, was uh, two years ago, uh, our prime minister and uh, our government decided to uh, make another step, the next step on this road to increase the fertility rates in Poland. Uh, and uh, the next step is preparation of the demographic strategy. The document uh, is being finished now. Uh, we are after the uh, consultation round with very different uh, um, uh, societies, with very different uh, experts. Um, I, am, um, I am happy to... Uh, cooperate with uh, the scientists in demography and other uh, scientific disciplines to work on this document because we need a very comprehensive, complex and consistent set of policies uh, that can influence fertility because this is the very important condition. It needs to be complex and consistent and stable. Uh, over the next decades, not even the next government's next uh, cadences, but the, even the case. So, uh, in this uh, in this document, we defined the major, the most important areas that have influence on fertility rates, and uh, there is ten such areas: financial support, in which uh, we talk about the 500 plus program, is just. Uh, uh, measure in one of these areas. It's the, it's the financial side, the income side of the Polish families, uh, families, but this is not only transfer that we have in this financial area. This is also the taxing policies, um, uh, pension uh, systems, and uh, these are the three most important. But we have also other areas, and I'm glad that you have mentioned many other 
um, many other problems or challenges that we have. One of them is uh, uh, housing, and uh, because for the Polish people, having the own flat, own house, uh, is very important um, condition that needs to be uh, met to uh, make the decision about having uh, having children. So, what is our aim now within the new Polish deal is to in introduce instruments. And in fact, since January next year, we have two new instruments on the uh, in, in Poland in regards to housing housing problems. So we have the guaranteed uh, loan for the people who uh, who don't have their own. Uh, part of the investment needed uh, to, to have the mortgage loan to buy a flat or a house. The next, childcare. Uh, again, uh, within the new Polish deal since January, we have new measure, new instrument for the child care, to support childcare, uh, which is the, uh, I would say, addition to our current um, Toddler Plus program, which is uh, to develop the childcare institutions, the nurseries in Poland. We see very rapid growth of the number of places for, for the children under three in nurseries. But the new instrument is to support not only uh, in uh, providing the institutional care, which is one of the, of course, forms, but we want to support all the forms that are preferred by parents. And we know that in Poland, parents prefer uh, different, have different preferences regarding the childcare for, for kids under three. So the instrument now is uh, another 500 slots to finance the, all the forms of the childcare. Where in regards to the labor market... Ms. Socha, I am very sorry to interrupt you. We are running a little bit out of time now. But I would like to thank you very much for the topics you have mentioned, including child care, stable policies and housing provision. I hope we will have more time to return to some of those. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Socha. That was also very interesting to hear, and I also hope that we'll hear more about the alternative forms of child care that you were mentioning. It would be interesting to hear. I think it's an important topic. It's my pleasure now to welcome uh, Ms. Olga Batalina, Excellency Deputy Minister of Labor and Social Protection. Could you tell us, please, um, we know that Russia has implemented several programs supporting families, including the Maternal Capital Program. Um, how has the Maternal Capital Program evolved over time, and what are the main uh, discussions and plans about the future program? Thank you. Доброе утро. Демография – сложная штука. В ней нет ни простых, ни очевидных решений. И мы, Российская Федерация, имея очень разветвленную, широкую демографическую программу, постоянно ищем новые решения и учимся у всех стран, которые так же, как и мы, собственно, стремятся к повышению количества рождений. Наша демографическая программа – это программа президента. Она реализуется через национальный проект демографии. Well, it's really... Множество этапов, на каждом из которых мы определяли приоритеты. Первый этап – 2007 год. Именно тогда был введен материнский капитал. Материнский капитал – это единовременная сумма, которая выдается... Это 6,5 тысяч долларов. Uh, for different purposes. Experience tells us that 80% of families um, um, use this exp expense to improve their lives, like mortgages, house refurbishments. Um, the maternal capital is directed to uh, pension insurance. They can pay uh, their kids' education, uh, preschool, nurseries, additional education. You can receive financial support just as well. Uh, but we have uh, reached to the conclusion that support is needed not only for second children, because uh, one used to get this uh, maternal capital for a second child anyway, but we, what we realized was that we should support third children as well. 
Uh, now it is our priority to support first childbirth as well. It is now uh, one child plus in each family. If there is one child, we stimulate the second. If there are two children, we stimulate the third. And now, if a family may is uh, making a choice right now, we support the first child. And we're acting along different directions. This is financial support for families, firstly. And every month, we provide support to 9 million children across the country. That's every, every fourth child. There are different conditions. Uh, it depends on the child's age as well. Uh, so support is available. Uh, but what matters is the basis for it. This is part of uh, the family's personal, uh, permanent income. Uh, it is increasingly important when children take their decisions whether to have a child. There is a mortgage uh, scheme, uh, low interest mortgage, and maternal capital might be used to redeem, to pay back this uh, kind of mortgage. If a, ch a third child is born, there's a one-off payment, uh, which is uh, high, large enough in order to repay the mortgage. But this is not enough. And our third direction is to successfully combine um, career and life. Women do not have to choose whether to pursue their careers or whether to give birth to children. This is achieved through a system of social support, through uh, holidays, maternal leave for a period of three years. We're now working on uh, trying to, to put these provisions in uh, the labor law. Uh, and this will allow mothers working at home to uh, retain their working life. And this in combination with uh, rearing a child. We keep looking for new solutions and I go back from this conference and at our next meeting um, with the country's president, we will be talking about demographic issues. I'm sure that we will be able to improve birth rates in our country. Back in 2013, 2015, thanks to an active strategy, it was uh, the first time uh, over a period of 20 years, we have achieved some birth rates, population growth, when uh, birth rates exceeded mortality and our population started growing. This is our objective for the future, a natural population growth. Very interesting, and I hope that we will have that opportunity to exchange experiences um, around these types of policies. Let me turn now to Tajikistan. Uh, Dr. Abdulholik Amirzoda, welcome. Uh, Tajikistan has a relatively high fertility and high rates of maternal and infant mortality, so a bit of a different situation than what we're seeing in other parts of the region. Does the government have specific policies to discourage early marriage and childbearing, especially of teenage girls. Over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, I will uh, use this occasion to express our thankfulness to the organizers. Uh, uh, providing access to reproductive health services is a priority in our national policy. And we have a national program for reproductive health funded by the state budget. This is the first strategic document which is tied up with the budget. The 
reproductive health service has been institutionalized at all levels. We have 90 reproductive health centers uh, nationally, regionally, and locally. There are trained experts who provide services, family planning services, and we also have a system to provide support, reproductive health support to young people. We have medical youth centers providing help to young people. We have also voluntary programs for people aged from sixth grade, uh, children from sixth grade to tenth grade, uh, related to reproductive health. Uh, human rights based policy uh, has been adopted by the government, and this is the basis for supporting female health. Since 1998 until 2020, uh, 20, Um, child infant mortality has been reduced to 14 percent and the fertility coefficient came down to 3.8. Regardless of all the steps to reduce maternal mortality, we haven't achieved uh, high indicators. We have ambitious tasks designed to provide to achieve sustainable development and to accommodate the country specifics. Uh, we need funding uh, in order to improve our reproductive health situation. Thank you very much for outlining how Tajikistan has provided sexual and reproductive health and, and women's health services to, to young people and families. Very important. Let me now turn to Albania. Um, Ms. Merita Jafai, General Director for Policy and Development at the Ministry of Health and Social Protection. Um, can you tell us, Ms. Jafai, what are the main obstacles for women and men from Albania when planning a family, what policies are being considered by the government to support them? Please, over to you. Thank you very much, Alana, and especially uh, big thanks about this very wonderful organization of this uh, conference. Uh, I would like to thank a lot also the Bulgarian Authority for organizing this meeting and uh, also the representative from the UNFPA office in Albania, Mrs. Emanuela Bello, with the expert on demographic standard, Mr. Alban Uli from Albania. Speaking about uh, the Albanian policies, we have to go through two different uh, policies. The policies which are made by the government of Albania at the central level, and also the policies which are made by the local level. So uh, it's a very uh, integrated uh, system which is working in Albania. The history of the fertil fer uh, fertility in Albania, if we will go back at the year 1960, we had six child for a family. But now it's 1.6 uh, ch child for, for the family. So as you have seen in, uh, in the global way, the demographic uh, situation is going to be very difficult, and uh, the Albanian government has prioritized some of the, the, the policies. The first one, it's linked to the empowerment of the families. So in which way? The, the empowerment of the families are going uh, also to, to be in focus through the, the employment, and also to facilitate the women which are employed in somewhere. Uh, so, uh, we have also changed the labor code and the paternity uh, leave is going to be provided and paid for one year for the mother and the father. For the new families at the local level, we are supporting through the social housing and uh, so it is a very good opportunity for them to establish a very strong and good family. 
At the central level also, we have uh, the management information system established in the Institute of Public Health for the contra contraceptives. So we don't have stock out and uh, this is uh, managed in very well situation. We are still working on drafting a new law on sexual and reproductive health care. So it is covering also the gaps which are not covered by the, the previous law. At the same time, we, have, uh, work, we are working on the education system. We have established a new curricula which has a comprehensive sexuality education and gender mainstreaming cover. A lot of work is done on preparation of new strategy on uh, uh, child protection and children's rights, also the new strategy on gender equality and the new strategy on the, the health sector, which are very, very well uh, covering also the, the, the problem of uh, uh, the, the reproductive health care for the mothers and also how to, to protect uh, the children. Again, I would like just to say that at the local level, uh, the, the municipality of Tirana is providing the basket of the child for all the, the, ch the child born. We have also the baby bonus, which have increased the number of the borns. For example, during the year 2020, we have uh, uh, 32,000 new born compared with the year 2019, which the number was 30,000. Again, we have to, to uh, I have to say also, we have legalized the abortion, so we don't have any maternal mortality, mortality and from the abortion, and uh, the, this work is being done also in the new law on reproductive health care, assisted from the fertilization expert. The strategic plan on promotion is also very well worked and uh, all of the strategic documents are costed, are supported and provided with financial support from the budget of the state, integrated with the donor's contribution. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Jafai. Uh, I especially liked, among many points you mentioned, I especially like to mention the municipality of Tirana because uh, local governments are important actors in family policies in supporting women and men and couples. Uh, now I would like to hand the word over uh, to give the word to Dr. Anna Daneva Markeva, who is the president of the Safe Motherhood Committee from to North Macedonia, and the question is, how is North Macedonia supporting the rights of women to make informed choices about childbearing? The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. North Macedonia has strong commitment by all stakeholders to implement the global goals. Uh, we go further, especially with the zero maternal death and zero AMET for family planning. Demographic resistance society understands that uh, all demographic trends are influenced by a complex of different interconnected set and factors as social, cultural, environmental, political, and therefore, uh, therefore they seek for comprehensive evidence-based policy that place people and their rights and choices on first place. There is no simple and only one magical solution to this problem. Only holistic approach to demographic change could yield lasting results. After all, I think that countries need to be attractive enough for people to want to live there and to have child, children there. To achieve this, progress is needed in tracking structural problems such as political instability, weak economic co corruption, the lack of good governments, and of course exclusion and discrimination of women. Specific measures on this field we need to enable people or women to have as many children as they want 
including all the measures about uh, low housing prices, flexible working conditions, kindergarten, as it was mentioned, and many others. But focusing on fertility is unlikely sometimes to solve uh, the demographic crisis, especially if the focus is in not in right uh, in right way. It was in my country in the past some of the ethno-national policy that uh, have no result in increasing natality. Demographic trends, including the trend of towards lower fertility rates, cannot be changed overnight. This is because reasons are complex and include economic, social, cultural factors. Putting fertility in the foreground when solving a problem arises the risk of destruction or neglect the real reason why people have difficulties to start a family and to have a child. The best way to solve the problem of low fertility rate is to allow people to have as many children as they want, to remove the barriers and to prevent people from having as many children as they want is crucial. It ensures choice, respect, of human rights in a comprehensive, holistic approach, which will cover not only fertility, but a range of demographic change. On the other hand, in the individual level, having fewer or not having ch children can be conscious choice that people make, as well as an expression of greater power of action and involvement of that woman in uh, decision about family, career, and manner of life. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much to Dr. Anna Daneva Markeva, Markova. Now I would like to connect with our guest from Asia. Uh, we are going online again. Um, and we have uh, a guest from South Korea, which is also a country with very low fertility, uh, even lower than in many European countries. So joining us online is Ms. Jin Kyung Park, who is head of Secretariat, Presidential Committee on Aging, Society and Population. Welcome. The question I would like to ask you is the following. South Korea has very low fertility rate. What policies were implemented by South Korea in response to low fertility? And what results have been achieved so far? What were the main challenges and what are the main remaining policy gaps in helping Korean couples to realize their reproductive plans? The floor is yours. Yeah, I'm Jin Kyung Park in Korea. Thank you for inviting me to this meaningful dialogue. It is a great pleasure to share Korea's policy experience and hear Europe's perspective and policy directions. The Korean government pushes for population control policy between 1960 and 1990, which resulted in rapidly declining fertility. To reverse the trend, we should to toward policies encouraging childbirth in 1996. Despite the remedial effort, the fertility rate has continuously decreased. Since 2005, the Korean government has made an interagency effort to deal with population challenges. Under the leadership of the Presidential Committee on Aging Society and Population Policy, relevant ministries and local governments have jointly developed and implemented a series of basic plans on low birth rates in an aging society. When it first started, the government focused on reducing the burden of childbirth and care. The current administration emphasized the, uh, that the social structure needs to be fundamentally revamped while individuals' choices are respected. 
In 2018, the government announced the policy roadmap on low fertility and population aging, uh, making a paradigm shift in family policy from simple, uh, simply encouraging childbirth to raising the quality of life. Guided by this policy direction, the fourth basic plan was developed for the year 2021 to 2025. The main policy objectives include the increased life quality of individuals, gender equal and fair society, and social reform in response to demographic changes. Previously, the policy focus was mostly on supporting pregnant and new mothers to raise the number of childbirths, which are limited to scope of health rights protection to women at childbearing ages. However, with the shift in the policy paradigm, the fourth basic plan extended protection to sexual and reproductive health rights for both the women and men. Having said that such policy changes were introduced only in 2018 and just started getting momentum in 2021. Not enough time has passed for people to see real changes yet. Long-term approaches will be needed to ensure that major policies produce the desired effect. I will continue to say main challenges and police gaps. Complex factors influence reproductive lens. In particular, the young generation in Korea has different attitudes toward marriage and parenthood uh, than previous generations and offer the work-life balance as a core value. These changing perception and values among young people pose major challenges to supporting reproductive plans. According to a survey targeting the youth in their 30s, their ideal number of children is 2.12, which is far lower than the actual TFI rate of 0.84. This indicates that low fertility in Korea is driven by involuntary delay and avoidance of childbirth. Another challenge is scaling of financial investment and communicating police intention to reduce police gaps and increase in support for young people reluctant to get married and have kids. As of 2017, Korea's public spending on families accounted for 1.3% of its GDP, lower than OECD average of 2.34%. Bold investment should be made to reverse low fertility within the range the financial status allows. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Ms. Jin Kyung Park from South Korea. Uh, I really appreciated uh, all the efforts which you named, which Korean government is implementing to support women, men, couples in realizing their childbearing decisions and reproductive plans, but also the fact that the document, the latest document of the Korean government is focused on improving the quality of life of people rather than on increasing fertility or marriage. Thank you. Now, let me just very briefly, because we are running a little bit late, mention a couple of key results of the poll. So some half an, half an hour ago or 20 minutes ago, I, I got a message that we got more than 30 responses. Maybe we got many more than 30 now. But out of these more than 30 responses, I could read some of them, but if I summarize it really in a simplistic and maybe a little bit brutal way, many of them center on three interrelated issues. One is provision of childcare and more broadly combining work and family life. That's not very surprising, but that, that's a topic which is repeated there several times. Universal access to standardized free childcare services. The next concerns money. 
economic support to families. Again, not very surprising, but important to have it reiterated again. So people really need, especially young people really need uh, support. But beyond money, uh, there is also mentioned quite often uh, opportunities for young people. So young people need jobs. Young people need to achieve some balance in their life and social security. So that's something we shouldn't be forgetting as well, that even before people can start deciding about parenthood, uh, they need to achieve some other goals uh, very often and governments should keep the importance of, of young people getting jobs and uh, achieving stability in their lives, getting apartments uh, that should be kept in mind. With that, I would very much like to welcome our next speaker, Professor Anna Matisiak from the University of Warsaw, who is one of the best experts in Europe on family policies, fertility rates. So I'm very happy to have you here, Anna, and the floor is yours to tell us something about the gaps between childbearing desires and um, realizing them and what governments can do to support couples. Thank you, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure uh, to share with you our knowledge that we demographers uh, have uh, about uh, fertility uh, and uh, its determinants and policies with my help. So let me start from talking about whether people want to have children, because, well, <laughs> if they don't want, then policies will not really help. So the I have some good news. Uh, people want to have children and they actually want to have on average two or even a little bit more than two. And this desire holds already since around, for around three decades since we have data, despite changing social norms and family behaviors. And it is so even in countries with persistently low fertility. What we also know is that highly educated women also want to have on average two children very similar to what the lower educated women want. Unfortunately, it is the highly educated women who are least successful in realizing their fertility intentions, in particularly in low fertility countries. This suggests that low fertility countries actually fail to address the needs of this, part, uh, this uh, highly educated woman. This is an important failure, given that the highly educated women is, a is the proportion of highly educated women is growing dynamically around the world. So which barriers do people face when deciding whether and when to have children? And what is this particular group of highly educated women? What does this group of highly educated women want? So there are various reasons. They can be health related and are very important. And I guess the experts speaking after me will talk about this. The reason can be lack of the partner. And this is something which policies cannot do much about. And there are also economic barriers. Uh, and here policies can do quite a lot because they can eradicate financial difficulties, they can lower the housing costs for young adults, support them with finding a job or help them to combine paid work and care. And these are the most common barriers people face and in general, policies can reduce them. We have to remember, however, that people are different. Some of you actually mentioned this aspect of that. They have different preferences, needs and expectations. Low educated individuals are most likely to face financial pressure and thus financial transfers can indeed help them. Higher educated may want to combine paid work with care and thus they need childcare policies and parental leaves. Uh, highly educated women increasingly also want their partners to become more involved uh, in uh, providing childcare and taking breaks from work so that they can also work. But there is a substantial heterogeneity within these two groups as well, when it comes to their preferences, their job conditions. For instance, some can work from home and the others not. And their family arrangements. Some may have grandparents living nearby and others not. This all implies that single policies 
may not bring satisfactory results as they will respond only to the needs of a fraction of the population. What we need is a policy package which covers financial transfers, parental leave policies, childcare facilities, but also other measures, not typical family policies, such as, but, but, but measures which improve quality of life, such as um, better transportation, good healthcare provision, friendly family surroundings, provision of cheap housing, support in finding a job in case of a loss of a job, so that life is easier and doesn't constitute a constant struggle for people. Policies tend to work better in countries where people have higher trust in the government and where the policies are stable and do not change rapidly. Having a child is a long-term commitment and where policies change often and the trust to the government is low, people may not believe that the policy will last. Time is needed for the trust to be built. There are, of course, some exceptions from this rule, though illusory. In some situations, people may actually react very quickly to the implementation of the policy and have the children they planned earlier. These are, for instance, baby bonuses paid around the birth of a child. People who plan to have a child anyway may speed up this decision in order to receive the transfer. Uh, deaths may be particularly true if they expect the policy will be suspended in the future. They will not have more children, but they will have them sooner. We will not observe a sudden, uh, in this situation, we will observe a sudden increase in the number of births, followed by a decline. No gain in terms of completed fertility, but many unpleasant consequences for childcare institutions or schools who have to adjust the number of places, first to a sudden increase in births, and then a decline. So to sum up, what people need is a policy package which accepts that people are different and have different needs, and which is stable so that people can trust it, can trust it will remain in force for years. So you can ask me, will fertility increase to this magic number of two we wanted to increase, um, two children per woman, of course, if the policy package is implemented. Well, it may increase, though I wouldn't expect it will jump immediately from, let's say, 1.3 to 2 or above 2, especially if there are, because there are many also intervening factors which affect fertility decision, such as a recession or the pandemic which happened. So does this mean that we lose money for nothing because these policies are so expensive? Well, first of all, policies can prevent fertility decline in unexpected circumstances, like a recession. So in that respect, they will help. But second, even if we don't get, if we don't get the big increase in fertility, let's actually think why we strive to increase it. Is it to reach the magic number of two? No, the governments actually don't want to, that the main idea which the governments have is because they are worried uh, that the population will decline or will, will age. And this will have substantial repercussion for the economic, social, and um, cultural potential of the country. So let's think whether the policy package I was talking about will help us to alleviate the consequences of population aging or even population decline. And Thank the answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Anna. Matisiak, sorry, I have to interrupt you now. Uh, we are running a little bit late, but thank you so much for wrapping up decades of demographic research into the impact of family policies in five or six minutes. Uh, so we have many points to return to in, in our next discussion. Now over to Alana. Thank you, Thomas. And thank you so much, Dr. Matisiak. I, I also wish that we had more time to go into some of the issues that you discussed, but clearly, I mean, your, your big message is that people want to have children in the region, and they're not often having the number of children they would like to have. So rather than focusing on the fertility rates and trying to achieve certain numerical, numerical targets, we should really be trying to help women and families have the number of children they want to have. And of course, you gave us some excellent 
um, data on and evidence on that. But before we get back to that conversation, let me introduce our final panelist, um, Adriana Radu. Nice to see you online. I haven't seen you in a long time, Adriana. Welcome. Uh, she is the head of Sex versus the Stork Association in Romania. And uh, Adriana, we'd like to ask you, what in your view is the most important policy that should be implemented in the future to support women, men, and couples in realizing their reproductive aspirations, their reproductive plans? Over to you, Adriana. Thank you so much, Alana. It's very nice to see you and uh, very nice to see everyone. I'm honored to be able to speak. Um, I was very focused on talking about the present and I found myself um, compelled to think about the past and I, I, I want to say something on that first. Um, and I want to talk about my mother. Uh, when she was 21, uh, my mother one day went to work she was working as an electrician in a, a local ship factory in Romania. And uh, when she arrived, she was told that she has to go to the medical office. Um, there, she was forced to strip and undergo a gynecological checkup, whose purpose was to uh, find out if um, she was hiding a pregnancy as uh, abortion was banned in Romania at the time. All women in the factory were forced to do the same. Uh, for my mother, there was no point, uh, seeing that uh, she had, hadn't had any sexual relations up to that point, uh, which was an extra reason to make this one of the most traumatic uh, experiences in her life. And of course, generally banning abortion in Romania was to no real avail. Statistics from the time showed that uh, while fertility uh, rates raised after abortion was banned in 1965, at some point it stagnated. Women and families adapted to the situation. They improvised contraception. Women went for, for back alley abortions and uh, more than 10,000 women in Romania died uh, from them, especially since they didn't have the possibility to go across the border to get an abortion somewhere else as in some countries it happens today. Um, and if we think about the present, when I was 24, I started Sex versus the Stork and we offer education online on sexual and reproductive health and women's rights. Um, and we've been very successful with around 80 million views. The, con the conversation is very important for a lot of young people. And we are in contact with a lot of young people in Romania and know what they want. Um, I think that what we see is that moving forward, the social contract needs to be one that is based um, in gender equality, which means maintain the commitment to gender equality and equal rights, um, including the right to decide when, if, and how many children one has. Um, I urge everyone uh, who is in a position of power to check your child mortality and maternal mortality rates. If they are high in your country, start there with better health care, then go to better housing, better nutrition, vaccination, check your violence against women rates, if they are high, start there. Um, check the educational levels um, between men and women. If they are not equal, start there. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Adriana. And thank you for that very powerful reminder um, that restricting reproductive rights actually not only harms women and women's health, but it also does nothing to uh, achieve goals related to numerical targets and impact on fertility rates. I think your, your message is extremely powerful that we need to invest in the sexual and reproductive health education of, uh, of the population. So now we have, uh, let's see, how much time do we have left, Thomas? We have about 15 minutes to have a perhaps more spicy conversation now, looking at all the different things that we've spoken about and having people's opinions. So let me ask a, a generic question to all of our panelists, both online and here in person. If you could tell us, what do you think, based on everything that you've just heard, what do you think is 
the most important policy that should be implemented in the future to support women, men, and couples to realize their reproductive plans. Um, I would like to go back to Poland. If I can go back to you, Madam Deputy Minister. And, and I would also love to hear, because you didn't finish, you weren't able to tell us what were some of the other childcare options. I think that's really important to hear what women, what their preferences are in Poland as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, I am glad to hear that. Uh, I think we uh, we all agree that the, the policies need to be complex and consistent. So this is not one uh, one instrument that uh, changes. Uh, that, that, that this is a game changer, and uh, people are different, as we heard, and people have different preferences in Poland. Most of of the women uh, want to combine uh, jobs with uh, with childcare. What we see, uh, the difference is the, the period. They, they, they um, think that this is needed to be uh, with the child at home. One part of, uh, of, of women uh, uh, say that this is one year is enough. Uh, the second half, the second third, I, I would say, because it's mostly the same groups, uh, thinks it's two years and uh, the rest thinks it's uh, three years. But most of the women Almost 100% of the women want to combine uh, jobs with uh, with childcare, with having kids. So our uh, objective is to create such conditions that enable them to have this opportunity. So uh, with our new instrument, we want to support all the preferences. So if the woman chooses to go back to work after one year of the maternal and parental leave that we have in Poland, uh, then uh, she can spend this additional uh, support uh, to fund the nurseries. So this is uh, this is um, uh, this is a bigger availability, financial availability for for the nurseries. If the woman wants to stay home uh, for another year, then it's uh, the financial support for her. We also see some preferences to have the childcare being given by the grandparents or other uh, person who is. Um, uh, from 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 family, so we want to support all of them. What we also uh, have as a priority is to uh, develop the family-friendly labor market. And I had yesterday a great discussion with some HR experts in Poland, women, mostly women and mothers, and we were talking about the flexibility of the jobs of the work. We now proceed with the new project uh, regarding the remote uh, remote jobs and remote work, regulate the remote working um, teleworking in in Poland. We know that pandemic in this area had some positive uh, um, positive results because it uh, increased the the, the, the the time increased the, the, the days that we have the. Mm, uh, that we have this uh, possibilities to work uh, from, from work remotely. And uh, we also uh, want to work on some areas that makes uh, women, make women and men also feel stable about their jobs. So we want to uh, introduce some uh, one uh, contract, job contract, uh, to reduce the number of fixed term contracts uh, in Poland. Because Excellent. This is one, yeah. So these are, I think, the, the most important measures. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. It's really, it's really good to hear about this differentiated approach that you have, which is in line with what Dr. Matisiak was speaking about. Uh, Madam Deputy Minister of Labor and Social Protection from the Russian Federation, could we have your reflections on this question? Вы знаете, семьям очень важно быть уверенным, что государство Uh, mothers have to be together with their children regardless of uh, what period of their development we're talking about. What matters for the pandemic period with uh, reduced incomes, we have managed to cover 28 million children and we have paid more than $15 billion in order to prop up their income. Uh, On top of that, mothers with a lot of children or fathers with many children, uh, they get retired earlier. The focus in, is on preschool, uh, but we are trying 
to boost their willingness to have children. This is why we are putting our focus on traditional family values. We uh, have made amendments to our constitution and family values uh, have been promulgated in our are enshrined in our constitution. And family moods go in line with that quite a lot. 90% of Russians believe that the family is a basic value. Uh, the right thing to do is to uh, develop a communication strategy to try and explain people that having children is not so hard and not so expensive as some people think. Um, we are running a video explaining to families how good it is to have children. Three times dessert with icicles, mud baths, a stick to measure how deep the river is, designer clothing, um, enchanted princess, uh, trip in uh, cosmic space, flying carpets, and a flooring which looks uh, like an eruption of lava use the national demographic project because children are what matters most. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Minister, and thank you for the, the lovely video as well. Uh, thank you, Deputy Minister. Uh, <clears throat> the most uh, well implementing reproductive plans and the human rights protection plans, we are talking about uh, the financial reproductive health plan which will provide sustainability and will cover, um, will reach out to populations that need it. Interinstitutional cooperation on reproductive health matters uh, is also necessary. We need to see this from the perspective of social, economic and environmental elements. All this uh, needs to be integrated with the reproductive health program to take measures for hygiene and medical help. Uh, also, we need to address social norms and address and be that this will enable us to implement so. Thank you, Dr. Amirzoda. Um, I, I got cut off when you were talking about the social norms, but I think that's an incredibly important point uh, that you're making. Um, back to Albania, Ms. Jafai, General Director for Policy and Development at the Ministry of Health. What, what are you, your views on this question, please? Actually, we, we have been faced with uh, the pandemic situation and we have to see everything in a different way. The first one, I think it's very important to have a communication strategy with all the young generation and also to be focused on the education of the children. And the second one is empowerment of the families. Where we are, when we are speaking about the families, it's not only the employment, the social housing, the education, or the, the, the social assistance and the social protection but also the health care, the nutrition, it's very important. And during this period of time, it's also uh, how we have to take care about the mental health of the people. Because now we, uh, as far as we know, the, the pandemic situation and the lockdown uh, in the global uh, way, it, was, it has given a, a big impact to all the people including the children, the young generation, the families, the women and the men. So uh, we have also to reduce the, the violence uh, 
Now we are uh, at the time that uh, uh, we are following the 16 days of activism under the violence against the women. And it is uh, a very good time just to th say stop the violence. It, is, uh, it has a very big impact uh, on, uh, on, on the family and uh, on declining the, the fertility. On the other hand, uh, it's uh, very important uh, to have an awareness campaign. So, uh, in which way we have to think about together how we can uh, organize and uh, also uh, draft uh, one uh, uh, awareness campaign, one strategy on communication in order to inform the people and then also to have the intermediators, how they can work in online or virtual way or face to face. This is the way that we have to think for the future because the, the time is changed, of course, uh, the employment of the women and empowerment of the families has to be linked to the green economy, but also uh, including uh, the, the climate change and also uh, the, the development of the technology, the digitalization system. So we have to think in a different way and uh, only together we can do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Thank you very much. I think you've raised a, a really important point, um, which is about supporting the families that we actually live in. Um, and I think that w we do need a new approach because we have tried to support a, a particular type of family model. And uh, I think we really need to look at what's happening within families and support those families. You, you mentioned the issue of violence. Adriana also mentioned the issue of violence. Are we doing enough to look at the impact that violence against women has on fertility rates? I think you, you raised something that we also need to include in our, in our discussions on this issue. Um, now, uh, I'd like to go to North Macedonia. Dr. Daneva, please could you give us your short reflections? Thank you, Alana, for your question. Well, the focus and the aim of solving this uh, issue is, in my country, to work on family planning and comprehensive sexual education in primary school. Why? Because the birth of adolescent pregnancy is relatively high and we must go further with all the measures that we need in this field, especially use of oral contraceptive, moral, modern contraceptive that uh, are necessary for good women's health. About the comprehensive sexual education in primary school, we need that for young women because they must be aware about the need to take care for their reproductive health till the moment when they realize, when they want to realize their reproductive roles as a woman. They must be planned each pregnancy because planning, family planning is essential to have good pregnancy and after that good newborn health. Uh, we will continue with proactive policy decision in this field at the same time in transforming in that it, that it emphasizes the need to rethink some traditional norms in which uh, especially is related to the woman in family and society. And I hope that as still now with the great support of UNFPA in my country, building bridges, partnerships, uh, we will achieve all the goals that we have committed as a country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Markova. Important points. And now to Ms. Park in Korea, please. Over to you. Ms. Park, I believe you're on mute. We can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Both women and men should be able to achieve their professional aspirations, whether they have children or not. Uh, making bold, bold social investment will be imperative, so the families will face less financial, time and physical burden associated with the childbirth and care. Also, social conditions must be improved to make work life 
more compatible with family commitments. Under the four under the fourth wage plan, the Korean government focused on raising the life quality of its people. Through close interagency collaboration, we aim to implement comprehensive and multi-faced family policies, including work-life balance, gender equality at workplaces, uh, increased public responsibility for child care, sexual and reproductive health rights protection, respect for family diversity, and so forth. Our focus will be on creating and strengthening the social infrastructure that promotes better life quality and gender equality, so that both women and men can choose to combine work and family life. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Park, and thank you really for joining us uh, in this panel. It's excellent to have the views from outside the region and exchange these experiences. Uh, Dr. Sabotka, with, with your permission, I'm just going to ask uh, Dr. Anna Matisiak for 30 seconds. I'm surprising you online here. <laughs> if I can ask you just very briefly if you have any further reflections on what you've heard today. Um, 30 seconds from you, please. Okay, very difficult. Uh, so I was glad to see that various countries implement various policies and they are aware of the fact that people have different preferences. And I was actually thinking about the question that you asked, uh, what policy I would implement if I could choose only one. And it's very difficult just because people have different needs and expectations. But I thought that if I was to choose, I would actually use development of childcare. And I would just to say only why. Uh, because it may not only increase fertility, but it can also improve the human capital of children. Uh, we often forget about this. We are worried that perhaps childcare will have negative influence on children, but studies show and show really repeatedly that childcare can actually uh, improve the cognitive, social and behavioral de development of children and also erase social inequalities by helping, helping especially those children from more disadvantaged backgrounds. So these are my 30 seconds. Thank you. I think that was excellent. Thank you so much. Thomas, back to you. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Thank you so much for participating in this very stimulating session. Uh, we don't really have time to wrap up uh, the comments and it would be very, very difficult to wrap up all the types of policies and issues which have been discussed here. But I am especially delighted that many of the policymakers and many of our panelists were stressing uh, different needs of different couples and policies which are really aimed towards supporting well-being and aspirations and reproductive rights of individuals. So rather than people being here for the governments and governments making policies to increase our numbers, uh, we are shifting uh, the story, we are shifting the emphasis that on governments who need to provide policies which really support people's well-being. And, and we heard also from South Korea very clearly uh, going in that direction. Uh, I want to mention two more things. Stability has been mentioned also by the Polish Deputy Minister. Thank you so much. So family policies go well beyond the individual mandates of individual governments. This is not a four-year thing. They need to be built over time and they need to be really uh, considered with a very, very long time horizon in mind. I want to mention data. We need data. We often talk about aspirations of young people, of couples, maybe men. We don't know often what the main barriers are in many countries. So please consider this. Uh, we need more surveys, we need more solid evidence. And finally, to continue this conversation, we, have, we are launching the SOFIA Alliance of the policy and practice community. So we will have many opportunities to reflect on many of these points which have been raised here and continue this conversation in the coming years. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you to all the panelists online and here in place. And have a nice day, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Dr. Sabatka, if you, if you allow me also just to say thank all the panelists online and in the room. Um, I, I think that uh, this was a really excellent session. We got a lot of good um, nuggets of information. And as you said, the, Sophia, the, the purpose of the SOFIA Alliance is to share just these types of experiences. Each and every country has something to share. And so we look forward to your joining the SOFIA Alliance in order to continue this conversation. Thank you. Allô, allô.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, we're running a little late, so I'm going to start. Um, thank you all so much for being here and for attending our panel on gender equality and family policies. I'm Leah Green. I'm a journalist and filmmaker for The Guardian newspaper in London. Um, I just wanted to quickly say thank you to all involved in the previous panel on fertility. Um, the themes discussed in that, such as looking simply beyond birth rates, um, and thinking in a more nuanced way about family structures has provided a really good springboard for our discussion um, as we're going to carry on some of those themes. So gender equality and family policies is an issue that we all know is important, not just for us as individuals, um, but for the future prosperity of the countries that we come from. Our discussion today will focus on what leaders can do to support families, that's men, women and their children, through policies and attitudes that have gender equality at their hearts. Um, I'm sure many of you were also sitting in the audience yesterday afternoon during the panel on democracy and demography. Um, I was struck by a phrase introduced by the UNFPA's executive director, Natalia Kahnem. She said that demography that does not centre gender equality is doomed to fail. And the reason I wanted to repeat that is that it really gets to the heart of what this panel is about. So with that clarifying message ringing in our ears, I would like to introduce our panel. We'll be hearing from eight people today. From North Macedonia, we have Her Excellency, Ms. Jagoda Shakhpaksa. She is the Minister of Labour and Social Policy. From Moldova, we have Mr. Marcel Spatari, Minister of Labour and Social Protection. From Ukraine, we're joined by Ms. Irina Mikichak, Deputy Minister of Health. From Hungary, we have Mr. Gergely Ekler, the State Secretary for Family Policy Strategy. And joining us virtually, we have Ms. Maria Sirengela, Greece's Deputy Minister of Labour and Social Affairs. Ms. Alia Aliasir, the UN Women's Regional Director for Europe and Central Asia. And finally, Ms. Sandria Horina from the Austrian Development Agency. Thank you all so much for being here and for lending us your expertise and thoughtfulness in this discussion to come. My co-moderator today, on the end over there, is um, Dr. Gabriela Alvarez Minte. She is the UNFPA's Regional Director for Eastern European Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and you'll be hearing from her very soon. Um, before we get going, we would like to show you a video with voices from the region which highlights the importance of family policies that hold gender equality at their core. And after that, um, Gabriella will kick off our conversation. Thank you. Kaj nas nema na sve ušte ravnopravnost pomogu mažiti ženite okolo završovanjata na domašnjete obrski grižata okolo deteto. Jaz se zemam za ličen primen. Po završovanjata na rabotata, prve na deteto in domašnjete obrski. Sekako tukaj deno traje 24 časa in reči si je na vozmožno se, da se završi v eden den. Sva situacija še tako pila rsad, ga ca ta ucna urad še mu uhe, da otan pripirda pira, ga ca heli še ušlija, te mi stoji srom, me jo ho pili, ali ba ošta nevta, te mi te orom i rebulija rom. Zogadac, mama sam sa hulšija da deda, ali sa ucilovat, ba ošta roca, es če na džahši, a ucilovat ase, ali da, am še tkoši v stilu trota, ne bravi, kot čar tole vide. Es zaljen, tkini schov, ne bravi, da bravi, od kojem to vrlo me, da ga znaev, mi daro, vel ga mi gosa, da če me šulija, da hšira, te es, ico jo sa, es, et goj, da ga ca, uher hul situacije, vse, da mu kide bule basro, kacija, radros, ba ošo iz, Zdolija v jer, vse rano, ta vsak me vda komni, so rano, stigma, stereotipi, je geti, ali hod. No, če bi še tako za vidrojrom, kaj bi smo hrival, ali bat, kaj bi smo uproštvila, da ak vsak me, ja bi še tako še jaren polčen, skor ena še so ga dati pa jurgan. Mat, da mi bolo di ne bi jar se bops, mat, da mi jar se bops, kar ko oli stereotip, bi rogorim, da jih osa narun, da jih os rogorim, da šija pason, da nar šija pason, da med še vha driva rama spune privijat, da tako bi smo manj zil se shva, da shva karimo, še shva, da shva it abzeda. Vzog čer opila zelen štuli da, ki v najuli, ami zgadat ena. Un punojn administraten publike, čka bon mot let pr mua si femer zbatimin e politikave sociale. 
që ka vendi jo në raport me të qënit në. Thënë kjo, unë kam mundësi të jem, pra në fëmijës tim kur a i ka nevoj, pasi normalisht më paguen dhe raportet shëndetsore. Gjë që në një pun private është gëtëja e vështirë. Êshtë fatë mund të themë, pasi gjithë e dinë se sa e vështirë është gjeshë balancen mes këtyre në dyja dhe. Moja firma u kojë radim zaista po dërgjava nësë në asë zhene, da bude mu uspjeshne i në poslu, ali da bude mu i dobre majke i da brinemo o svojoj porodici. U svakom smislu imamo puno plaćeno porodilsko odsustvo, 12 mjeseci, a zaista i u dogovoru sa šefom možemo se dogovoriti za neko skraćeno radno vrijeme ili rad od kuće u vrijeme koronavirusa i to nam je bilo obezbijeđeno. Kada je u pitanju moja firma, mislim da su žene i muškarci jednako plaćeni. S obzirom da u mojoj firmi ima dosta žena, možda duplo više žena nego muškaraca, tako da ne osjećamo se zapostavljeni kada je u pitanju moja firma, ali generalno mislim da su možda žene manje plaćene u nekim poslovima i u nekim firmama od muškaraca i generalno ćemo se truditi nekad u budućnosti da se možda to i izjednači. Thank you very much, and I need to do a clarification. Uh, I am not the regional director of the Eastern Europe and Central Office, UNFPA. I am a mere gender advisor, but I'm very, very happy to be supporting the, the region in that sense. So, so yes, my name is Gabriela. I'm the regional gender advisor at UNFPA, and I want to thank you all so much, especially the panelists, that you seem far away from over there, but we will be listening very closely to what you say, even if we, you know, I need to bend a little bit to get to see your faces. But I want to start with someone who's closest to me right now, Martel Spartari, welcome. And I want to ask you a question, Martel. So Moldova has been pushing the agenda on family-friendly policies and implementing global initiatives such as the Generation and Equality for, for, Survey, sorry. Sorry, could you tell us about the importance of policies such as working, flexible working arrangement and paternity leave and how working partnerships can be used to support people's family aspirations? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, indeed, this is a very important issue for our country and as a minister, I'm confronted not only uh, with uh, you know, structural problems uh, that we have in terms of uh, laws, regulations uh, and, and standards, but also with uh, the difficulty to, to pass uh, the, the correct message to the public. Um, just to start with a, a personal experience, uh, at the beginning of this week I was at, in an interview at the radio station and I said that we in Moldova have a structural problem that uh, we do not provide sufficient um, uh, services for young children, for small babies. We do not have a standardized um, nursing uh, uh, services. We do not provide uh, uh, the possibility for the mothers to uh, leave the ch children at, at the playground and uh, the, someone to take care of the children. So this is the structural problem. And then the solution uh, is that we have a three years childcare leave in our country, which is a good solution given the, the circumstances. And then uh, all the media, the television, so on, they said that the minister wants to cut the childcare leave and wants to cut the, you know, the support for, for the families. It's so easy on this topics to cut phrases out of the context and uh, to pass wrong messages. And indeed, uh, as, as afterwards the, the message was cut, 
um, many mothers uh, reacted and defended their rights, which is perfectly fine. They, 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 they were afraid that the government intends to cut the uh, childcare leave uh, period and the, the support for the families, which is absolutely not true. We, we just want to open the discussion on developing, on um, providing alternative childcare services at the employers or, at the, um, or provided by the government nurseries and so on and so on. So that's, that's also a difficult challenge that we have to, to, to pass the correct message uh, because indeed in our country uh, the um, economic inactivity of women is among the highest or even the highest in Europe. Well this is a general problem, the, the economic inactivity of the general population is, is a problem and although in Moldova the gender gap in terms of economic inactivity is maybe lower uh, than in, in, other, in other countries. Um, the, 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 the prevalence of inactivity among women is the highest. So the percentage of active women is, is the lowest uh, in, in, in our country. So this is because we lack affordable childcare, uh, we have inefficient uh, family-friendly policies, and uh, we have low employment opportunities in rural areas especially. Uh, uh, especially. So, um, um, we have indeed started to collect data under the Generation and Gender Survey, as you mentioned it, and that survey shows that the share of women with preschool children involved in paid work is about two times lower than that of men. Uh, about half of the uh, mothers with preschool children do not intend to look for a job, um, which is four times higher than uh, of fathers in the same situation. Um, decisions that couple uh, that couples make about how to balance paid employment and parenting have long-term consequences uh, for mothers, especially in terms of salary uh, in, and in terms of uh, widening the gender pay gap, but also in terms of uh, uh, professional opportunities. So, um, in order to try to move on uh, and to solve uh, these structural issues, we have developed, with the help of UNFPA, for policy interventions that we uh, plan to discuss and uh, implement in the, in the near future. And these are, uh, first, accelerating the transition of women from childcare leave to the labor market. And again, when we open this discussion, uh, it's so easy for, say, the opposition to attack us and to say that we want to cut on some rights for, for, for the mothers or for the parents, which is absolutely no, no intention from our side. We want to provide a choice. We want that parents, both mothers and fathers, they have the choice uh, to stay at home with the, the children if they do not have the alternative to take care of, of the to, to, to take care of of, of, of their uh, their children or to go for part time job or to full full time job. So the government has to offer. Uh, the alternatives or have to make the, these alternatives um, uh, possible. The second policy is involving more fathers for a longer period of time in raising and caring for children. So indeed we have to stimulate that the decision uh, uh, on who stays at home and takes care of the children is split among mothers and fathers. And we as fathers take on more responsibilities, not only in terms of paid leave but also in the family chores, you know. Uh, so it, it, this is also a, a matter of communication. We have to pass the right messages. Uh, third is expanding work arrangements for families uh, with children. Um, we are discussing about the possibility to provide um, uh, f fiscal facilities for companies that offer uh, tickets for, for, uh, for nursery services uh, or for childcare services. Um, for, we want to support companies with a lot of uh, employees to develop um, daycare and to take, so that mothers and fathers can bring their young children uh, at the workplace and, uh, and, and be able to work. So there are multiple solutions in terms of uh, um, expanding work arrangements for families with children. And then the fourth uh, is expanding uh, alternative personalized individual child care services. Uh, we in Moldova for the moment don't have a standard for um, uh, individuals that 
take care of, of young children. Um, if, if you leave your child to, uh, to, to someone to take care of, um, it is not regulated in any way uh, by the government. So we, we want to regulate this market, uh, and this is very important uh, uh, also in terms of uh, security of young children, uh, because sometimes, you know, uh, children are left with people who are not qualified to take care of them, and unfortunately we had recently some tragic uh, um, situations. So that's a very complex issue. I see I have seven seconds. Uh, we are taking this very seriously, and it's difficult to pass the message, but we will work on it and we will address uh, all the issues. We have to be publicly um, present and to promote these messages. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. I really like your emphasis on communication, but also on listening, what people are telling the government what they want, and also about the long-term commitment that motherhood and fatherhood is. It's a life choice. So thank you so much. And now I turn it to Lea, my co-moderator on the other side. Thank you, Gabriela, and thank you, Minister Spatari. Um, I'm turning now to Minister Shachpaska. Thank you again for being here. So, North Macedonia has been working on policies to advance gender equality, and you've included in that the issue of people living with disabilities. Um, I'd like you to tell us what are some of the areas that this work has been focusing on. Thank you, Leah. First of all, I would like to say thank you to the organizers of this very important conference, our host, Republic of Bulgaria, and of course, UNFPA, and to give me opportunity to address in the name of the government of the Republic of North Macedonia. Uh, as a Ministry of Labor and Social Policy, at the top of our agenda are the people with disability, and we really work very hard uh, in the previous period to address the needs of the people with disability. I just want to mention a few of the measures that were undertaken in the previous period. We give the opportunities for the people with uh, disability aged 6 up to 64 to have a personal assistant just to perform their daily activities and to include them in very active way like other citizens in our society life. Of course, uh, the children have the opportunity to have educational assistant which help them to go to school and to resolve their tasks at school. After that, I would like to inform you that last year in initiative of the Ministry of Labor and Social Policy, we have prepared an application that allows the blind people and the people with visual impairment to hear and understand uh, written text to audio version. This will help the people, blind people to be included in the society in the easier way that it used to be uh, previous. Uh, after that, uh, we are working on the disability as a human right. That's why we will change our approach of estimation of disability, the new approach according to the international classification of functionality, which means that after this assessment, people with disability will have approach to the uh, rights on a different way than it used to be in the previous system. It doesn't matter if it is in education or social protection system, whatever, according to their needs. Um, at this moment, Ministry of Labor and Social Policy is working on decentralization of social services that we want to bring the services to the people with disability and elderly people in their home or community-based services. Um, the process of deinstitutionalization is very high in our agenda. We have no children aged under 18 in the institution. Now we are working of the, in the deinstitutionalization process uh, and we want to take out the person with disability just to offer them dignity, to respect their dignity, decent life in the small group homes where they will receive 24 hours per day help for the caregivers uh, which are engaged from the um, uh, Ministry of Labor and Social Policies and NGO who are engaged on the municipality level. Uh, well. Um, it's very important when we are talking about uh, people with disability um, just to uh, change the stereotypes and the tradition that's, that is present in our country like other countries, that the women are those who are taking 
care for the children and the people with disability. That's why our country, our government made amendments of the law of social protection, giving the privilege for the mothers, usually mothers who are taking care for their children with disability, to have financial allowance when they uh, will be in age of 65 since they do not work present on the labor market. If the mother wants to work part-time, then the, the state will give from the state budget uh, the half of the salary, which uh, she will not have if the state will not be included in this kind of policies. So this is very important uh, to include the mother in the labor market. Um, I would like to mention that uh, we are working on inclusion of the children with disability in the kindergarten. Now we are piloting the project in the, one of the kindergarten in the capital of North Macedonia in Skopje, where the deaf children should be included in the kindergarten together with adult children. So we are looking for the um, uh, teachers in the kindergarten who know the sign language just to make easier approach and easier to make easier uh, stay for these children in the kindergarten. Um, this is very important issue uh, when we are talking about uh, women with disability who are dis uh, discriminated in a three level, let me say. First of all, they are women, which means they are not as equal uh, presentation in society like men. Second, because they are with disability. This is second ground of discrimination. And third, if uh, they, are, they are easier uh, victim of violence. These are uh, topics, these are grounds that we are going to work in the future, just to make the uh, base and to give the equal opportunities to those who are discriminated because we already adopted the new law of anti-discrimination where we put uh, two new, for the first time, grounds of discrimination in our country like sexual orientation or uh, gender identity. So uh, the, uh, this issue are very, uh, let me say, uh, spend, we spent a lot of time in our ministry to address the need of people with disability and especially women with disability because we want to improve their approach in the health system here. I was talking with my colleagues in front of this uh, addressing that we need um, medical office where the women with disability can have approach to the gynecologist, which is something very important because uh, they have right to become mother like other uh, people in our country. Uh, the problem with disability is a very broad issue that involves not only the Ministry of Labor and Social Policy. We are working very close with the Ministry of Health. We are working very close with the Ministry of Education because this is multi-institutional approach and this is necessary if you want to deliver all the measures and policies that will address the people with disability. So I think that uh, we are on a good way to resolve these issues in the next future and we, are, we will work all together in our country. This is my point at the beginning. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Shahpaksa, for your words. Um, I think what was really useful about that was we all know, and on this panel we're going to be talking about, the responsibility of childcare falls on women. But what I like about what you're doing is that you're being very specific and pulling out these women who are caring not only just for children in general, but for children with disabilities and for relatives with disabilities. And that's a portion that may get overlooked. And it's obvious from your work about the individual support that you're offering that this is something that you are very focused on. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm now turning to my right at Hungary. Um, Mr. Eckler, welcome to our panel. Thank you for your time. Um, so the Hungarian government has recently reformed its maternity leave policy. Um, could you please tell us what this change has been in practical terms? Um, and maybe you can also tell us about your current work on daycare. Um, what other changes that have happened there so far? Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, great opportunity to be here. And uh, actually, it's great to share the floor with you, Lea. Uh, you had the chance to visit Hungary and have a report on some aspects of Hungarian family policy, which actually was quite a, a useful feedback uh, for us as well. Uh, so beside uh, of uh, being responsible for family policy strategy, uh, which is basically uh, 
you know, digging deep into Excel sheets and uh, data analysis. Uh, I'm also father of two, two kids, and uh, and uh, so I have some uh, expertise of my own uh, about what I'm doing or what we like to help families with. Uh, as we have witnessed in, in Europe and the whole world, uh, the uh, uh, the time uh, women want to to spend or have to spend at home after having a baby uh, is various. Uh, um, different societies have different cultures and different, uh, you know, um, willingness. Uh, Hungarian women tend to stay at home for a longer period. Uh, actually, 81 to 82 percent of Hungarian women uh, want to stay at home until the child reaches the age of two to three. So two, two to three. And actually, half of this cohort, so almost 40% want to stay at home even longer. It's only 14% who want to get back to work around the uh, age of the child reaches uh, uh, one, uh, uh, so to say. And uh, we need to take it into consideration when we, when we uh, form or when we uh, try to, to figure out what's best uh, for mothers and families uh, regarding uh, uh, staying at home and, and daycare at home. And uh, we have a, a, a three-dimensional uh, uh, solution for that. From the age of six months up to the age of two of the kid, uh, mothers or parents, it can be the father as well, can stay at home and receive uh, a so-called uh, child care uh, uh, subsidy, uh, which is uh, the 140 percent of the minimum wage, which will be around like 800 euros from the 1st of January. Uh, that's quite a, a huge sum, actually, uh, in Hungary. And uh, from the second year to up to the third year, we have a, a, a narrower, uh, a smaller uh, allowance, but still it's possible for the mother to stay at home or the father as well. But what do we do in the first uh, six months? Uh, we have a, a subsidy called infant care subsidy, uh, which uh, uh, used to be uh, capped the same way as child care subsidy. So the cap was the 140% of the minimum wage. And we, from 1st of July, we abolished this cap. Right now, uh, the infant care subsidy equals the the previous salary of the mother. So uh, for half a year uh, after the birth, to be exact, for 168 days, the mother receives uh, her previous wage in a form of infant care uh, uh, subsidy. And because of uh, it's a different um, uh, taxing scheme for this, she earns even more because only uh, personal income tax is deducted from this sum, but social, uh, social care, uh, social uh, security contribution is not. Uh, why do we do that? Because uh, there is a growing proportion of women still. The huge majority wants to stay at home for a longer period, but there is a growing proportion of women who wants to get back as soon as possible uh, to their workplaces, and we want to help uh, them with that. And if you take into consideration that you receive the same amount of money or even a bit more when you're staying home with a kid for half a year, and after half a year you can, you can um, uh, uh, use or you can apply for a, a daycare service, for, you can have a, a nursery place for the child, uh, this life uh, track uh, can be taken without an actual change in the personal income. Uh, we thought that it was uh, uh, going to serve the interest of, uh, of mothers deciding uh, to, to, have a, to have a child. And uh, what about daycare, nursery places? Of course, if you can go back to work but there is no nurseries, it's a, it's a void, it's a, it's a zero uh, possibility or chance to give. What we, what we had in the, in the past 10 years that we almost doubled the, the, the nursery places. Hungary is a country of uh, almost 10 million people. We are 9.7, and we had like 30,000. Uh, each year, around 90,000 children are born. 
And uh, we, we had uh, 32,000 nursery places in 2010, and now we have uh, 54,000. And, and in the upcoming years, we have uh, constructions uh, going on. And the upcoming years, we're going to re uh, reach 70,000. So with this number, we will have uh, generous service, so to say. So uh, uh, if we take into consideration that um, uh, not all families or women's, uh, women are going to use this uh, type of service, I think that we are going to have uh, uh, a full support in this regard. And uh, since the, the, the types of nurseries are quite various, uh, we have a workplace nurseries, mini nurseries, regular nurseries, uh, we can even have family nurseries, uh, so single individuals uh, can start nurseries in their surroundings, so if they group together some uh, families, they can have a nursery, a supported nursery on their own. Of course, they need to uh, be, uh, you know, li live up to some obligations uh, to that, but uh, they can have a nursery uh, on their own. Uh, and this uh, nursery system is sector neutral, so each sort of nursery receives the same grant from the government, um, which uh, I think is also um, a good practice and a good way to serve the need of uh, mothers and families, actually. Thank you. Mr. Eckler, thank you very much for your comments. Um, what I'm hearing from you there is about adaptability so as you say you know still now most Hungarian women are choosing to stay at home but you are noting the growing proportion of women who that's not what they want and they want to go back to work and it's encouraging that that kind of development is also being paralleled by the policies that your government is introducing so thank you um, we're going to go to Greece virtually now um, to Ms Silangela um, thank you for being here as the Deputy Minister of Labour and Social Affairs, how has your work highlighted the way that family policies can bridge the gender gap? Um, I'm thinking, for example, in areas such as employment opportunities and fair pay. Over to you. I think you're on mute. We're not hearing you still, unfortunately. I'm sorry, this connection doesn't seem to be working at the moment. Um, I wonder if there's something we We'll try and come back to you. Um, our team in the background will try and sort that tech difficulty. We're very sorry about that. Um, we're going to go next then to Gabriela, who's going to ask the next question to Mexico. Yes, and sorry about that. I see the, the people on the background trying to solve it, so really, really sorry. Um, Maestra Rodríguez, bienvenida al panel. Muchas gracias por estar con nosotros. Um, te quisiera preguntar. Thank you for the invitation. I'd like to ask you. What are the relations between various sectors and how does the demographic issue influence your work? Most of all, let me thank the organizers to the Bulgarian government and the Population Fund of the UN Thank you for this opportunity to take experiences from various people. I come from the National Population Council in Mexico, 
putting together policies, population policies. Uh, we steer this policy. We have a consultative council. There are 24 citizens in this um, board, various experts, academics, NGOs, women's organizations, various champions of rights, sexual rights, reproductive rights of, uh, for women from the uh, indigenous groups. 46 years after this institution was founded, we have managed to reduce so from 3.6 down to 2.06. This is the number of children per woman in Mexico. And this, uh, it came down to a minimum to avoid uh, population decline. There is 128 million Mexicans. Uh, 3.6 people live in a single household on the average. Although more slowly, but substantially, uh, we have reduced the number of uh, illegitimacies among teenage girls. This is one of the priorities of this Mexican government. Uh, our president says that we have to take care of the poor first and foremost. As far as their public rights uh, is concerned, this is the right to get uh, care or to give care. Our relationship with the UN and with our National uh, Women's Institute has uh, helped us to measure various data. For instance, how working time is reduced and what percentage of labor uh, is not remunera remunerated. There is a great difference in terms of types of labor that different genders provide. Every week, women have uh, 50 hours of unpaid labor, and men only commit 20 hours of unpaid labor. And 53 hours paid labor. Women work 85 hours a week, whereas men only work 73 hours. Uh, but women work 12 hours more than men every week. As part of this unpaid labor, they commit 12 hours weekly to household care, whereas men only commit five hours to house chores. This imbalance has limited the opportunities for good health care for women, for professional qualification, and for better providing better service to household members like children or people with disabilities. Women are unable to work additional work because they have to look after household members. Only 20% of Mexican women have access to child care. This is a very low percentage. The economic value of uh, these activities is, accounts for 6.6% of our GDP. And this is uh, quite a severe situation. The pandemic has appreciated uh, life, the cost of life, and has created impediments for women. It has also frustrated the uh, child care, and there's a growing sexual-based violence and gender-based violence. Women have now less access to technology if it belongs to the impoverished populations. 
and uh, the level of dropouts, school dropouts, is increasing. Also, the percentage of illegitimacies among school children is increasing. Yesterday, there was a report of the president, an appeal of the president to provide uh, decent care and by the introduction of public services and older people with disabilities or illnesses uh, should receive priority care and also another priority should be the teenage girls should be another priority. These are new elements in our policy and this is an area where we not only the government, but uh, the business community is expected to partake and other sectors, as well as other sectors. Uh, girls aged 12 to 19 uh, commit 25 hours to unpaid labor, whereas boys the same age only commit 14 hours. Uh, birth rates among uh, minor girls is much higher than the one in Bulgaria and it is much lower than the one in northern Macedonia. We have a program to prevent illegitimacy among adolescent girls under the slogan, I decide and I require a love and respect. Thank you for your attention. It's a coincidence we have the same name, so we're both the Spanish speaker, Gabriela and Gabriela Sier. Muchas gracias. Te agradezco mucho la experiencia. Lea, can we go to Greece or should we? Thank you. I think we can go back to Greece and try again. I'll just remind our audience quickly of our question for Ms. Sirangela, um, which was, as your um, as you are the Deputy Minister of Labour and Social Affairs, can you tell us how your work has highlighted the way family policies can bridge the gender gap? Thank you very much. I would like to start by thanking all the ministers and colleagues for today's discussion, which is important more than ever. Uh, today, women, uh, women rights are established by law at both national and European level. However, despite the legislations, gender equality remains. For our government, gender equality is a key priority uh, because for the first time we have a deputy minister in the Ministry of, uh, so of uh, Labour and Social Affairs responsible for demography, family and uh, gender equality issues. Uh, we believe that gender equality comes through work and equal representation. However, the strengthening of women's participation in the labor market can be achieved only by changing the stereotypical roles in the family and in society, and by the equal distribution of family responsibilities between women and men. And in this sense, demographic policy, family protection, and gender equality are linked policies. This is why our planning for gender equality should include a set of horizontal measures in all policy areas for family support, work-life balance, and women's participation in labor and leadership uh, uh, positions. Uh, what we do in Greece, a few examples uh, are, uh, first of all, uh, we, are go we are working to bridge the digital gap between the sexes, which will lead to the bridging of the pay and pension gap, and at the same time will empower women and girls. For this reason, we are creating the Greek Innovation Lab for Women. Uh, we encourage self-employment, even for women who belong to vulnerable groups, such as women victims of violence, with scoring and new adaptive programs in collaboration uh, with the a human resources organization of our country. Uh, we further empower women with a pilot program uh, supporting working mothers. This pilot program is Nannies of the Neighborhood. We support working mothers and guardians to re-enter the job market and unemployed women to uh, reduce undeclared work in the care sector. 
Uh, on the same note, we are planning to create childcare units inside big companies. Uh, in addition, we are already implementing a project for a quality level in companies that apply policies of equal treatment and equal opportunities to their executives, regardless of, uh, of uh, gender. Uh, we have a new labor bill uh, include the, that includes the harmonization of national legislation with the European Parliament Directive on the work-life balance for parents and carers. Paternity leave is introduced for the first time and the legal framework of parental leave and other facilities for parents and uh, carers, as well as protection against parental dismissal uh, is uh, completed. In the same bill, uh, we have incorporated the Convention 190 of the International Labour Organization for the elimination of violence and uh, harassment in the world of work, uh, ending authoritarian relations. The aim of all these measures that we promote is to encourage parents to participate equally in family possibilities and employers to promote equality policies so that women do not have the answer to answer in, the, in uh, the dilemma career or family. We strengthen and support the institution of the family and at the same time we help and encourage women to start or continue their professional careers by removing uh, all those obstacles that women find in their way. We inform them about their choices, about the, effect of the effects of the decisions they make in their professional life, we support them so that they can balance between professional and uh, private life. In this health crisis, gender equality is the key uh, indicator of evaluation and recovery. We must safeguard the women's rights to financial independence, labor market participation, equality in pace, representation, uh, in physical, mental, uh, sexual, and reproductive health. Uh, breaking the grid of gender equalities requires a long process in which we must all participate, women and men, collectively and uh, individually, states and citizens. We owe to keep fighting for gender equality and to continue to support and promote and protect the rights of all people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Sirangela, for your thoughts. Um, I particularly like your emphasis on gender equality coming not just from policy but from culture and your work to encourage employers to change the culture towards men also taking an active, a more active role in their um, children's upbringing. Um, I will now go to Gabriela for the next question. Thank you, Lea. Um, and now I want, I want to ask a question to Irina Mikichak. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. Um, we know and we heard from uh, Gabriela's intervention that the majority of care often falls on women, including in the healthcare system. Ukraine has been in working to support men to be more involved in the care of their children. Could you please tell us what steps have been taken so far to work on this in your country, including in the health sector? Thank you so much. Thank you. Добрий день. Благодаря на UNFPA, благодаря на правительство то на Болгарія, чи ме покане да участвувам в то заважен форум. Ми розуміємо, що є цілий комплекс передумов демографічної кризи, і ці передумови характерні для більшості європейських країн. Але причини Thank <laughs> you. 
However, Ukraine has a specific history of the demographic uh, uh, crisis and the gender aspect of it. Just uh, before our visit to the hospitable Sofia, us in Ukraine commemorated the history in the history of the Ukrainian people, honoring victims of Holodomor, the Great Famine, the genocide organized by the totalitarian Stalinist regime that killed 13% of Ukraine's population. These extraordinary losses from um, mortality and birth mm, deficiency are still significant for our state, in particular in the gender aspect. We should mention also the sad contribution of the Chernobyl tragedy, a nuclear plant tragedy. As a result, we lost uh, uh, health of uh, hundreds of thousands of citizens of Ukraine. Dozens of thousands of children were not born in Ukraine. For eight years, the war in Donbass has been ongoing. Eight years since uh, uh, annexation of the Crimea. Every day, people, uh, men and women, die. Those who are supposed to create and strengthen families, give birth and raise children. More than three and a half million of Ukrainian citizens, according to UN, need humanitarian aid. And of course, uh, demographic uh, um, resilience is very important priority for the uh, public health uh, sector. And we have a number of key initiatives for demographic policy, in particular involvement of men for caring and taking, for taking care of their children. Currently, Ukraine is intensively implementing the reform in the healthcare sector. And the objective is to ensure quality and affordable uh, health care to extend life expectancy, especially for men, because uh, mortality rates are too high for men. The start of COVID-19 pandemic uh, coincided with uh, the reform of uh, uh, healthcare financing. We implemented universal coverage uh, with medical services by implementing the medical guarantee program. It was a challenge, but also it makes it possible to prove effectiveness of a new approach to funding. And it started progressive development of Ukrainian medicine. And accordingly, uh, it started influencing health and mortality rates. Therefore, the priority areas uh, are for patients with heart attacks, strokes, emergency medical care, primary care, treatment of patients with oncopathology, obstetrics and neonatology, mental health, etc. Since last year, in the contract of the National Health uh, Service of Ukraine uh, for uh, obstetric support, uh, the mandatory support is providing for partner, uh, partner uh, childbirth and for support of breastfeeding. In this way, we develop a healthy idea in the society about equal relationships in the family to greater involve men in family care. Currently in Ukraine, most of uh, maternity hospitals practice uh, a partnership uh, uh, childbirth um, delivery. So it not only prevent, prevents obstetric violence, but also has positive effect on health of the newborn and uh, it has positive impact on families. Unfortunately, since uh, COVID onset, many doctors uh, were a bit apprehensive. They suspended partnership uh, childbirth, and those decisions were made at the level of regions, healthcare facilities, and these restrictions only also impacted uh, the uh, partners uh, of uh, the women who were going to give childbirth because they couldn't visit uh, the, uh, their wives in hospitals. However, we had to interfere to restore that. So uh, after childbirth, the woman returns to the family. Traditionally in Ukrainian families, the entire burden of housework and childcare fell on women. Given the prevailing gender stereotypes, the level of men's interest in formalizing childcare leave before the age of three is very low. 
And thus, currently, these uh, rights of parents have been extended. In May 2021, we adopted the law and that uh, guarantee equal opportunities for mothers and fathers in childcare. And in July this year, the government approved the resolution on approval of the procedure for granting leave at the uh, birth of a child. And now men are granted one time paid leave uh, at the birth of a child lasting for 14 calendar days, and they cannot share that with their wife and they cannot get financial compensation for that. This initiative was implemented in the pro framework of Ukraine's commitment within Biarritz partnership, which emphasizes a systemic and sustainable approach to um, address gender inequality. So the decree of the president of Ukraine implemented the strategy for human development, and thus it includes creation of a network of perinatal centers, increased funding for the programs of medical guarantees for medical care during childbirth and in complex neonatal cases, development of the network of preschool, educational facilities, and development of the system of preparation for parents for childbirth. Uh, our parliament also passed the law on rehabilitation in the field of healthcare, which opens new opportunities for restoration of working capacity. And also the government passed the bill which strengthened uh, the state's recognition of the need for additional protection for pregnant women. Our ministry also initiated before the WHO office in Ukraine, a full-scale gender audit in the healthcare system in order to identify all layers of problems in this area and to develop an action plan to eliminate them. So by summarizing, when reforming the Ukrainian medicine, we try to create barrier-free medical space focused on the family to preserve the health of every family, birth of healthy children and long quality life of every person with respect for dignity and needs of every person, regardless of age, sex, nationality, religion, or financial capacities. The demographic crisis actually stimulates us to look for new opportunities for development of our state. However, under any conditions, under any circumstances, the key things for us are peace and uh, uh, for our citizens, then families will be strong. Make excuses for the problems with the translation, uh, but you, you made me think about families and sorry, and motherhood, that it's, it's about our aspiration, but it's also about our bodies and how we take care of our bodies and who accompany us in that um, journey. So thank you so much. Now uh, uh, we have Sandra from the Austrian Development Agency there. I hope that everything goes fine with the um, sound um, because what we have learned is that if technology can fail, it will fail. So <laughs> be patient with us. Um, but we have learned that in COVID, we know that. So um, Sandra, um, your organization has supported the implementation of family-friendly policies in the region. Can you give us your perspective on the approach and the achievements so far? Sandra, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I uh, send you very nice regards from Pristina. It is uh, uh, our pleasure as an Austrian Development Agency, but also my personal pleasure to take part in this event. And I was uh, listening to the interventions and the speeches of my predecessors. And I have to say problems are very, very similar. So uh, when it comes to Kosovo, I'm a head of office in Kosovo, so this will be my input, is uh, we have a quite a holistic way of approach uh, that we actually implement through uh, funding uh, uh, of the project with the UNFPA. And um, this holistic approach is characterized in a way that we have um, cooperation with civil society, namely Kosovo Women's Network, a quite known uh, organization and very much engaged in this area. Uh, and then we have a cooperation with the business sector, namely strategic cooperation with the Chamber of Commerce. And then we also have a cooperation with the government. So it's a very systemic approach. And so uh, uh, with, the, with the civil society, with the Kosovo Women's Network, uh, they have uh, provided, let's say, uh, the framework, the analysis of, of legislation that is currently in place to see 
where are the shortcomings uh, so to see uh, what has to be uh, adopted or amended especially in the light of eu best practice and experience and to be concrete especially with the eu directive of work and life balance directive so uh, they have made this analysis and uh, and uh, uh, together with the government, and now I touched to the cooperation with the government, together with the government, especially with the Ministry of Finance and especially and the Ministry of Social Welfare, as well as the Agency for the uh, Gender Equality. Mm, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, uh, we are creating an action plan uh, how uh, those shortcomings can be uh, amended, how those shortcomings can be addressed, uh, not in a, in a way that we tackle bips and bobs like uh, details in the, in, the, in the legislation and create quite unbalanced legal framework, but to do it in a very systemic way, to look at the laws like labor law, like family law. So uh, uh, when it comes to uh, cooperation with the private sector, uh, uh, this is uh, more uh, uh, also uh, our civil society because women's network is very active in this regard, uh, namely to, to, uh, to, to look at the findings that they have uh, produced within those analysis of legislative uh, and the policy framework to see how human resources can be improved in the business uh, sector. Uh, uh, namely, at the moment, um, issues that are related to family policies, like um, flexible working hours, like maternity leave to some extent, or payment during maternity to leave uh, seem to be uh, subject to individual negotiations. So uh, it will be good to, with the Chamber of Commerce that is somehow framework organization to, to, to negotiate this on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the company level so that not individual cases, individual cases are negotiated, but a, a policy framework is done. And uh, what is also important activity is uh, of the of the civil society is a mobilization from the local level. Namely, uh, this organization has a lot of members of their network and they are mobilizing women to stand up and, and, and address those shortcomings, uh, what they face uh, in, the, in the family uh, policies and especially in the, in the, in the uh, gender equality. So um, uh, to come back to the business sector, uh, 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 in addition to, to, to discussions and to improvement of, of a policy uh, uh, decisions, uh, when it comes to human resources, there were several initiatives like uh, um, uh, Family Champions Award together with the UNFPA, uh, uh, Chamber of Commons awarded uh, seven uh, family champions award to companies that uh, have uh, played a very outstanding role um, in, in this context. And uh, here I have to touch about the achievement. So this is a very tangible to, to empowerment, to, uh, 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 to awarding these awards to the companies. There was a signal sent, not only to business sector, but to whole society, uh, what the family friendly policies are. And also for the first time uh, this year, there should be award given to a, a family friendly company. So, uh, and I would also like to mention that the family business association that is active within the chamber. Chamber following uh, uh, family uh, policies within the private sector. So, um, and why are we doing all improvement uh, policies? It's because at the moment, at least in Kosovo, uh, when you have a candidate at a job interview and you have a female candidate that is young, she's asked, openly asked the question if she is married, if she tends to have children, and if yes, when she tends to have children. And if it turns out that maybe she is even pregnant or she expressed suspicion to have children, then the male candidate is selected. So uh, this is an issue, and this is really happening now in the first 21st century. Uh, also, salary payment during maternity leave. This is a big problem. So if a woman goes to, to, to maternity leave, her replacement. So uh, the company has to basically has a burden of paying two salaries, namely for the women that is on maternity leave and her replacement. So small companies 
are not, not able to handle this financially. Maybe mid or bigger companies are able to fight to compensate this financial loss. But the state has to, to step in here and, and, and address this uh, very serious. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is no provision to have uh, flexible working hours or uh, breastfeeding times. Uh, so this is all subject to uh, individual arrangements or individual um, negotiations, but not on a really policy level within the business sector. And uh, also childcare is a big issue. This has been mentioned by uh, most, uh, almost all candidates uh, in front of uh, before me. But this is a, also an issue in, in, in Kosovo. There is a too little state uh, uh, kindergartens and uh, too little places. Uh, the demand is high and the private kindergartens are so expensive that the woman is basically staying at home because 50 to 60 percent of her salary has to be paid for the kindergarten only. So she's then deciding to uh, to uh, to stay at home. And uh, so these are the uh, these are the problems. And uh, with those policies, we are basically trying to help those to. Sandra, I think we're we're losing you. The connection is really. Address yeah. those. Uh, Sandra, those can women. you hear me? Yeah, she can. Yes. Not. I'm sorry, you, the, the connection is starting to be shaky and your time is over. So I want to thank you so much for all, of, especially for the partnership with UNFPA on this work and for highlighting the paradox that many women face in terms of being encouraged to have children on one side and castigated for the decision that they have on the other side especially when they're looking for employment. So thank you very much. And now I'll, I'll leave it back to Leah. Quickly, for our final question, I want to turn to Ms. Eliasir from UN Women. Thank you for being here. Um, your report, The Progress of the World's Women for 2019 to 2020, looked into the changing shape, meaning, and consequences of having a family in today's societies. Um, could you share with us, please, um, what this evidence says about gender equality and demographic shifts? Thank you very much for the question. And, and before starting, I'd just like to congratulate UNFPA and the government of Bulgaria as well as all the partners, all the speakers for participating in this conference, very important issue. So I, I'm not going to be able to summarize everything that the report uh, says, but I will try to highlight the most significant uh, for this conversation. And you'll hear many of the common elements that have been raised by previous speakers. But let's, let's start from this place. Um, thriving countries are based on the people living in them also thriving both as individuals and as groups. Uh, one critical unit of measure that is often used and indeed dominating discussions on demographic resilience is the family. And if we think of an ideal family, a healthy family, uh, our idealized vision is most likely a home with equality and justice, a place where everyone can exercise choice and voice where everyone can enjoy physical safety and economic security. But I think we all know that this vision is not actually a universal reality. Families are often contradictory spaces for women and girls. At times, they provide love, support, a sense of identity and belonging. But far too often, um, families are marked by inequality, limitations on choices and opportunities, and in some cases, they're a source of violence and insecurity. So we can't look at families and households in a superficial way. We actually have to look at carefully and understand unequal power dynamics within households, whether it's in terms of the choices being made or in terms of access or control over resources. And we're not only talking about financial resources, but also time. Lack of power in the household often mirrors lack of the power to decide on whether, when, or where to work. Family dynamics can also reflect constrained choices and access to education. So we need to use a gender equality lens to understand family dynamics and choices. And while the world around us is rapidly changing, 
families and the roles of women and girls within them are also shifting. Population dynamics and demographic changes play a central role in shaping household size and composition, including in the Europe region. These shifts have an impact on decisions about living arrangements, marriage, family size, and also elderly care. There are critical global trends that have important bearing. The global population is aging and demographic aging has a woman's face. Women make up the majority of those who are over 60 years old. Older women are more likely to have given priority to family obligations over paid work over their lifetime. And this can have negative implications for their income security and access to healthcare in old age. So women are more vulnerable to the social health and economic disadvantages associated with aging. Eight countries from the Europe region are among the 10 top countries with the highest female population. And with declining birth rates and more women opting out of marriage and motherhood, we're likely to see a growing number of older women living alone in need of long-term care, but without family members who can provide it. Another point, women are also disadvantaged on the employment and economic front. Only 45% of working age women in the region are actively engaged in the labor force. Beyond the report, I would just like to highlight that the pandemic, and I think we're all aware of this, has made the, the, the situation worse. Millions of women, many of them working mothers, have left the labor market altogether. As we've heard from previous speakers, unpaid work is on the rise. Globally, women do three times as much unpaid care and domestic work as men do. And COVID-19 has exacerbated care needs, has increased the amount of paid and unpaid care work and deepened care gaps. And the situation is particularly bad for young women. So aside from the disproportionate burden of household responsibilities and domestic work, young women are suffering the compounded impact of limited access to education and job opportunities, as well as gendered divisions of labor and high rates of informal work. Progress towards gender equality through the redistribution of unpaid work would allow both men and women to benefit from new employment opportunities and new family responsibility arrangements. The progress of the World's Women Reports emphasizes this. Essential to this shift is revaluing and destigmatizing unpaid work. And this will disrupt the current gender and class underpinnings of household and care work. If we imagine women were to participate equally in the economy, according to the ILO, the Eastern Europe and Central Asia region could see 1.1 trillion US dollars or a 23% boost to GDP. Remember that number when I come to cost. I'm so, what I'm so sorry, we may not have an opportunity to come to that because um, we have run over and I've been asked to end the session there. But can I just please talk about just the recommendations that came from this very, very quickly. Sure, 30 seconds okay. or a minute, thank you. All right. Um, the first is egalitarian reform of family laws. We need to end discriminatory laws. The second element is data, because we need to improve data to make sure that policymakers have accurate information on which to make their decision. The third is political will. We need political will to promote gender equality. And finally, most importantly, we need investment. We need investment in gender equality, which promotes demographic resilience, but we need investment in public, at the public and the private sphere to have professional, affordable, accessible care related services. And finally, I just want to say this is not in the report, but I want to emphasize partnership. Without partnership and coming together, we cannot address the global challenges that we face, uh, including in this region. Um, I wish I had the opportunity to say more, but I encourage everybody to go out there and read the report, important recommendations resonating with what member states are saying in this panel today, and I think relevant for all partners. But many thanks again, and uh, uh, looking forward to hearing further discussion. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you so much.
um, Ms. El Yassir for concluding our conversation today and for giving us an evidence base from which to understand everything we've heard, as well as some um, information on what is needed practically to achieve these goals. I'm going to hand over now to Gabriella for some very quick closing remarks. Yes, I had some closing remarks here, but I will not say them because I want to leave you with the appetite to learn more and to be part of this conversation. So with that, um, I, we know all that uh, gender equality is at the heart of the societies that we want to build, so I want to, you to remember that. We have heard some very practical solutions and challenges in the investment, but there's so much to learn and so much to know and so much to understand. So this is an open conversation, this is an open dialogue, this is an open relationship. I will be there having lunch, so if you want any more uh, uh, or have a more in-depth discussion about this, please feel free to join us. And now I leave Jaime here, who's looking at me. <laughs> thank you very much, Gabriela, and thank you. Uh, congratulations to all the panelists for an excellent uh, discussion. Um, just a housekeeping point, we have a few minutes for a, sh uh, a very short break. Uh, we are going to change, we are going to rearrange the podium for the next uh, dialogue. Um, but please don't go away because you're going to start at 12.15 sharp. Just to remind all of you, we have several hundreds of uh, participants joining us online. We are very close to get to 1,000 visitors to the expo, to the different booths that were set up. And let me also invite your attention that you, if you want to be part of this discussion in the future, you can also join the Sophia Alliance. Uh, there is more information available at the Expo in Hall 2. And there is a survey. We want to make sure that as we move forward with the Sophia Alliance, this is a process that brings in and incorporates your views, your demands, your concerns, your priorities. So, Please spend a few minutes to complete the survey that is there. It's going to be extremely useful for us as we move forward and as we deepen the discussion that Gabriela was just mentioning. So please don't go away. Stretch your leg, but be, please be around. We're going to be starting in five minutes. Thank you.
dear participants. I have the pleasure of um, the panels today, and this is the Ministry and Attitudes of Young People. So uh, thank you for being with us and thank you for joining us. Uh, the objective of this dialogue is to, um, hear, to uh, hear what young people have to say, but also to hear what is already being done uh, to um, actually um, meet their anxieties uh, and offer them more opportunities. So um, before we start with the, uh, our colleagues who are going to, uh, we're going to ask some questions to, um, we're going to watch a short video. So the video will start just now. Please pay attention. Tishnasat Hayastanum inchains het apahum imna patak nere kamim ko zira kanas nello mama neti shat yerevi. Inni masde chay. Imam dosta. Yes, Sharona Kumar Manalista, who is one of the Piaveli Lava, one of the Piaveli Lava. We have a card to the Piaveli Lava. I 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 have a card to the Piaveli Pekra bank work and as chemi mizne bisada otsne be bis misakt elat khels mishle sisro maris nakle bis siurtse axal gazda bis chartulo bisatwis kanse kutra bitki axal gazda khale bisada kagona bisatwis inset mishlo mar proces sabshiro gori saris kotn es kanu itare bisatwis kadet kot ila bis mira bis proces sabi ay karar sabo speuri siurtse arar speuri shasat leblo ba axal gazda bisatwis to pekra progort axal gazda khal sin sikne ba didi gamot zola bisatwis rom tu minda chaver to kotn es bisatwis mishlo mar proces sabri shedzle ba amis siurtse Би сакал да видам промена во концептот на тоа како градиме нашето општество, да уведеме граѓански концепт, со кој што ќе се укинат партиските вработувања и ќе се даде можност на сите млади да покажат што умеат и знаат. Нега ше цимет, ме кресоре, че фјешт е консидерош ше цим да пргјишам, ошто да конкуренца е лјарт на трегу на пунос, Gjo që të gjithë rinin shqiptare e bënë që të jetë predispozua që të largohet ose jashtë vëndit ose të ketë disa shqetësime që nuk ka rinë të kërkojnë një vënd pune dhe vendosin thjeshtë të largohen dhe kaqë. Edhe rëtë urën dhe kemi rolë që kërësën një adem Dunja dhe gjithë në bërje lërë i kjetë që e kërë thëmë, bërë sënda dhe që e kërë thëmë, hëtë manë, ëdhën, i dhe dhe kemi lështër me li, i dhe dhe të edhe trend lërë urën me li, të më dhe galë më rolë, janë shonë që në dhe shonë jetë më ëmë, do amë lëzë me të leve të tja, do amë lërën më të leve të tja, jo në, shonë sinë i dhe për kanë shonë lërë jale i bërë, E urëm në presës të uamit të tërë ka thana dingëmën këtë që lë këtë dërlëmën të kja dhe i nëse një që li islejle nga më dërëm shëgë e qërë pëllëmëja në barë që urën në zatë nga më dërëm shëgë e qërë pëllëmëja një që li një gjemë mjetë në ërëdhë në tësirë në bëllë, në thonë. Në kënjë është të pjerë vëgjë që mëni ka është të stradaj të që nësë këtë urëjë një mbrazovanje është По сравнение с другими странами, вот сама ездила в Россию по учебе, я чувствую, что у нас образование хромает, в отличие от других. И вот эта система, хотелось бы, чтобы мы улучшили и здравоохранение, ну и вообще даже зарплаты таких профессий, которые очень важ, важные, у нас маленькие, в отличие от других стран. Чем с Хауребас, Ром, Табу, Пикфтеда, Шелада, Ротхат, Чем и Шоблебус, Хауребас, Մայց գոնիա, գոնիա ռա ուպրու ալբատ իմ է դիմակ, սան մին դարոմ իմ է դիմ կոնդեսրոմ, աձզը ու կտեսից խորովա մեկն է բա, դա ուպրու պատ պետում երից խորովա, մի ուխադավոտ իմի սարով սապրոթակ ավշիրիս մեն տալովակ Lachisara, I'm good. And which country you are following this uh, session from, uh, Lachisara? Before we go on, would you like to say your name and who you are to our friends here? <laughs> Uh, sorry, yes, I was too quick to go into the session. My name is Lachizara Stoev, I'm the Bulgarian Permanent Representative to the United Nations. So you know who is moderating the panel together with Ville. But our guests are more important than the moderators, so... 
on that we agree. You can see on the agenda that uh, I'm a former this and former that, so I'm the least important person here. But I have to say that I'm also a young person, so maybe I have a, a purpose to be here indeed at this session. Um, so I'm not only personally interested in this discussion and the, and the debate, I'm also directly impacted by the potential outcomes and solutions we can identify together. Before we give uh, the floor to the speakers, I have a few housekeeping items I want to share with you. Um, the first one was, of course, who we are and what the session is about, and that you already heard. In addition, we have today nine speakers with us. Four of them are with us here on stage, and five of them are joining virtually from all over Europe and Central Asia. We will introduce each speaker when we give them the floor. Talking of which, each speaker will have roughly five minutes to give their intervention on the questions that were introduced in the beginning. And we would be very grateful with Lachasara if all speakers could respect the time limits because this allows all of them to make their intervention as planned and hopefully leaves some time for discussion and comments from the audience at the end. Um, regarding that, what happens at the end, uh, this is my last housekeeping point. Um, we also have an interactive element uh, in this session. So we have prepared a menti uh, platform, and if you're not familiar with menti, don't worry, I will explain in a few words what is expected from you. So menti works online, you can use it uh, with your phone, you can type menti.com, and I believe we have a slide for that, which will show it shortly. And in addition to typing menti.com, the website will ask you for a code. And the code that you need to access this menti, which is meant for this session, the code is 9727-0431. I repeat, we invite you to go to menti.com and insert the following code, 9727-0431. I believe it will appear on the screen as well at some point, and I will repeat it again later. At the Menti, you can ask questions or comments. Uh, we invite you to react to what you hear from the speakers. Perhaps you disagree with them, perhaps you agree with them. Perhaps you have some solutions or answers to the questions that they are asking or the challenges they are facing. At the end of the session, we will return to these questions and comments and give um, a chance for the speakers to reply to them. Um, we, we have the code on the screen, but this is a, a different code that was provided to me. So let me just double check which code is correct with my technical team on the back. The, this is the wrong code. Ignore what you're seeing on the screen. The right code will appear momentarily. Very good. While the code is coming up, let me ask just a few things to keep get us warmed up from the audience because we will be asking difficult questions from the speakers. So it is only fair if we ask some questions, maybe not so difficult ones from the people who are with us in the room. So if you consider yourself a young person, could you raise your arm here in the audience? If you consider yourself a young person, there is no age limit, it's a matter of self-identification, please uh, raise your arm. Very good. We have uh, half of the room uh, counts as youth representatives. This is excellent for a dialogue session on youth. Uh, a second question, if I may. Would you consider that you work with or for young people? If you consider you work with or for young people, could you raise your arm, please? We are getting uh, slightly more arms up. That is very good. You can lower them. Thank you so much. I think this means that we have the perfect possible audience for this dialogue session on youth. We have the right people in the room and on the panel. And now you can see the right code. Yes, this is the code that matches my notes. Uh, now you can see the code which you can insert to Menti. Without taking any more time from the housekeeping, I'm giving the floor now back to my moderator colleague for the first speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ville. And we go straight to our first speaker, who is Mr. Alexander Yurema, State Secretary of the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine. Um, we are very happy to have you um, with us. Mr. Yarema will speak um, in Ukrainian, so please have your headphones on. Uh, Mr. Yarema, to what extent have you been able to offer
to, um, how are you approaching these questions and what are the key factors for his successful empowering of young people so they are resilient in front of growing uncertainties? And you have... So welcome all participants of the discussion. Thank you for your invitation as well as, well as Willy. I spent uh, most of my life in youth policy to a great extent in civil society sector. And let me start with a category that uh, Minister of Social Policy of Ukraine mentioned yesterday, Ms. Klazebna. This is the category of confidence, of trust. This is something that the state needs to develop in cooperation with civil society and above all with young people. Why? In order to develop stable relations and reliable, sustainable relations for the future. When I started working as Deputy Minister for Youth and uh, Sports, I was surprised why young people don't come with their suggestions, ideas. And my friend, a, a journalist, he said that for young people, authorities are toxic. That is why they, are, um, they do not wish to come and to work with the government. Then the response to that would be to make a step towards youth. And let me mention several examples how we do that in Ukraine. A small city town of Liman, it is on the border between uh, Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast, which uh, most was, was most affected by the Russian aggression and part of the oblasts of the regions are occupied by uh, Russia, they set up a, a youth center, Liman. We asked why. They said, we need a place to meet and to gain new competences and to uh, develop urban projects. And I was surprised. I said, why urban projects? And their response was, you know, we want to live in this town. This is our native town, but we don't like it the way it is. And the uh, urban development, it is a tool for us that would make it possible for us to change it for the better. Moreover, our youth center, it is a place where we can hold a dialogue with the authorities, with local authorities and explain how it would be possible to change our um, town for the best. Because imagine a great number of young people who pass by the ministry or the building of the public authorities, they don't uh, normally uh, come in and uh, share something with the ministers. So we need to go to meet young people and to have this exchange. Recently, we see some change. Now we no longer work only with formal uh use uh, uh, organizations so we meet informal groups uh, street uh, subcultures in this way we expand this cooperation this interaction and we reach out and we manage to develop this confidence this year ukraine has achieved quite a lot in the field of youth policy let me mention the national youth policy strategy 2030 it was enacted with a presidential decree the new law on basics of youth policy, which was adopted by the parliament. And this significantly changes approach to working with the youth. How we drafted this document? We uh, did that together with youth. Of course, that required some time. I mean, each of these documents, it took several years to draft them. However, I'm sure that even young people who live in the smallest communities, uh, they had the opportunity to join using various instruments, including online tools. And uh, of course, one of ob objectives of the state, of local governments, is developing this dialogue by uh, various tools by supporting youth centers, youth infrastructure, by developing youth uh, uh, outreach programs. And uh, all of our training in the context of youth policy in particular takes place in the format of Council of Europe, 50 to 50, where 50% 50 of uh, uh, the audience are representatives of the authorities and 50% are youth representatives. And if you consider this training, on the first day, you see two groups of people. On the one side, you have representatives of the authorities. On the other side, there are youth. On the last day, you can hardly say who is who. You know, they mingle, they mix, they become friends, and they start developing new initiatives. And now let me say a couple of words about the initiatives that are so important and that will probably be important and uh, helpful for our colleagues in other countries. This is partnership of the state, civil society, international partners, in particular UNFPA. 
Youth Capital, Youth Capital of Ukraine. Each year we organize this contest competition, 50, 60 applications from Ukrainian cities, towns who want to prove that they create the best opportunities for youth of Ukraine. In most of these cities, they have never had the youth dialogue. And when we launched this competition, there we didn't know yet who the winner was, but we could see that there was the outcome, there was the result, because young people sit together with representatives of authorities and start discussing what city means for them, what cities need to create, uh, to develop so that it were comfortable for youth. Communities, uh, a child and youth friendly communities uh, involving UN agencies, local governments and NGOs. This is to a great extent about a competition, how to make life in uh, communities better for young people. Here we bring together businesses, a state uh, and civil society. This is packed for use as we refer to it. This is the initiative that makes it possible for use to find jobs, uh, some internship programs. We involve a lot of businesses in Ukraine who think about how they could support use in making their first steps in the labor market. Often this is the greatest challenge. After that, the second and the third step goes much easier. So it is important to ensure evidence base. We Together with UN agencies, we implement a joint U report initiative. Every several, every fortnight, about 100,000 uh, of young people have the opportunity to come up with some ideas uh, regarding their life, policy, building, involvement, participation in decision making. That's a very important instrument where it is possible to reach out and to engage youth into those processes. Because when youth feel, young people feel that they engage, they have more confidence, more trust. They are more interested in implementing their capacities in uh, the communities where they were born. So it is important to create the framework, certain tools, and to teach, to train people to use these tools. And third step is uh, helping, um, providing ongoing support, develop new culture of using these tools. In particular, in order to lay the foundation, the basis for uh, assessment by the government to include these KPIs into work of the authorities. And then um, every ministry, every community needs to go more use-oriented. Um, and I know you were running very fast for the interpreters, so I hope they managed to, to capture everything you said. But uh, your presentation was very interesting, and uh, I hope that at the end we'll leave some time for um, my messages as well. Ville, over to you, quickly. Thank you very much. Oh, I don't want to hear myself. Much better this way. All right, our second speaker joins us virtually from Germany. Youth policy is a very transversal topic, as all of you know, and one of these sub-areas is, of course, training and education. I hope I have with us Dr. Rolf Smartenberg from Germany. He is the permanent state secretary at the Federal Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs. And I have a question for him, which is, considering the successful vocational and education and training system in place in Germany, what good practices would you like to share for other countries in terms of strengthening youth resilience through such VET programs? You have the floor. Thank you, Willi Mayama. First of all, let me thank you for your kind introduction. And let me thank the organizers of this conference and for bringing together so many experts, views and insights from all over Europe. Shaping Europe's demographic future is a huge task and we are all concerned with. More or less, all our countries share the same demographic pattern and have to cope with the same challenges and more or less we are also using similar approaches. What a wonder. One challenge is to create a path for each young woman or man leaving school and entering professional life. Here, young people can get lost. Here, their aspirations meet with their anxieties, which is the title of our dialogue. So, I was asked more to talk about achievements. In Germany, unemployment rate for persons of age below 25 is 4%, while average unemployment rate overall is 5.2%. 
I believe there are five main reasons for this relative success. First, the system of dual vocational training. Second, intense and early career advice. Third, relatively good acceptance and reputation of professions based on vocational training. Fourth, very high commitment of employers, organizations, chambers, unions and states of the Federal Republic to organize the vocational training. And fifth, permanent strong support by the Federal Labor, labor Agency. What sets dual vocational training apart from other training systems is a combination of training modules in the workplace on the one hand and in the classroom on the other. Apprentices are employed by a company that provides practical training throughout three to four days a week and attend vocational training school during the remaining one to two days. This is where they receive the theoretical part of their training. Specialists within the company provide the bulk of on-the-job training. Apparently, this can only function if schools and companies work closely together. And due to this duality, the vocational training creates a smooth path from school to workplace. Hence, we have started to introduce his, this dual principle more and more also in academic education. I believe that for many young people, dual training is a great alternative to university studies, but we have to work on its attractiveness. One key are good salaries. And they will go up with increasing shortage of qualified workforce. Coordinated measures are necessary to give them the support they need. Schools in Germany usually offer career guidance from the seventh grade onwards. So pupils reflect on their own interests and skills and can also gain their first practical experience in workshops of educational providers. As a next step, Practical experience should be consolidated in internships in companies, usually from the eighth grade onwards. Then, of course, it is also important to achieve the best possible matches between the interests of those seeking vocational training and the needs of the training companies. Many young people are not aware of the variety and number of apprenticeships occupations. In Germany, there are well over 300. By discussions with the career counseling services of the employment agencies, which are often offered directly at schools, specific advice can be given on the apprenticeship occupation in the region. Given now the current COVID-19 pandemic, reaching out to the young people is however challenging. That's why we have added some more activities, which for lack of time, I won't explain in detail. One very interesting tool we call it is Check You. It is an application of artificial intelligence. You can download it from the website of the Federal Employment Agency and test yourself along four dimensions. And you will receive indications giving you a professional orientation. So if you like, it's also in English available. You can go on this website and test yourself. I also did it. The recommendation was not so bad, actually. It was close to mathematics or going to healthcare, in my case. It was interesting, interesting experience. Yeah, so this, uh, uh, and in this summer, we launched a campaign in Germany to promote dual vocational education and training, even now in the time of Corona. So I think to summarize it up, I would like to emphasize that each system is very much historically determined as well as linked to a specific culture. But maybe there are five keys which I mentioned and uh, which can be transferred. One is the principle of duality. Second is early intervention. Third is modular intervention several times in the school. And then creating an attractive environment and a huge commitment of stakeholders. I can really assure you that for German unions, employer agencies, everybody, it's a really main issue to organize this. 
Thank you for your patience and attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Schmachtenberg from Germany. I, I take from this that close cooperation between educational institutions, employers, as well as government bodies is important. But even if that cooperation is perfect, it alone might not be enough if the perception, perceptions excuse me, amongst the young people are skewed against VET career paths. So you also need to work with the young people and youth communities. Thank you so much. Over to my colleague. Thank you very much, Wille, and I have the pleasure to welcome now with us Mr. Shukurgildi uh, Mayradov, uh, from, who is a representative of YPR from Turkmenistan. Uh, well, welcome, and great to have you with us today. Um, Mr. Maradov, my question to you is, uh, while many countries in the region experience, um, judging from your own experience, what are some proven, effective, and preferred ways to have young people's voices heard and young people participate in decision-making? And what are your suggestions for policy decision-makers? The floor is yours. Uh, warmest greetings, bonjour à tous, всем здравствуйте. Thank you so much, Ms. Lechazaro Stoivo, for giving uh, the floor to me. Let me also thank UNFPA and the Bulgarian government and all organizers for building such an inclusive bridge. Today, I have an honor to speak on behalf of the youth leaders from all five countries of Central Asia. In Central Asia, for example, where I live, young people make up more than 50% of the population of all countries in the region. I believe that when young people in all of their diversity and without leaving no one behind can realize their rights, stay healthy, complete their education and get their dream job, they contribute to the productivity of their communities and their country. Our region is undergoing drastic demographic changes, and we believe that one of the answers is investing in young people and engaging us in the development process. There are many effective ways to harness the voices of young people, and first, first and foremost, young people need to be given a seat at the table with the decision makers. Young people need to be empowered to analyze the wants and needs of their peers and communicate this vision to the policymakers through sustainable youth adult mechanisms. Uh, before the Ministerial Conference on Demographic res uh, Resilience, I was able to conduct a survey among young people aged from 15 to 30 in all five countries of Central Asia, including Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. I asked my peers and colleagues about the obstacles they face, their anxieties, aspirations, and possible solutions. As obstacles hold them back from achieving their dreams, youth named the consequences and impact of the pandemic on young people that exacerbated all of other already existing challenges for young people. Youth sees in obstacles in the, in the lack of education and skills training, especially for girls. They're concerned about unemployment and instability, which also contributed to increasing inequality. I'm worried about the prospect of studying for so many years and eventually being unemployed. As a result, I'm afraid I may be disappointed in what I thought I loved doing, says, for example, one of the surveyed young people. When asked about what changes young people would like to see in their countries, the majority aspire for the affordable and high quality education, better employment opportunities, more youth platforms for sharing knowledges, experiences, and harnessing our voices. Justice was also highlighted, especially in relation to those who are often left behind. But I also have good news. When asked whether their life will be happier in comparison to their parents, 73% responded positively and highlighted that thanks to digital solutions and many young people's ease with technology, the future seems to be a huge window of opportunities for self-realization. Amid the global, uh, global pandemic, this is not easy times for all. Together, we can find creative solutions to today's challenges. And here are four immediate proposals coming from the youth of Central Asia. First, Young people are facing a complex of challenges, and that's why we need a comprehensive approach. The policymakers need to integrate and reflect youth agenda in all areas of policymaking, whether it be education or healthcare, employment, migration, and youth data, among many others. 
Second, we believe that gender equality will help accelerate progress, empower young girls and expand their access to vocational and higher education, including in STEM field through special scholarship opportunities and removing all barriers in girls realizing their full potential will play a crucial role. Third, youth development was seriously hindered by the global pandemic, as we have mentioned. We believe that new approaches and solutions are needed to get young people back on their feet. For example, new innovative partnerships need to be facilitated to create more opportunities for young people in a form of internships and sponsored apprenticeships. And additionally, we ask that the governments prioritize and increase financing for youth mental health so that young people again believe in themselves and are able to harness their talent, talents and reach their aspirations in the post-COVID world. And fourth proposal, which is we're excited about the launch of SOFIA Alliance, the community of policy and practice on demographic resilience. And within it, we propose to establish a dedicated platform for Central Asian youth to exchange knowledge and experiences, as well as amplify our voices and engage in dialogue with policy decision makers throughout the decade of action. If together we will be able to strengthen our partnership and turn all of these challenges into opportunities, our policy decision makers can rest assured that young people of Central Asia will want to live, stay, create families, accelerate the economic growth, and enjoy healthy and active aging in their own home countries. Thank you so much. Um Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Mamaradov. I don't know if you can see uh, the room, the, the live public here, but you got a huge round of applause. So uh, thank you very much for your presentation. The key takeaways are basically we need to get to, uh, to work together. We need to empower youth, and you already offered us the solutions. So um, thank you very much for that. And now over to Villa. Thank you very much. Indeed, our next speaker is uh, together with us here in this stage. Uh, his name is Mr. Samad Nasirdinov. He comes from Kyrgyzstan and he is not only the chairperson of the National Statistical Committee of the Kyrgyz Republic, but I also hear he is a young person. Uh, so my question to you, Mr. Nasirdinov, is while many countries in the region experience declining fertility rates and populations, the situation in Kyrgyzstan is different. The population is growing and Kyrgyzstan is within the window of demographic dividend. What strategies and practices are behind this success? The floor is yours. On behalf of the National Statistical Committee of Kyrgyzstan, I would like to congratulate the participants and thank the Population Fund and the Bulgarian government for this opportunity. I will mention no figures, but you mentioned the demographic dividend. Our government's policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, utilizing this uh, demographic dividend depends on many factors. Central Asia has its own specifics, national cultural specifics, traditions. Uh, and the government policy needs to take into account all these factors. Now we're facing the issue of labor migration. Uh, Mr. Lucas's speech yesterday uh, mentioned that young people are leaving, tend to leave the country or recedes to from rural areas, gets educated abroad. 
get some specific cultural experience, but digital technology provides provide opportunities to younger people to return to their home countries and help the development of the economy by working for foreign companies. This is a fascinating solution, and I believe that new technologies will help us out of this situation. Uh, to add up to what Mr. Lucas said, I am a representative of the younger generation, but we should not forget our responsibility. We are talking about retraining, um, improved qualifications abroad, but there, there is little talk about family values. We spoke about motherhood institution, younger generation, these are uh, future parents. We tend to forget that. There's little attention paid to fatherhood. The parental behavior of men uh, it has huge social implications. This uh, uh, fatherhood insti institute, it is based, must be based on training. If uh, there are no proper social conditions, uh, this these skills might disappear, these values might disappear, the family values might vanish. <sighs> might peter out. Uh, there should be an, an emphasis on the family institution, the strength of this institution. because the right behavior of parents will be forming the next young generation. We uh, keep talking about stability and resilience. And we must reaffirm in the future the uh, in meaningfulness of strong families. Strong families mean strong state, a strong society, and solid peace. Uh, this was my contribution. Thank you. Добре спазваме времето. Говорихме за това колко важни са доказателствата, фактите, колко важна е ролята на мъжете. Това е широкия обсек от... Very impressive. Uh, for the next speaker, um, I hand it over to my colleague. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And the next speaker is joining us virtually as well. I have the pleasure to present Mr. Milan Savic, who is State Secretary for Youth and Sports of Serbia. Mr. Savic, welcome. Um, great to have you with us today. Uh, the question I have for you is, partnerships and intersectorial coordination are key in the empowerment of young people. How is the national youth strategy of the Republic of Serbia, which was for the um, years 2015-2025, which is currently under revision, approaching this issue? What novelty will the revision of the youth strategy bring in order to broaden the support for young people to realize their plans and wishes? Thank you. Uh, first of all, dear conference participants, dear youth, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my pleasure to address you on behalf of the Republic of Serbia government and the Ministry of Youth and Sports. It's a privilege to discuss with you at this conference about the demographic challenges and the importance of youth inclusion in this really important topic. 
the role of the youth and their participation in these kinds of gatherings is certainly of crucial importance so that we are acquainted with their habits, standpoints, plans and wishes, since we can bring about different demographic trends only by joint forces and continuous investment in creating conditions for a good quality life of youth. By doing this, we contribute to the realization of the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the Republic of Serbia National Youth Strategy Goals. Uh, demographic data indicate a continuous reduction in the number of young people in Serbia in the total population, which represents a great challenge for the future of Serbia together with the process of demographic aging of the population. Therefore, the state needs to make additional investments in the youth population with the aim of creating conditions for better uh, quality of the life in country, particularly in view of uh, education, employment, health care and housing. The Republic of Serbia is very much prepared to change the demographic picture of Serbia. This is also supported by the announcement given by the President of the Republic of Serbia, Aleksandar Vucic, about introducing new demographic measures. These measures will primarily refer to providing incentives for having children by giving significant funds for giving birth to the first child, but also to measures still to be introduced regarding the birth of the second and third child. Especially important are the incentives which will most certainly contribute to changing the demographic picture of Serbia, referring to the young married couples wanting to become parents. Uh, but uh, who are still studying at uh, the university, as well as the incentives for buying an apartment where the state will provide down payment in the form of grants for credits, which will also be obtained under very favorable conditions. Uh, the state of Serbia is prepared to come out with the specific measures to encourage young people to start family, a family without fearing for their livelihood, as well as the incentives for having more children. This is why the new national youth strategy for the period 2022 to 2030, which we are developing in an extensive consultation with the youth and all stakeholders, puts an accent on creating adequate and stimulating conditions for a quality life of youth, their equal, active and organized participation, action and development of their potentials that contribute to the personal and social welfare. By stimulating uh, youth work, improving youth premises and work of youth offices, stimulating professional development of youth, especially of young talents and young people from the sensitive categories, by fostering gender equality, youth activism, by supporting youth employability and self-employability, social and economic self-sufficiency, as well as through increased responsibility and activity of youth, for their own health, sexual, reproductive, mental health, etc., and safety, the plan is to build together a society in which young people can achieve their plans and wishes and make healthy choices in safe environment that will we uh, that will we believe also lead to the improvement of demo in demographic trends. Uh, great assistance in the realization of these goals has also been provided by the international partners, so I would like to thank the United Nations Population Fund, which is one of the key partners of the Republic of Serbia government regarding this plan. We are here to empower you to find, uh, I have a, just one thing to add to all the young people, we are here to uh, empower you to find your role in the society and to support you to invest energy and knowledge in your own development, health and good quality of your life. Organized and continuous support, support uh, to you is a prerequisite for the great future of the world and further economic development, as well as creating conditions for a better life or for all the population in this planet. And this is why we are going to work with you for you on your achieving your this goal. You are not only the future of your countries, you are empowered present and by and uh, this is why I ask of you participate, be active and engage yourself to create the world you wish to live in with your family because it's it, it is just as one Chinese proverb says teachers open the door, but you have to walk through it yourself. Once again, thank you for the invite and thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Mr. Savic, and also thank you for keeping up uh, with the time um, provided to you. I just wanted to congratulate uh, Serbia on the development of the um, revised uh, strategy for youth. Uh, it seems that you found the right balance between um, including young people in the draft exercise and offering the right solutions for them. So um, thanks again. And I hand it over to Vile now. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker will be talking to us in person from the room. Uh, he comes from Georgia. He is Mr. Revas Trakviani, the head of youth Ag agency of Georgia. And I, he sits right next to me and I have a question for him. In the last few years, Georgia has developed a comprehensive youth friendly ecosystem, we are told, which provides opportunities and empowers young people to succeed and navigate a complex world. Now that sounds like an achievement. And the question is, what does it take uh, to create such an ecosystem? What does it look like? What were the steps and challenges on the way? The floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Ville. So as your question refers to the uh, question, what were the steps and the approaches uh, we took to create the ecosystem? I have to deliver some more, or, uh, specifically three crucial questions. Uh, um, that we have answered two years ago. And uh, that time, uh, as I was uh, appointed as an uh, advisor to Prime Minister of Georgia on Youth Affairs, uh, and only answering those uh, three crucial questions, we have established the uh, youth uh, uh, state youth agency with the policy making functions. And uh, that was the crucial point. So the first question was why? Why youth? And our um, answer sounded like that, uh, that Georgia's main asset is human capital, and the core of this uh, uh, human capital is youth, uh, primarily um, uh, young millennials and uh, Gen Z, as they are the uh, agents of change. And that become, has become our core vision. So the uh, second question, uh, how? How do we strategically uh, tackle the issues uh, facing the youth? After conducting uh, the research, it appeared, unfortunately, that our formal education system could deliver uh, the ability to young uh, people uh, to fulfill only 50% of their full uh, um, potential. Only 50% of their full potential. That means that uh, we were bringing up just uh, semi-developed young uh, personalities, therefore semi-developed uh, human capital. And uh, so far the research um, uh, showed us that the other 50% of their potential should and could be um, developed by the non-formal education and youth work, professional youth work services, as they manage to deliver the crucial uh, lifelong competencies like, uh, you know, uh, the critical thinking, civic competencies, entrepreneurial mindset, uh, and, and so on, uh, the crucial competencies in our modern world. And that became our core strategy. Uh, then we move to the third question, what, what specifically is needed to be delivered? As uh, we believe that only, syst only the systemic approach uh, can deliver the sustainable and long-term outcomes and uh, um, and not even the best but one-time and short-term uh, project and initiatives. We have developed a model of comprehensive youth supportive um, ecosystem, the model of ecosystem uh, that was based on non-formal education and uh, youth work and which aimed to realize the full potential of uh, young individuals. So the ecosystem model consists of eight systemic uh, pillars, and I'll just briefly uh, list them. Uh, the policy um, pillar, the human resources for uh, uh, youth field, the organizations and institutions pillar, knowledge on youth pillar, infrastructure, culture and mindset, the crucial one, uh, finance and market and services. Uh, the explanations of each of the pillars you can uh, find at Georgia's virtual booth uh, and there is a three minute graphic video with explanations of our uh, ecosystem model. Thus, after answering those three questions, why, 
uh, how and what. We are, have outlined our core vision, our core strategy, and based on them developed the um, youth supportive uh, ecos model of uh, or youth supportive ecosystem. So to build uh, such a comprehensive youth field ecosystem, we established uh, the youth agency with policy making functions and developed and launched four year um, reform action plan with 10 simultaneous reform directions uh, on the national and the most importantly on the municipal and local levels. And those uh, 10 reform directions are as follows, just briefly to list them. Also, youth policy development direction, youth workers professionalization direction, municipal youth work development in every municipality, empowerment of youth non-governmental organizations, which are the systemic players on youth field and the multipliers, uh, youth structural dialogue on national uh, and local levels, uh, and so on. Uh, the explanations of each of those reform directions uh, you can also find in our um, uh, George's uh, uh, visual, um, virtual booth. Uh, it's in PDA presentation format. Uh, the implementation of each of the reform directions leads us to building a youth supportive ecosystem and its eight uh, national, uh, eight uh, pillars, systemic pillars, on national and um, most importantly on local levels. And uh, as I'm absolutely running, running out of time, just to conclude, all the reform directions are ongoing uh, all, already for two years. Uh, in 30 municipalities out of 64, and the other municipalities are expected to be covered by 2023. And it should be uh, mentioned that the sustainability of the, ec of the uh, ecosystem development process is legislatively backed by the resolution of Parliament of Georgia on state policy concept of youth field development 2030, and the concept was elaborated in cooperation with Parliament and Youth Agency with huge political and technical support of UNFPA of Georgia. And uh, we are so thankful and appreciate it. So thanks for your patience. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Um, sometimes buzzwords are just buzzwords and a youth-friendly ecosystem sounds like it could be a potential for one of those but I think we are all convinced now that there's actually a lot more behind that than just the name and the title and it was really uh, encouraging to hear that it is not only a conceptual uh, framework with eight different pillars but there are all also the institutions and structures there behind it exactly for its implementation so that was a, a really really impressive uh, intervention again thank you so much back to my colleague uh, thank you very much. The next speaker is also joining us virtually, and this is Ms. Jelka Josic, State Secretary for Demography and Youth Issues of Croatia. With uh, Ms. Josic, uh, we are going to discuss a very important, uh, the very important issue of migration. So, uh, Ms. Josic, uh, over the last few years, out migration has become the main demographic driver of depopulation in Croatia, coupled with persistent low fertility. This has been mirrored in the significant emigration rate, resulting in 5% of the population gone permanently, while a large number of young people among them. In your opinion, what policy interventions are needed to change the young people's perspective that would positively impact demographic change in the country? Thank you. Dear colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm happy to be here with you today, uh, even if it's online. First, let me uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this very important conference. As you said in, in the beginning, uh, Croatia has been facing the problem of immigration of our people in recent history. Uh, when Croatia joined the European Union in uh, 2013, the emigration has increased, especially uh, of young people and young families. Experts estimate um, that in the last seven to eight years, uh, about uh, 400,000 people emigrated from Croatia. Most of them went to Germany, Austria, and Ireland. To deal with the issues related to the aging of population and to improve the conditions of young people and young families, the Republic of Croatia established the Central State Office for Demography and Youth in July 2020. 
We need to focus future measures uh, on uh, inclusion, promotion of equal opportunities, active participation, and improving uh, the employment of young people. It is very important uh, to know the needs of young people and develop opportunities for them through joint action of all key stakeholders at national and local level. This should be done in cooperation with civil society organizations. Civil society organizations are recognized as important partners in the implementation of activities for the youth. The further, they um, the further promote uh, understanding, uh, dialogue, and solidarity between uh, generations and encourage the involvement of young people in the life of local communities. The global crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic is also an opportunity for young people to take the initiative in being active in the community. It is important to invite young people to share their knowledge and skills with the community and support them in their work. Youth immigration, as well as the issues related to education, employment, and the independence of young people are not just national issues. They are common among many EU countries. Central State Office for Demography and Youth is a body that acts to create a positive, comprehensive, and inclusive youth policy. Now, we are, pre we are preparing a, a new national strategic document, a national program for youth, for the period 2022 to 2024. And special attention will be given to young people in rural and remote areas. In Croatia, we believe it is very important uh, to include uh, uh, the youth um, in policy making. Uh, that is um, why we established uh, the advisory board uh, for youth uh, of the government of the Republic of Croatia. That is a cross-sectoral uh, advisory body of the government. In this way, we enable uh, all the stakeholders working with the youth to, communi to communicate <laughs> communicate uh, horizontally so our youth policies can be more effective. There are also uh, youth advisory boards uh, at local and regional um, level. Due to the COVID crisis uh, uh, at the beginning of uh, 2021, uh, the Central State Office uh, for Demography and Youth launched telephone counseling uh, for young people only, uh, and it was done together with the Croatian Psychological Chamber. Uh, psychologists, are avail uh, psychologists are available on the 20 telephone lines daily from uh, 10 a.m. to uh, 6 p.m. Uh, via phone uh, or SMS uh, and uh, WhatsApp. To provide young people uh, with information, our office launched a special youth portal, mladihr.kr, it regularly publishes professional accounts and news articles intended for youth. We have started the, the other successful measures on the national level, and I will mention, mention only a few of them. Income tax relief for young people up to 25 and 30 years of age. Uh, 240,000 young people use this measure and we achieved about um, 100 million euros of tax return. Then we have active employment policy measures, benefits uh, for young farmers and so on. Uh, one of um, the measures we are especially proud of uh, is uh, uh, co-financing of housing uh, through the state budget for young families. Uh, 22,000 uh, users are included uh, in the program, and since uh, 2017, when it started, uh, about uh, 4,000 babies uh, have been born in these uh, homes. If we uh, want our young people and our families... Uh, Ms. Josic, thank you so much for your intervention. I'm afraid the time is up and we have small speakers who are eager to share their insights as well. Uh, but thank okay, you very much. Thank you, um, thank you very much, Ms. Uh, and um, I, uh, what I take away from your presentation is uh, the important issues you're uh, trying to address in the new policies is that knowing the needs um, 
and also the very important role of civil society that was highlighted as well as um, you brought up a question that I think of particular importance and that's mental health of young, young people and we'll um, go back to that later on. Thanks a lot and now over to Ville. Thank you very much. Um, our last virtual speaker, um, I'm not sure where she's located geographically, I only know that she comes from UNICEF, uh, she is Ms. Afsan Khan, she's the Regional Director for Europe and Central Asia and also the Special Coordinator for the Refugee and Migrant Response in Europe. And I have a question for her. So last year UNICEF presented the report Preventing a Lockdown Generation in Europe and Central Asia which provided an overview of the challenges and opinions of young people concerning the, their situation and future prospects under the COVID-19 crisis. Could you, Ms. Khan, briefly reflect on the key findings, uh, the key action points that you identified in this report? Thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, and greetings from a cloudy Geneva, but a uh, pleasure to join all of you on this panel and at this extremely important uh, conference hosted by UNFPA. It's a privilege to partner with them. Um, first of all, I think when we look at the report, we understand that COVID-19 has disproportionately affected young people from a socioeconomic perspective and will continue to have an impact on their lives long after the pandemic is over. Across Europe and Central Asia, the pandemic interrupted learning for many young people. It left them jobless and has it made it more difficult for them to integrate into the labor market. Young people felt isolated, depressed, and uncertain about their futures. On the other hand, young people were the ones who adapted most quickly to the abrupt shift towards the virtual environments and an online economy. So UNICEF together with the European Training Foundation examine the challenges, opportunities, and the sentiments and views of young people concerning their current and future prospects in the time of COVID-19. We summarize these findings into two reports, Preventing a Lockdown Generation in Europe and Central Asia, and Building a Resilient Generation in Central Asia and Europe. The reports reflect the views of more than 23,000 adolescents and young people who shared their opinions on issues such as their access to and participation in education, the quality of teaching, their views on mobility and participation, as well as on lifelong learning, social inclusion, climate and the green transition. The findings state that close to 60% of young people reported that they learned less during the COVID-19 crisis. The impact of school closures on children, adolescents, and families were enormous. More than half of young people felt schools have prepared them only a little or not at all for future studies or employment. So therefore, our participation from Germany, the links he made are incredibly important from school to skills. Only one third of them felt they have enough information to choose their future studies and career. And many, 40% felt that the internet and social media, while being their main source of information, was filled with a lot of misinformation. We also heard about youth sentiments about the widespread discrimination in their countries, with only 20% of young people saying people in their countries support inclusion and diversity. And the prominent reasons for discrimination were harassment or exclusion, included sexual orientation, disability, and ethnic or religious backgrounds. Over 60% said they have themselves experienced or witnessed discrimination, bullying, or exclusion in their schools. They also talked, told us about greening, a key topic that is mobilizing many young people today and more than 90% of the young people interviewed felt that a green economy is important and the majority think their government is not doing enough to create a green economy. It's clear that the voices of youth speaking up on the problems that affect their present and future should be taken into account by national authorities when planning their actions to address key issues in their communities. 
Young people told us they're ready to contribute to building back better. They proposed several solutions to address discrimination, to develop more flexible education curricula, training of teachers, career guidance and orientation, and advised on ways to build skills for the future, such as critical thinking, problem solving, socio-emotional skills, and greening skills. It's also clear that young people want to engage. To influence decision-making, they seek the establishment of more permanent and inclusive platforms for dialogue with institutions at the community, national, and local levels. And I was very pleased to hear that the UNICEF support you, supported you report in Ukraine is making a difference. A few examples, child and adolescent friendly cities, revamping school councils so that they engage youth in local governance or through digital and online participation platforms that can become great equalizers in terms of opportunities. So face-to-face -face exchanges should still continue, but these need to be more inclusive. Many of the actions proposed by youth are aligned with UNICEF's programming in the Europe and Central Asia region. Alongside governments and key partners, we work in upskilling and reskilling youth through formal and informal pathways and on, on improving the quality of education and equal access to learning devices and to quality content for all learners regardless of geography, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status. Thank you Connecting so much, Ms. Khan. And connecting young people to internship opportunities. These are key, as Mr. Murad of called for. So thank you for the opportunity. And we see scaling up the approaches that use human-centered design as important. Thanks a lot. I appreciate Distilling the opinions and ideas from 27,000 young people into five minutes is an impossible task, and I do not envy the, the situation we put you in. So thank you so much for that. I believe we have one colleague left uh, on the stage who's been very patient with us uh, and who has, I'm sure, a lot to say. So over to Lauche Sarah. Yes, I'm particularly happy to welcome here with us Ms. Jana Panfilova, who is CEO and founder of Tinergizer. I'm going directly to the question, um, and this is, uh, Tinergizer works in five uh, countries across Eastern Europe and Central Asia, supporting young people living with HIV and young key populations. This has been particularly important when the COVID-19 crisis is having a significant impact on the mental health of adolescents and young people, com compromising their well-being and negatively affecting their per perception of the future. Looking beyond your area of work into the broad spectrum of young, uh, youth diverse situations and conditions, what will be your three asks for policymakers and leaders in Europe and Central Asia? Thank you so much and uh, everyone, uh, hello everyone. So my name is Jana, I'm from Ukraine and 24 years old and I was born with HIV. As a, someone who grew up with HIV, now facing the challenges of the world with COVID, I have some really urgent policy recommendations. In my lifetime, young people have never faced the kind of toxic uh, cocktails of anxiety, risk and isolation that we are facing today. Lockdowns, unemployment, domestic violence, uh, gender-based violence, online classes, worries about COVID and limited access to regular health, health services. All of this create another pandemic of mental health illnesses and insecure. For young people, mental health and ensure is it like oxygen and water. We need to survive and thrive. But it is like to rush to cover from COVID. Leaders have forgotten that the mental health of young people will not, will not recover so fast. For young people facing a combination of challenges, like 10 of the thousand of young people living with HIV or other chronic uh, current conditions in, East, in Europe, in Eastern Europe, uh, it is even more complicated. For years, it is 40 years since the first case of AIDS were diagnosed. But society still fears people like me living with HIV. Even here, thousands of young people are still dying, not from HIV itself, but from the fears and social stigma and anxiety created by, by discriminations. Too often it feels safe to hide 
the shoulders with HIV, hepatitis, or even more, or even gay or migrants that even so come forward to ask to help. When you feel, when you fear, you are going to treat it as second class citizen. When I was 10, I, I, I learned that I had HIV. When I was a teenager, I have a lot of difficult questions. Will I ever live a normal life like everyone else living with HIV? I realized that my HIV status were, was a dark secret for everyone else in my life, but not for me. So uh, I had to look for the answers on my own, but not, for, but not uh, or ask Dr. Google. I realized millions of young people and adolescents were in the same situation. When I was 16, I have founded of Teenagizer, the first peer support, support group for adolescents and young people in Eastern Europe, Central Asia. Now we provide online peer counseling on HIV and sexual health for 2,000 young people across six countries. And we have built a team of 300 peers, educate, educators, activists, promoting HIV skills and mental health. I'm proud of our work, but our peer support model is based on volunteers, and we are supporting on, only small numbers of the young people who really need help, who is supporting and counseling the hundreds of thousands of young people we can't even reach. Not only for young people with HIV, but for millions, young, for millions of young people who are dealing with range of the challenges, all all which have gotten more complex during COVID. Young people were struggling to cope with a mental trauma or loss or loss ones. Social distance, isolation, and treat of physical or mental violence, especially if their fam family situation was uh, unstable. With schools closures, some children and young people found themselves stuck at the home with their abusers, unable to get support from the peers, doctors, teachers or health healthcare workers. For someone of us, co we cope by drinking, using drugs and having ris risky sex with different pa partners. Others feel even worse. My friend Lera, she is 17, she is an activist at Teenagizer. Last year, she attempted suicide three times. No one could hear and come to her, her even her friends at Teenagizer. So at Teenagizer, we launched new campaign called Share We Care provides psychological peer counseling and information about mental health for all adolescents and young people. We need to ask ourselves that I'm going to do make sure that what happened to Lyra does not happen to any young person. So first, we need to change mindset where young people are seen as resources. We must stop being the obedient, cute young people that are easy to ignore or worse, easy to manipulate or explore. We need to demand our rights to have a voice in every decision, every click that affects to our lives and our health. We must have a seat at the policy table in the development program that responds to our needs. Second one, we must reduce the huge gap in the mental health services. Third one, we must advocate strongly for health and essential human rights. We must build a society when the third universal access to health care services and support include mental health uh, support. We need to work towards a more work world free of stigma and discriminations. We young people must lead the way and show the path for others to follow. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jana. I think the applause speaks for itself, but I wanted to thank you, first of all, for sharing your personal story and, more importantly, for the advocacy and the really important work you're doing and for reminding us that um, society is only as strong as their most vulnerable parts, so we need to make sure that we do um, implement um, the saying that human rights are for all, and it, they are for all indeed, so thank you very much. Uh, I think the discussion uh, that happened in Menti and the questions we got in Menti will have to take place during the lunch break. 
but uh, before we let you go, I think we have some closing words. Um, yes, thank you. We are very sorry that uh, we won't be able to address the questions that came through Manti, but um, first of all, uh, I think that this dialogue was very inspiring and it is only the beginning. I hope that you all use the SOFIA Alliance to continue, so I warmly invite you to join and to work really hard to achieve the decade for a demographic resilience. I think we have many takeaways from here. What we heard was that young people need to be empowered, a young need to be part of the solution, they're not a problem. And uh, another very important takeaway is that we can only do this together. So uh, colleagues with that, I don't want to stay in the way of your lunch break, uh, but before I close, I want to give the floor to Jaime for a few housekeeping remarks. Thank you very much and congratulations yet again for an extremely insightful dialogue. Um, just a point of order, we are going to break now for lunch. We are going to be back at 2.30 to continue with a set of uh, dialogues that will be taking place this afternoon. The first one on rural revitalization, choices and futures, followed by the financing of social policies in a new demographic reality. After that, we're going to have the closing ceremony for the conference. Um, so we will be resuming at 2.30. And with due consideration to the hundreds of participants that are following us online, we plan to start punctually at 2.30. If you can spare some time during the lunch break to go into the expo to check the boots, and in particular, to complete the survey about the establishment, the design and establishment of the Sophia Alliance, please do so. We would very much welcome the possibility of creating, establishing this alliance with your insights, with your inputs. Thank you very much and wishing you all a great lunch. Thank you.
Can you hear me, Tim?
great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We're, we're, we're going to start. Um, um, my name is uh, Tim Judah. I'm a journalist for The Economist, and uh, my main beat is covering this part of the world, southeastern Europe. But the last three or four, three years or so, I've been increasingly interested in and writing about uh, demography. And my name is Alida Vracic. Uh, I'm a social scientist, and I'm also an executive director of a think tank Populari based in Bosnia. And together with Tim, I have been involved in lots of research on demography in the past couple of years. Um, and Lita, I forgot to say, we've got, um, we've got uh, two, two of our panelists here, and we've got um, five people, um, fi fi five panelists online, and we'll introduce them um, each uh, uh, when it's their turn to speak. Yes, but before we start, we would like to share a video uh, bringing voices from the region. Uh, that are going to actually uh, provide a nice outline for the session on rural revitalization. Sve statistike ukazuju da se ljudi iz urbanih sredina sve češće opredeljuju za prelazak u ruralne. Digitalizacija može zaista da bude nezamenljiva alatka u toj inkluziji i socijalnoj kohezi. Prostor je nešto što je nama u gradu najviše falilo. Imamo troje dece i život u stanu je jednostavno postao kako bi rekao, rekao i nemoguće. Motivacija jednostavno treba da im bude zdrav način života. Ništa slađe nema nego ustati ujutru. Uberemo plasteniku povrće za salatu. To zagađenje koje je u poslednje vreme oscilira i jednostavno jedna velika briga za moje klinice, da li oni stvarno taj kvalitet vazduha, da li to utiče na njih i da li ja grešim što smo u toj gužvi. Ovde mi je mnogo to nekako lepše i lakše promenilo se u smislu da mnogo lakše donosiš neke odluke, mnogo više vremena imaš za razmišljanje, mnogo više inspiracije imam u prirodi nego u gradu. Ono što bi sad ovako na pamet ja rekao jeste možda taj kvalitet života. U smislu da je do te mere po mojom mišljenju došlo da je jednostavno i hrana i vazduh i voda postaju dragocen resurs koji u gradu je sve ili skuplji ili je čak nedostupan. Prvo što mi pada na pamet je ta infrastruktura. Da sad kažem ovo treba nam ovo i ovo i ovo. Kada je svet negde da kažemo stao prošle godine i kada je rad na daljinu postala ta takozvana nova normalnost, vrlo ubrzo je svima postalo jasno da možemo da budemo povezani čak i kada smo fizički odvojeni, upravo zahvaljujući digitalizaciji. Supruga, mislim ona radi u firmi, ali i sad sa ovim shiftom korone sve više i više ima opcije od kuće. I čak i u narednom periodu i da pređe full freelance i to nam je bila ideja, nama to vredi za sve ostale benefite koje dobijamo na selu. Ovde ima mnogo posla, znaš, a ljudi to malo teško prihvataju. Treba i da okopavaš baštu, i da kosiš travu, i da zalivaš cveće, i da brineš o tome, a ja mislim da je to... Mnogo lepše. Naravno, život u ruralnim sredinama se razlikuje mnogo od života u urbanim sredinama, ali mislimo da je digitalizacija upravo ta koja će umanjiti tu razliku. Ljudi na selu su naravno bastion tradicije, istorije, običaja, ali ujedno verujemo da su svi oni spremni da prihvate nove tehnologije koje će im doneti neke nove vrednosti u svakodnevni život. Great. Well, um, 
Great, well, actually, that, that video is really fantastic because it really sums up what we want to talk about. I mean, one of the themes of this conference has been that uh, European demography, uh, the future of European demography, is for sure, you know, very challenging. But there are also lots of opportunities and things which we or haven't been emphasised enough, and that's really one of the things that we want to um, talk about in this panel. And luckily, uh, we have people from one end of Europe to the other, from, uh, from Latvia to Italy and Armenia to uh, Spain, um, and including a colleague who is going to share her, uh, her wisdom from uh, Havana in Cuba. But first of all, we're kicking off with Narek Mukherjian, who is Minister of Labour and Social Affairs in um, Armenia. Um, Minister Mukherjian, what can we learn about this topic from Armenia? Over to you. And sorry, one thing I should have said earlier on is that we're on a tight timetable. So at, at this juncture, just please keep your interventions to, to five minutes and then you'll all come back. So um, over to you, Minister. Thank you, Excellencies, Honourable Ministers, Distinguished Guests, uh, Ladies and Gentlemen. First of all, let me to thank you for this uh, unique opportunity to address this conference, the content of which is very important and have very uh, interesting um, importance for our region. Uh, and uh, I want to thank to the government of Bulgaria and UNFPA uh, for extending me to the invitation to speak at this important event, uh, and in particular, the ministerial dialogue devoted to the issue of rural revitalization. So, uh, as most European countries, Armenia is uh, undergoing rapid demographic uh, changes. As many other countries in our region, we have been facing population decline. The major reason uh, was higher migration, but also low fertility, declining number of births, as well as additional issues uh, such as high infertility. In, uh, prenatal sex selection. Majority of these issues are quite common for our region and larger European context. I'm following uh, the, uh, you know, um, uh, this uh, of the participants during this last day, and I see many similarities. Uh, we also share another large-scale demographic uh, issue that is going to have significant impact uh, on our social landscapes. Rapidly aging population at adds to the burden that the state bears in terms of social security and I think the economy is the share of the working age population brings. Uh, however, we also have differences in terms of um, demographic challenges. Um, uh, for example, uh, as strange as it may seem, in Armenia since 2012, the fertility rate in rural areas has become lower than in urban areas. This is something that we have not observed uh, in any other country, at least at this point. Uh, moreover, traditionally, rural areas are more prone uh, to migration, both internal and uh, external, especially of the uh, young working age uh, population. The availability of social, economic and uh, cultural opportunities is more limited than in urban areas. And there are also differences in terms of housing opportunities as the rural areas are less attractive uh, for the construction businesses, etc. All these considerations uh, lead us to one conclusion. It is extremely important to put significant efforts into the revitalization of rural communities to even out the opportunities and conditions, as well as the availability and accessibility of services for everyone in, uh, in our country. Uh, in this uh, regard, one key idea that our government has adopted is, the, um, is that we have to apply a diversified approach to the development of uh, rural areas. This implies careful observation and assessment of the issues on the ground and then formulation and implementation of policy mechanisms. One practical example of such approach refers to allocation of state uh, social benefits. Our observations uh, show that many rural women who delivered a child uh, didn't receive monthly allowances. The reason was that a significant number of women in rural areas were engaged in such agricultural activities that didn't grant official employment status, while the law on state social benefits provided the allowance only to women uh, with such status. Hence, we applied a diversified approach and introduced an amendment uh, to the law on the social, the state social benefits, according to which rural women 
who delivered a child should receive monthly allowances irrespective to their employment status. We believe that uh, the mentioned amendment will support uh, rural women in their decisions on when and uh, how many children to have. We employ the same approach regarding the housing issue. We develop mechanisms that will allow, for example, young couples to build their own houses to compensate for the differences in the construction law benefits for rural and uh, urban settings. Examples, there are many examples, uh, but uh, in this context, I would like to mention that with the support of UNFPA, we have started to develop the population policy of the Republic of Armenia, which will enable the implementation of more targeted strategic programs aimed at further improving the demographic situation, taking into consideration the specific needs and issues of rural areas. In this regard, I'd like to express my high appreciation to the entire UNFPA team for their support and uh, cooperation. We accept that there is no one size fits all uh, solution for overcoming demographic challenge. In the longer run, the government uh, plans to undertake a number of measures in this direction. In the area, we, we shall work to provide the full package, not just targeting births to our families. Stable jobs with decent salaries, affordable housing, affordable quality care arrangements for small uh, children and elderly, and alignment of school and work schedules, ability to combine family and career. Parental leave for both parents that is flexible, well paid uh, and not too long and other long-term financial benefits targeting especially the rural areas. This will be a solution for the long run. Great. So to sum up, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I understand that many of the issues that we have discussed over the two, last two days are difficult and sometimes even controversial. However, I trust that our deliberations will result in new insights into the causes and consequences of population trends and patterns in Europe and offer invaluable advice to policymakers uh, as to how to best address the challenges that our region is uh, facing. In this regard, we welcome the launching of the Decade of Demographic Resilience for 2022-32 as one of the main outcomes of this uh, conference. Once Great. again, let me to thank you for this opportunity. Th thank, thank you very much. Well, um, that raises lots of questions, but we will come back to you. Thank you, Tim. Our next speaker is joining us from the European Commission. Hopefully, Desha, you can hear us. Uh, Ms. Desha Sershen, Deputy Head of Cabinet of Dubraka Shurica European Commission, Portfolio Democracy and Demography. So, Desha, um, the European Commission, uh, or Department of Democracy and Demography, has recently launched many initiatives, and we have seen some of the papers that you have produced. You have been involved in mapping the impact of demographic change. You have coordinated work on a long-term vision for rural areas, which is of particular interest for the session, including the connectivity and access to services. Can you tell us what is the most significant part of the Commission's long-term vision when it comes to rural areas? Thank you very much for, uh, for this introduction and I, I really enjoyed watching this video in the very beginning of this session because this is exactly what the long-term vision for rural areas that we have published uh, back in June is all about. It's about how to make sure that rural areas are become attractive and prosperous and connected. All this helps to the, to the green and to the digital transitions uh, that Europe is going through, but also how, uh, thanks to, 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 to the lessons learned from um, uh, from COVID-19, from this experience we are uh, unfortunately all going through. So I just wanted to say in a few words what it is that our ambition was with this long-term vision for, for, for rural areas, because the ambition was to, way, to go way beyond any individual policy that we have in the Commission. And, and you know that in the European Union we very often operate in silos, so we have agriculture, cultural policy, cohesion policy, transport policy. And what we wanted to do here is to create the real new momentum for rural areas and to bring all these policies together in order to make rural regions potentially attractive and prosperous, connected, and, 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 and really fit for the purpose. And so what we did is before launching this initiative, our president, President von der Leyen, was very clear that we needed to do it by listening to what people who live in rural areas actually have to tell us. 
And that's why I really love this, this, this introductory video. And uh, so we attached a really a big importance to, the, to this bottom-up approach. And, uh, and, and that is also why we started our work on the long-term vision with a public consultation. And we really carefully took into account all the messages that came from rural areas and build them into the into the communication uh, that we have published back in June. So the vision, as you might have seen, consists of a communication and of an underpinning action plan. And why did we do that? Is because we didn't want it to be just a, an abstract narrative. We really wanted this narrative and this orientation, this 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 commitment of the Commission to take into account the needs of rural areas to be underpinned by by real actions. So we have proposed some flagships that you might have seen in, 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 in the action plan underpinning the communication that is supposed to, 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 to really underpin the narrative with, with something very concrete, very tangible, and something we will actually report back on uh, already in 2023. And, uh, and, and why we had to do this this way is because the communication is just the beginning. So the communication is, is, is really a kind of a roadmap for the next 20 years. It's about how to make sure that rural areas actually become attractive places to live and to work. And all this thanks to these green digital transition, thanks to the, to the COVID-19 uh, experience. So we needed this flexibility and foresight uh, in, well, built into the communication and into this uh, this action plan, and and flexibility and foresight is also one of the lessons that we learned from COVID nineteen to be able to, to 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 somehow bounce back and and not only bounce back but actually bounce bounce forward. So we anchored this communication very much in this democracy and demography portfolio by turning the attention. To, to actually, we have 137 million people living in the European Union in rural areas. And, and we wanted really to make sure with the communication that never again they feel like being left behind. So the commitment that we have made is that when we publish initiative, publish communications, that we will make sure that we rural proof those documents, that we make sure that when, when we make an initiative, that, that we do it also for the benefit of our citizens living in, in rural areas. And now on Excellent. the very implementation, just one, one, one word, is that we're at the very beginning and conferences like this one is, are very important for us to, to, to hear how this can also be uh, watched from the, from the outside and not only from this little nucleus of, 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 of the European Union. So we want this vision to, to act as a trigger and, and to fuel a real kind of transform, transformative power by, by, by acting as a roadmap to 2040. Excellent. We'll close this rendezvous on the road when we will be reporting back. And I'll be happy to answer the questions on the vision, on the action plan, on the roadmap, uh, and to listen to what you have. Like Thank to you say. so much, Tasha. Uh, some of the points that you raised, we will come back to because they're super interesting. But now let's let's proceed with other speakers. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we're now moving to Juana Lopez Pagan. You're uh, for the Spanish government director general for policies against de depopulation. I mean, Mr. Sirshan was uh, talking about the sort of the, the, the big picture, but now let's zoom down to a member state, to a, a big country, but has been which has been suffering its own serious problems of depopulation. Um, tell us, you know, what, what's new from Spain? What's, what have you found that's working and what's not working in Spain? Good afternoon, first of all. Uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me to this fantastic conference. I'm very happy to, to have the opportunity to, to share uh, with you all the experience and, and to learn about the different approaches and, and realities all over the world. Um, and I many thanks for, for the organization and congratulations, Jaime, Alana, for, for this conference. It's, it's, uh, I said many times it's very important for, from Spain to stay here, and I have the opportunity to speak in my own language, so thank you very much for the, for the translation, and I now change to Spanish. Buenas tardes. Eh, voy a contestar rápido a, a esta primera intervención. De una forma sencilla, porque creo que en, en España, eh, digamos, la política contra la despoblación y la política de reto, doesn't work the no, translation? No. 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 Sorry.
Maybe the translator can say something. Hello? We're not hearing you. Well, uh... Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, is the translation functioning now? Fine. Don't worry. As I already have said to the question which was asked, uh, what uh, is... Uh, uh, what is the news in Spain? I have to tell you that in Spain there goes on uh, to have this great concern because of the population and the challenges uh, uh, related to uh, demography. We are fighting against the inequality in opportunities uh, which are existing uh, and uh, they are in view of the people living in small rural areas. And we've been uh, discussing now how to revitalize the rural regions. It's very, very important for the people who live in these small territories. In this sense, when I say that they used to be, and there goes on uh, this concern, uh, both on the level of government as well as on other uh, levels of governance, uh, what I have in mind is that for the first time a uh, government of Spain had decided to uh, create a national policy to address uh, demographic uh, uh, challenges. Uh, there is a ministerial document about uh, the uh, transition and uh, the challenges. We are developing right now public policies by all the institutions of the government, all the ministries. Uh, well, at the first glance, this might seem as a simple solution, but <clears throat> what we heard about the challenges we are facing, they are not one or two, it's a multitude of challenges and we have to design policies in housing, uh, in healthcare, in ecology, in the preservation of environment, create opportunities for young people, not only in urban areas, but in rural areas as well. To be able to rebuild uh, the <coughs> rural uh, uh, part of the country in view of a happier future. So the first policy which has been implemented nationally is translated into a strategy which is a mid and long term strategy between the years 2020 and 2030 to combat or uh, to give a response to demographic challenges uh, and the need of a more sustainable development. Uh, there was designed a three year plan, action plan how to use uh, different funds. Uh, to implement uh, more than 100 measures uh, against uh, <coughs> existing inequalities and imbalances in rural regions. These are measures which uh, <coughs> have to bear fruit uh, in the years to come. We have to change the model of development radically because now we are witnessing a development which is unstable and not uh, fair. So this uh, change is related to this mid and long term strategies. Do you think that we can manage this by ourselves? Uh, could a national government uh, find a means of changing the national picture? Uh, Spain is maybe one of the most decentralized uh, countries in the world. And we have to rely on the cooperation of all levels of governance. Uh, in our case, with uh, the governments of uh, autonomous uh, regions and local governments, uh, it's very difficult. Very often, we are in the state of uh, uh, waging a war to citizens to look them straight into the eyes and give them a concrete uh, answer. But this response has to be in line with the characteristic of uh, individual regions. Uh, 
I don't know that we will have success. I know that uh, we have a lot of projects. We have pilot projects as well, which we hope that they will uh, uh, let us uh, extract some technologies. But we need a politics with a capital P planning on the highest level, and it has to be uh, implemented on the European level because we all together are building up uh, an European Union uh, looking forward to the new uh, multi-annual framework. And we have to know how to correctly implement European measures and means uh, to achieve this uh, fair model of development and well-being. Uh, we think that we have to work uh, very well on the international level. That's why I'm here. We have to work all together hand in hand. And I congratulate you with uh, this idea of setting up this political alliance where we want to be present, where we want to learn our lessons from, give our contribution, and uh, achieve a more sustainable development of Europe. Allotted time. Um, as I said, we are um, going to we are listening going to be hearing people from one end of Europe uh, to the other, north to south, east to west. But um, now we're going to go from uh, from uh, from one side of the uh, Spanish-speaking world to the other. Thank you, Tim. Uh, yes, now we're greeting Cuba. I just checked the time. Local time in Havana is 8 o'clock in the morning. So good morning. Um, we have a contributor, panelist, uh, Dr. Matilde Molina, Deputy Director of a Center for Demographic Studies, University of Havana, Cuba. Um, the question I would like to ask you is related uh, to the balance between urban and rural and what has been the impact of, of COVID. So we know that COVID pandemic has created lots of problems and interruptions throughout the world. But what are the unexpected opportunities that you might have seen uh, in Cuba as a result of COVID-19? Sí, buenos días. Muchas gracias eh, por la organización y la invitación a Cuba a este Thank you very much for your invitation, uh, which was uh, sent to Cuba. I think that it's very important for us to get involved in this conference uh, in a ministerial meeting where we'd be able to once more uh, raise the most important issues uh, and uh, to present the strategy which is followed by Cuba in the framework and conditions of the present pandemic. Uh, the strategy of Cuba has uh, basic, uh, some basic elements. Uh, first, uh, we should uh, not neglect the role of science in Cuba. It should be taken into consideration and uh, how we could cope uh, with the existing economic crisis. Today, of course, uh, We have to undertake a number of measures. For Cuba, it's very important uh, to uh, decrease, to reduce the disparities between uh, the village and the towns. Uh, it's very important uh, to, re to understand what's the essence, what's the core of this problem, what are the needs of the rural population uh, in uh, Havana, where most of uh, the population are women. What are the imbalances uh, from the demographic point of view between uh, the village and the cities? Uh, there is an increase of the population in rural regions. Uh, it's very important as well that there is an issue with the uh, education and training of adolescents. Uh, Cuba had undertaken a number of very important measures to guarantee better living conditions in rural regions. Uh, uh, the issue of COVID is an opportunity for the government in Cuba to implement the necessary measures to counteract uh, the consequences. Uh, the Cuban government uh, uh, is taking highly on education for the development of economy. I'm sorry, uh, obviously there's 68% of the population of Cuba uh, are vaccinated while 98% of children uh, are to 
Of course, uh, there is a risk, there is an existing risk of... Uh, uh, and we should uh, uh, implement the necessary measures to uh, overcome this uh, risk. And to reduce the disparities between town and village. We have to uh, take into consideration the uh, amended conditions of life, the changing reality, as well as the dangers which uh, have arisen uh, in the conditions of the pandemic. Uh, and we have to channel our efforts to the development of rural regions above all. Women who live uh, in the villages uh, are more affected uh, uh, by demographic changes. Uh, and in what uh, uh, manner we can counteract those uh, changes. Uh, Cuba is implementing a number of measures to guarantee the balance between rural and urban areas. We had adopted a new uh, model of integral rural development uh, and an improvement of the rural structure. as well as uh, uh, measures for the development of tourism in the rural regions. Measures for the amendments of the economic structure in the rural regions. And in addition to that, uh, we have to elaborate a new strategy, a strategy for the use uh, of uh, of uh, new measures for enhancing the role of women in the economic development, uh, taking into consideration the characteristic features of these regions. Well, and as well to combat uh, the pollution uh, uh, of the environment, uh, we have a program until 2030 to which we have channeled all our efforts, uh, and uh, namely, we are working in this direction. Areas, oh. how they're affected by the whole COVID-19, but you have also put forward some vision for the future, how it can be developed, especially the rural areas in terms of tourism, but also structures. Thank you so much. We will come back to that. Great. Um, okay. Well, we're now going to Francine pick up your um, here with us, and uh, resident representative of the UNDP in uh, Serbia. Um, Serbia has had uh, very significant d uh, demographic uh, challenges, um, but when it comes to rural areas, um, you know, in your view, what needs to be done in Serbia to help revitalise um, rural areas? Thanks very, very much, Tim, and thank you to UNFPA, to Alana, to John for, for inviting me to participate in, in this really interesting panel. Um, I'm very pleased to speak about Serbia. Um, Serbia is more rural than the EU average, and on top of that, as you said, Tim, it is facing, as is the rest of Eastern Europe, a serious problem with depopulation. Uh, which was aggravated by COVID. We've seen actually last year in 2020, record numbers, uh, deaths exceed births in record numbers. Uh, we've also seen emigration slow down with, with COVID, but it's also appearing to start picking up again, uh, people leaving the country. Um, the other point I would just say by way of introduction is we have to talk about uh, rural revitalization at the sub-national level because there's so much disparities between different parts of the country. And it's really difficult to talk about villages in isolation of the towns around them, which are also facing shrinking populations. So it's important to see the issue in context. Traditionally, and this has been a subject of discussion today and yesterday, traditionally we approach these issues with single point solutions, individual projects, sectors, 
Uh, for example, Serbia is investing in rural broadband. B rural broadband is excellent. It's a precondition for rural revitalization. But without affordable housing, without kindergartens, schools, and other services, it's, it's not going to work by itself. So we've talked a lot in the last two days about complexity, holistic approaches, not working in silos, but actually doing it in practice is really difficult. Um, so what we're doing um, as UNDP is we're taking what we call a systemic portfolio approach to the issue, seeing it as a big systemic wide issue and looking to experiment and learn from those experiments what kind of entry points, what kind of actions will have the biggest impact. We're happy to be working with our sisters and, and brothers in uh, UNFPA to design a portfolio to address the issue, which we're doing in partnership with the government. And we've actually designed a portfolio. We'd like you to go and have a look at it at the, uh, at the expo. Please read our portfolio, but also comment on it. We want to hear what you think about it. Um, and, and so this work is, is moving forward. The key messages from that portfolio are, we need to adapt and plan for these new demographic realities. It's difficult to reverse. Let's plan for this new demographic reality. And let's not look for single point solutions, but address this in a, in a, in a holistic way. Now, when it comes to rural revitalization, there's so much upfront investment needed uh, I think it's important to identify realistically where are the entry points which can make a big difference? Where are the signals that change is possibly already happening? And in that sense, the, the film was super because it shows that there's already ha some change happening and some new investments in rural areas. Actually, last year in Serbia, uh, the number of sort of weekend homes bought in rural areas doubled. Uh, and house prices and property prices in rural areas increased a lot, which is a sign that people are interested in moving to the, to the rural areas. And then also with COVID, as, as other people have said, we see that people are more location independent now. So they have more flexibility to live um, outside. So this is a signal of a possible future trend in which we can invest. So through our research, we've identified three types of people who are uh, moving to rural areas. The first is the traditional digital nomads, the people who choose to come to Serbia because of a good and affor affordable quality of life. The second group is, um, is people uh, like the person on, on the film who decided to leave the city and move to the rural area for his kids, for the cleaner air, the better, the better cleaner living. And then the third group is those diaspora, those people, Serbians, who moved to work in the EU or elsewhere and with COVID came back to Serbia. They are a big group in Serbia and most of them are still around. And they're now working for foreign companies remotely from Serbia and some of them are choosing to live in, in rural areas. So this is an opportunity. We're not sure how much of a trend it is yet, but two things are important to keep these people here. First is connectedness, and we're talking about physical connectedness. Yes, we need roads, but we're also talking about social connectedness. People need people around them. And actually, we have some interesting findings that um, uh, telephone traffic, data exchanged between communities is an excellent proxy for the risk of depopulation. So if people are socially connected, there's much less risk of depopulation. So, so these things are very important. And then um, the, the, the last point I wanted to mention on this is we do see this as an opportunity for investment. If you are one of these people, a digital nomad, what we call in-betweeners, people who aren't tourists but they're not long-term residents yet, you're more likely to get a haircut than if you're just a tourist in a rural area. So, and there are other investments that are also coming as these people move to rural areas. So it's a signal of a possible interesting trend. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as with everybody else, we'll come back to you with a question or two. Okay. Thank you. Um, next, we move to Latvia. And 
This also, I, uh, the, the, the next contributor actually shows how, how rural discussion about rural areas and revitalization and development is a cross-cutting issue. Because yesterday we talked about young people, but also elderly people, and all these groups can relate to the questions of rural revitalization. Our next speaker is Sandra Eimane, Latvian Young Farmers Club. Um, so it's both young and working in rural areas. Uh, Latvian Young Farmers Club actually brings young farmers, rural youth and other interested people who care about development of Latvia's rural regions. Now question for you Sandra is what is the Latvian rural story and whether this story can be replicated elsewhere? Yes, thank you very much. Hello everyone. Uh, greetings from Latvia with snow. And maybe right now I won't talk so much about political strategies, but um, maybe about that, what was the question? So I want to uh, question for you, everyone. Um, is it easy to be young at countryside? Uh, I think that everyone has to think about this. And uh, you have to find your own story and your own way for rural uh, areas. And uh, almost every time when we talk about youth, we are thinking about future. But we have to remember that youth is present. It is uh, all the time and right now. In Latvia, I have to say that young people are hard cared. But when we are talking about sustainability, future, uh, environment, food sector, economics, and so on, uh, we have to remember that uh, social aspect in rural areas is really important. And so we also discuss about business skills, uh, Latvian rural quality and values, and uh, psychological needs and uh, experience stories are the best. But in recent years, more and more people are moving to the countryside due to the pandemic, the stressful life, and uh, also about that remotely work and uh, because in the rural environment you can not only work in agriculture sector but also you can develop your own business create your place do what already you do in the city but do it combine life in the countryside but before living in the countryside it must, must be understood that it is not immediately a place of a dream of a ideal but a place to develop and adapt for yourself. You have to use what is already in that place. In Latvia, we have rural advisory experts and consultants, mentoring support, uh, business incubators, and young people also have additional support for land. New families have benefits for a house or apartment loan. And uh, we also have exchange programs for studying, working, and it is really great opportunity to get uh, experience from other countries. We have a lot of support from European Union funds and projects, and we will have to follow European Green Deal. So uh, change between generations is not being historical long for Latvia. So right now and many years, it is important for young people to appreciate what their parents and grandparents have achieved. Uh, they have to be grateful and they have to learn from the experiment experience. And the older people have to allow young people to develop, to make mistakes and innovate. For conclusion, I want to say that in Latvia, we emphasize that a country without a developed rural environment will be like nothing. And uh, all the time, we have to remember about ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you very much. We'll come back to that. Um, great. We're, we're now going to Italy, um, where I'd like to introduce uh, Sabrina Lucatelli. Um, you've got two hats, um, Sabrina. You're vice chair of the OECD Rural Working Party and your senior policy evaluation expert at the Italian Department for Cohesion uh, Policy. Um, let's start at this stage with the OECD. 
when it comes to rural, uh, rural areas and, and, and returns and revitalisation, what, what trends are you detecting across the OECD? I, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, all of you for the organization of this uh, magnific um, conference. I would have been pleased to be with you there, but unfortunately it's becoming extremely difficult, as you know, with the pandemic situation to fly and to move. So um, I will uh, bring you the result of uh, almost uh, 35 years of common work of the Rural Working Party group, which is a, a extremely a, a interesting group because it is dealing with the rural issues uh, from uh, an, uh, an integrated uh, perspective. So what we learned and what we did uh, in, in this long period, we uh, worked a lot with the uh, different OECD countries and we um, invested uh, in strongly to understand how diverse are rural areas. So it, it is not possible to talk about rural areas as they, were, they are the same everywhere. What we understood strongly in the years is that remoteness is an extremely crucial issue. So when we talk about rural areas around a metropolitan city or close to a small medium city is quite different from an area which is extremely remote. In terms of uh, this difference, in terms of, uh, in terms of total population in OECD, about 29% of uh, population lives in no metropolitan, metropolitan regions, so in rural areas, and 21% uh, is quite close to metropolitan areas, and 80% is uh, remote. So this is the situation in OECD. In terms of economic growth, there is a quite different, there is a difference, and especially we, we could see a, a, an important difference in between the pre, previous previous the uh, the crisis period previous the crisis and after the 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 2009 crisis so before there was a catching up the rural also the remote areas were growing and they were catching up the rest of uh, the metro regions and the, and the, the and the other areas after the crisis the crisis uh, proved to be particularly difficult for remote areas. So with this catching up, slow down, and now we see again, you know, the difference in terms of GDP per capita growing. This is in general the economic situation. Concerning the elderly, the elderly and the, and the, and the problem of, uh, of the shrinking is, uh, is, is um, it, it, it's a phenomenon which uh, concerns uh, all the rural areas in general, but particularly and more strongly the remote ones. So it's confirming again a difficulty of remote uh, rural areas. The, um, the, the interesting thing is that uh, uh, there is not, uh, uh, in terms of uh, birth rates, uh, and in the, 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 there is no big difference. I mean, uh, the, the, the families are doing the same number of uh, babies. Uh, we don't see any, any important difference in between different areas, but the migrations are quite different. So what we can see is, the, is that remote, remote rural areas in particular uh, 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 have a difficulty in attract seeing people. So in the in the last period, we I can say that the OECD invested in three main fields of researching, and we are now understanding a number of important issues that we, we transport in, in policy issues. One uh, field of work is innovation. So we, we think that there is important work to do with both companies and the social innovation to create jobs in rural areas. The second field is the field of well-being and services for rural people. We know that the governments have been cutting investment in, uh, in services in rural areas. We know also that uh, opening a school and keeping a school in rural areas, it costs more. So we are now trying to understand with the government innovative solutions and uh, also a possibly a different uh, way and schemes of financing services in in, in rural areas. Uh, the, the, the third important and not last uh, field of uh, investment is uh, the necessity to have a, a new agenda for climate change. And this is, uh, we have been working uh, together in, uh, in, uh, in Glasgow just uh, a couple of weeks ago. And this is also a crucial, a crucial issue because from the climate change adaptation and the way of, of uh, uh, investing in, uh, in, uh, in circular economy, 
economies and cleaner economies is also a way of creating new jobs and a better quality of life. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for keeping to the time. Um, and we will come back to you. Um, we're now going to move to the second part of our uh, panel, where um, we've agreed that we're going to come back to um, each of our panellists um, with a question or with an idea that has arisen out of um, what they've already said. And I'm starting, I'm kicking off this round with, uh, uh, with Disha uh, Sudhusan at the European uh, Commission. Um, when you began your work, Disha, it was basically just pretty much just kind of months or not, not very long before uh, the, the, the pandemic. And, and I was wondering, especially with relation to, um, to, to, to rural areas and uh, rural revitalisation, um, whether you think that um, COVID is really going to make sort of a, a long-term profound difference or, or even or maybe it's still too early to say. I mean, you know, what, what, what do you think almost two years into the pandemic and, and, and how does it look? Yeah, it, it's funny, Tim, you say this, because if you remember, we actually met on the, in the very first month of our mandate and we didn't yes. even know what was coming up. So at that moment, as you know, demography and democracy is, is really a completely new portfolio that we have in the Commission. And yes. there is no service servicing us. So all the Commission services are servicing us. And now yeah. on your question, is COVID going to, to, to change them? Actually, actually, the impact is so huge that it is so impacting all of our policies and and from even from the statistics what we have now we are already observing something that we call internally reverse migration i don't know if, if the same if the same term is used uh, uh, well outside of, of, of our institutions but now we are trying to confirm this trend of re reverse migration uh, with the official statistics from eurostat so what we are observing as, as you are in bulgaria is that as a consequence of COVID, it seems that in 2020, a large number of people have actually taken, taken the road back to many of the countries like Croatia, Bulgaria, Romania, Baltic countries. Now, this is not, the question is, is this going to stay? Is this, is this just a, a, moment, a trend for this moment or is this something that is going to stay? And the assumption is that because of these green and digital transitions, um, it actually might stay because of the teleworking that is developing, because of the, 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 the healthy way of living, the Green Deal. So the whole point is to catch the right moment and, and to make sure that these areas where people would be interested to, to go actually become really attractive and connected and, 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 uh, and, 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 and good for the professional and, and, and the personal life. There is one thing I wanted to pick up from the discussion is, is this depopulation, because this whole long-term vision on rural areas that we did is very much anchored in the, in the question of demography. And we will proceed next year with a new initiative on brain drain and population decline. And, and, and as much this experience from, from Spain as from other countries, we are actually, with the help of our Atlas of Demography, we are trying to identify regions that suffer the most from this phenomenon of population decline and, and take them by the hand. And with this new initiative that we will have next year, try to see what kind of solutions we can propose with the help of EU funds, EU policies and, and, and everything together to, to, to try to make something positive out of this. And yesterday I took part in the in the session together with the vice president. It was the opening session. And uh, and I think the, the, the deputy secretary general, your secretary general, mentioned this, this notion of three C's. And I very much liked it. And the three C's are COVID, uh, um, it, was, it was COVID climate, and uh, for her it was conflict. But here I would say COVID climate and connecti connectiveness. Because these are the three elements that will make sure that rural areas could actually become attractive. The COVID with the potential reverse migration, climate because of the healthy living that rural areas may promote, and connectiveness in terms of connection, not only roads, but actually connection to the digital, to this whole digital network, making teleworking possible, but also to the social network that actually makes the living a, a, a good one where right. I reach. Okay, well, th thank you. Sorry, sorry to, 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 to stop you there, but uh, we, we're on a strict timetable. So uh, thank you. That, that's great. Indeed. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Mukchan, I would like to get back to you um, 
on one question, which was, uh, in a way, you have described that the diversifying approach towards uh, rural areas is a key point. One question that interests me, and one point that has been already mentioned yesterday and today, digitalization. How important it is, and have you come up already with some policies that could implement digitalization in rural areas? We can't hear you. Can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Thank you for the okay. question. Uh, thank, uh, thank you. It's it's very interesting and important question. In fact, uh, one of the key principles of the government of Republic of Armenia to adopt integrated approach, multi-dimensional approach uh, for the revitalization of rural areas, and of course, digitalization is an important part in this uh, agenda. And uh, fortunately, 96% of Armenia's population has access to internet. And the Republic of Armenia, of course, has some, you know, this um, um, uh, strategy of digitalization. And now we are uh, in the process of um, uh, um, uh, reform, just uh, keeping together different municipalities. And uh, under this um, uh, reform, so there is an important part that, uh, so from each rural areas, we will provide the opportunity for population to get access to different governmental uh, services. For example, from one window, citizens can, for example, have access to more than 60 uh, governmental services. So this is ongoing reform and uh, an important part of the integrated approach that we have uh, in this um, so general general policy. So and this is a part of uh, infrastructure development because without the development of infrastructures, it's very difficult to understand and to implement um, uh, practical policies for the revitalization of rural areas. So, uh, yeah, this is the important you. part of, of our agenda. Uh, Thank you very much. Great. Um, um, back to um, Havana. Um, Mathilde Molina, there was something I, 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 I just wanted to clarify with you, which was, I thought was very um, interesting. Um, am I right that you said that the overwhelming part, population of rural areas was, uh, was women? Uh, because that's what I understood you to say. That's how, that's how it came across. But is, is that correct? And if so, why is that? But briefly. Did, did you get my question? I mentioned this in relation to policy. emphasize that apart from the national program for national development, we have a national program for demographic dynamic, uh, where it is stated what kind of priority it is for Cuba, the question of uh, achieving uh, a balance between rural and urban areas. Within this program, We uh, review the policies to improve birth rates and also to give more focus on early fertility. A large percentage of rural population is uh, over 60 years old, and this is a demographic phenomenon uh, across the country. One of the key challenges is uh, fertility among young people, illegitimacy, especially among uh, the young people in rural areas. In the course of many years, there used to be a discrepancy between rural and urban areas in that respect. 
However, we now what we're now witnessing is a need to strengthen policies focusing on rural women in order to outline the key factors for the high adolescent fertility in the country. We must uh, strengthen the application of uh, birth control contraceptives, and we are now adopting a new code where uh, we erase uh, marriage age to 18 years. And these are policies which can provide the launch pad for I mean, in the original, your original statement, I had understood you to say that the majority of the rural population was female. Did I, did I misunderstand that? I mean, it's basically yes or no. Can you repeat? Uh, I had understood you to say in your original uh, statement that the majority of the rural population were women. Did I misunderstand that or is that correct? No, eh, estaba, no. But, but briefly, no, no, huh? no hay más mujeres que hombres. Cuarenta y seis coma cinco por ciento de la población. Yes, 46% of the rural population is uh, women. 46% of the rural population are women. embarked on some really interesting novel models, if you will, of revi reviving rural areas. One model has been uh, selling out properties very cheaply that can be reconstructed. That has happened also in Italy. We have seen it elsewhere. Can you give us one more example that could be explored and possibly replicated elsewhere? Just very briefly, please. Um, Bueno, esta, esta cuestión muy breve eh, se está explorando en algunos... Eh, en al yes, uh, in some uh, towns and in some small settlements this is uh, possible because uh, there is a housing uh, issue. When we uh, discussed which are the people who come back, which are the profiles of people who return to rural regions, uh, is that at the end of the day we have to acknowledge that these are middle class representatives which uh, are able uh, to come back to the village. Uh, so there is uh, still a kind of inequality. If you give me 30 seconds, uh, I would like to uh, present uh, four ideas which are very simple. First, we have to think about the development of rural regions, but connect it with the whole territory, not only about the development of rural regions. We have to not to forget that there should be a bond between the rural uh, area and the uh, metropolis, the big city, to be able to uh, generate polycentric models uh, and avoid this concentration of uh, revenues, people, employment, etc. in big cities. And finally, uh, a little bit uh, in response to your question asked Matilde, and which is linked to one of the biggest uh, challenges uh, in, in uh, in inequality a week ago, we celebrated the day, International Day Against uh, uh, Violence on Women, and I have to tell that in rural regions, uh, this violence is very high in them. So we have to take uh, much care to combat this phenomenon. Me, as a director in the uh, Spanish government, I'm very concerned about the equality between uh, genders, because without equality, there is no development.
um, Latvia, but very quickly. There's a kind of, sometimes it feels as a kind of romantic idea of these uh, people going back to the countryside, but they're sitting there with their laptops, um, you know, drinking cocktails and working remotely. But actually, what really, a lot of what needs to be done in the countryside is people getting their hands dirty and farming, like you. Um, is this a problem in Latvia that you, you've got your villages are filling up with, with people with, with nice laptops, but not enough people to do the work that needs to be done in the countryside? But briefly. Okay, thank you. I hope that understood your question. Uh, in Latvia, over rural areas, we have agriculture, forestry, uh, rivers, lakes, and also people with laptops who are just drinking coffee and uh, looking at grass or forest and also looking at those who are doing those uh, works with coasts or with fields. So we have both of them, but really interesting is that fact when those people uh, meet each other and uh, introduce what they are doing. So this is like good way for information and for information exchange and uh, maybe sometimes it is really good way for cooperation. Uh, it was br briefly for answer. Yeah, no, no, that's great what it sounds, I mean, okay. I can hear the picture, it sounds kind of quite optimistic there, so, okay, but uh, fine, we'll have to come back, we could probably have another whole panel on this. Thank you. Um, Miss Pickup, I have a question for you that is related, related to something that has happened uh, three, four weeks ago, Scotland, COP26. Uh, climate change has been mentioned throughout the conference, yesterday very much so, and today as well. UNDP is very active in that area. Where do you see the connection with rural re revitalization and demographic change, especially now in the light of COP? So I, I spoke just now about how mobility is especially with COVID, is, a, is an opportunity for rural revitalization. I think what we're also saying in this panel is, is green transformation is another opportunity for rural areas. And I think in general, with COP in Glasgow, uh, there was a general disappointment that the ambition wasn't higher, especially in terms of uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and phasing out uh, fossil fuels, but also it was good because it raised the alarm on we need to adapt now. Climate change is already happening. It's already affecting our rural areas. And we need to step up with finance to support green transformation now. And richer countries need to really step up and provide some of that finance to help the green transformation. So this is really important for rural areas. And because what we're also seeing is that those areas affected by depopulation are the same areas that are most affected by COVID, least able to deal with COVID, and also most affected by the impacts of climate change. So any solution that we want to address demographic resilience needs to work hand in hand with increasing climate resilience. That's important for strengthening the demographic, the, sorry, the development prospects in any rural areas that we address demographic resilience and climate resilience together. So that I think is, is really important. Um, that would be my main message. But the, I mean, the ways we do that, you know, already we are working to plan for climate change, to mitigate disasters, smart agriculture, renewable energy, these are things that help the environment, but they also create green jobs, they create productivity, uh, economic growth. And so these, we need a lot more of this. And so we need the private sector to be part of the solution there. Great, th th thank you very much. Um, we're, we're coming back to you, um, Sabrina, Sabrina Lucatelli, uh, and you're, uh, we discussed this before, um, you're now changing hats. You're taking off your OECD hat and you're putting on your Italian hat. Tell us a little bit about the trends in Italy, but keep it short. Okay. Uh, Italy decided to, to make a big investment on the, on the issue of the population of rural areas already uh, on 2012. So we launched a special action which is called the Strategia Nazionale delle Aree Interne, Inner Area Strategy, and this is uh, uh, in tackling the, uh, the relaunch, uh, socioeconomic relaunching of 72 areas around the countries from the very north to the very south. 
the areas are remote rural areas and we are putting together a strong investment with the place-based approach so each municipalities association is having is signing a contract with the state and the region and is working hardly on the reorganization of social services to to people and also to investment and jobs creation for young people this is a, a around 1 billion R, uh, 1 billion investment which is now arriving in the 72 areas we, are, we do also the big uh, movement uh, coming out from the bottom side of people, which is a, it's a big NGO coming out, which is called the Rehabilitar Italia, and where many different kind of people, professors, operators, doctors, students, they are working together as an association because we understood that there was a, the necessity also to make a, a cultural change. So those areas have to be, um, they were uh, seen, they had been seen as areas where the, to, to, go, to go out. You know, the grandparents who were say, they were saying to the kids, you have to leave, you cannot have your future here. But now we know that, that this is not true anymore. The situation, the living situation is quite good in our remote areas, even if there are difficulties and we want to 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 have a more uh, a, a more uh, um, a, a more equilibrated um, population uh, in between cities and remote areas so we are uh, we did a big survey with uh, with the young people we know that the big majority of young italians living in remote uh, rural areas they want to keep there they want to stay there and they want to make an investment for their life so we are in the very middle of a big effort we think that it's necessary also to work more and better with ordinary policies. So I'm talking about regional and cohesion policy. Now we need to have, you know, much more uh, attention from health, uh, mobility, transportation, and different sectoral policies. Great. Thank, thank you very much. I mean, we have a problem, which is that every uh, one minute answer basically uh, suggests that we need to have a, a, a one day conference on each uh, question. Uh, but it's good that we know what, what, are, the, what are the questions. Um, over to you for the next section. Thank you. Um, we have very little time left, but what would be extremely uh, useful, I think both for, for us and your, from your end, um, would be to, to try to pin down the exact policies or maybe issues, ideas, that would, you, would, you would like to take further. The reason why I'm saying that is that you have heard yesterday and today uh, throughout the conference about Sophia Alliance Policy and Practice Community for Demographic Resilience. If there is one policy, one issue that you think should be taken further, that should be deepened in discussions, what would that be? It would be great if you could answer that one um, in 30 seconds. Thank you. Maybe we can start with the same order. Oh, yes. So. Um uh, well, we're going to start with the, the original order. So, uh, Mr. Merke, Minister Merkachan, you've got like w just 30 seconds. What's the most important issue? Hello, are you there? Oh, he's left. Oh, that's a pity. Okay. Well, but fine. Uh, then, secondly, we have. Hold on a second. Uh, do, we do, do we go in the same? Ms. Des uh, yeah. Desha Sirshan, are you still there, Desha? Yes, I'm here. Yes, yeah, good. You've got. Like, uh, I'll obviously come with a with a European Union policy. For me, the most important one is the cohesion policy, because unless we have the balanced territorial development of all European regions, uh, we will never be able to make rural areas attractive. And that's why we actually put all our hopes on 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 cohesion policy and good implementation of operational programs and partnership agreements for next next programming period. Super. Uh, um, Juana, you've got your one minute, your less than a minute. What's the most important thing? Okay. El reto demográfico es un reto democrático. Un reto de igualdad, de derechos y oportunidades. Is a democratic challenge. Uh, this is a challenge uh, for inequality of opportunities between rural regions, smaller towns, uh, where we have to succeed because their citizens should not feel like uh, second class citizens. We should not allow this to happen. Institutions and governments we should not allow. Uh, 
people from uh, rural areas and uh, smaller settlements uh, to uh, feel like a second category citizens, and we have to improve their way of living. Uh, Mathilde Molina next, very quickly. To preserve the balance between uh, uh, rural regions, uh, taking into consideration the rights of all the people living in these areas, both uh, with regard to education and health care, we have to achieve this. Uh, to indeed be able to meet demographic uh, issues uh, uh, which are facing us, uh, which will result in the population of rural regions. Uh, Francine? Two things in 30 seconds. First, no single point silver bullet solutions. We need an integrated approach. And secondly, I would say the environment is changing so fast because of climate change and technology is developing so fast and we know that we're not going to be able to reverse depopulation. We can't reverse these trends. So whatever we do needs to invest with the future in mind. So invest now with the t next 10, 10 or more years ahead in mind because things are changing so fast. Thank you. Sorry, yes, uh, well, uh, Sandra in Latvia, it's your, what's the um, most important uh, thing? One, one important thing that we need to do or needs to be done. Okay, I think for Latvia, uh, really important will be uh, to do smart actions to achieve Green Deal. Fine, okay. Thank you. It's short and, short and sweet. And uh, Sabrina Lucatelli, the last word is to yeah. you. A livable life, a well-being for a family in rural areas. Great. Um, I'm afraid our time is up. Uh, Jaime has an announcement for us. Thank you very much. And yet again, a great uh, dialogue. I think it's been super rich. We are, starty, we, are, we are slightly over the time that was allotted for, uh, for the dialogue. So in order not to start the next dialogue with any delay and then postpone or carry over the delay onto the closing ceremony, we're gonna change the setup of the stage for the next uh, dialogue. I would like to kindly ask you not to go away. You can stretch, you can stand up mm -hmm. and wait for a few minutes until we have everything ready and we move on to the next dialogue. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, and I would just like to say, thank, just like to take advantage, hang on a second, to say thank you very much to my panelists, both uh, here and um, online. I hope you're still there. Thank you, thank you very much indeed.
Dear colleagues, can you please take a seat? They save the best for last, if you haven't heard. Dear colleagues, thank you very much for coming. A warm welcome to everyone in this room, a warm welcome to everyone online. This is our final dialogue of this exciting conference. It is on the financing of social policies in a new demographic era. I'm Michael Herman, advisor with UNFPA, and together with my colleague, Borka Czeremik, she is the assistant representative and head of UNFPA Serbia office. I will be moderating this panel. Now in the 1990s, 2000s, lots of countries in this region in particular have reformed their social systems. That is in part, that was in part a response, of course, to the transition from a centrally planned economy to a market economy. But these reforms were also inspired by demographic change, notably the aging of populations. Yeah. Now, today, I don't want, we don't want to discuss these changes that were undertaken. And that's also a shout out to the panelists. Please don't reflect on the changes themselves. What we want to discuss today is much more forward looking. We want to know whether the changes that were undertaken to the social systems pension reforms, healthcare reforms, are adequate. Are these changes sufficient to ensure the resilience of our social systems to further demographic change? Because more demographic change is going to happen. Populations continue to age, populations will be shrinking, migration is going to accelerate. And as we have heard yesterday, for example, in the opening panel, the acceleration of migration, among other things, poses challenges to social systems. And that's not enough, because as these demographic megatrends, if you like, are unfolding, other megatrends are unfolding and they are interacting with each other, including the digitization of the economy, robotics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, which fundamentally change the world of work. So today we really want to discuss, are the social systems of your countries, are these social systems resilient to further demographic change that we are anticipating and other changes that are intersecting with these? If not, what changes would be required to make social systems resilient? How could we finance something like this? Do we need to think beyond financing at the level of central government? Do we need to think about social protection systems and financing at sub-national levels? So these are the questions we want to discuss with you today. And uh, for this conversation, for this discussion, we have really invited an outstanding cast of political leaders and experts. And they will now be introduced to you by my colleague, Borka. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel today. Uh, so, our first speaker will be His Excellency Sahil Babayev, who is the Minister of Labor and Social Protection of the Population of Azerbaijan. Then we have Dr. Reiko Hayashi from the National Institute of Population and Social Security Research in Japan. Then we have His Excellency Martina Stepankova, Deputy Minister of Labor and Social Affairs from Czech Republic. We have great pleasure to have with us here today His Excellency Fran Francisco Delgado Jimenez, Vice Minister for Human Development and Social Inclusion from Costa Rica. Then we will have chance to talk to Professor Alexia Funkras Perksvets, I'm sorry for my pronunciation, co-director of the Center for Demography and Global Human Capital. Then we have Dr. Dan Persiun, Chair and Parliamentary Commission on Social Protection, Health and Family in the Republic of Moldova. And finally, Dr. Helmut Schwarzer, Public Finance Economist, Social Protection Department of the International Labour Organization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Borka, for these introductions. So let me paraphrase uh, once more 
the questions we would like you to focus on in the first round, really, of your interventions. And you have about six minutes for your intervention. Um, so the first one really is the social systems that we see today in the countries in this region, elsewhere, from your respective perspectives, do you think that these social systems can weather further demographic changes? Are they prepared for the future? Are they demography-proof, if you like? If they are not, what, of, what changes would you consider particularly important to make to these systems? Do we need to look beyond the extension of protection systems at the central level of government? Do we, should we consider social protection systems at subnational levels, for example? So this is the first set of questions that I would like you, invite you to focus on in your statements. You have six minutes. And let me start with you, Excellency, Minister Babayev. You have the floor. Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. I would like to extend my greetings to all the participants and to thank and uh, express my gratitude to the government of Bulgaria and UNFPA for the opportunity to reflect on the issues of social security in the context of demographic change. Azerbaijan pays continued attention to the topic of demographic sustainability in order to ensure the overall sustainable development of the country. While a country with stable demographic development and this development pace is forecasted to be maintained until 2050. Today, the average age in Azerbaijan is around 34 and until 2050, we are prognosing to reach uh, the average age of 43, which is pretty much average uh, for the uh, developing and developed countries and which enables us demographically to may have a sustainable social protection system. Our state policy is aimed at keeping this pace and if necessary, at providing additional support. The preference is given to social policies enabling the vulnerable groups of the population, such as youth, the elderly, women, and people with disabilities to fulfill their potential, ensuring access to decent work opportunities and allowing people of all ages to be healthy and active. On the other hand, in order to adapt the knowledge and skills of the older people to the demands of the current and future economy, the issues of creating a system of lifelong learning that responds to new challenges should be prioritized. Our government social reforms take into account potential demographic changes and ensure preparedness for the possible future risk. As a growing nation, if you compare with the early years of the independence in the early 90s, today Azerbaijani population have risen almost uh, for, 40, uh, for 60%. So we, when we became independent, Azerbaijani population was less than 7 million, around 6.5 million now, it's more than 10 million. And it creates, of course, a continuous challenge and new perspectives for the uh, future of the social uh, protection system, as well as for the employment activities. Uh, coming to the uh, technological change, I think that technological change in our time, as well as the effect of COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, conflict and post-conflict situations require states to implement adequate social programs to address this issue. And Azerbaijan as a country facing this problem in 2020, as a result of 44 day war, we restored our territorial integrity within the framework of international law after almost 30 years of occupation of our lands. And today, another big challenge in front of us is the uh, restoration of the liberated territories, as well as integration of them to the overall economy of Azerbaijan, as well as of the region. And considering the fact that we have had for the long years almost 1 million refugees in the country, it creates another challenge for this type of vulnerable categories of people for their social protection, as well as for their uh, integration to the employment system, to the social protection system, and of course creates another huge burden on the uh, government policies. As a part of strategy of active aging in Azerbaijan, policies covering important aspects of quality of life and in old age, and aimed at creating employment participation in society and the opportunity to, the, to lead an independent, healthy and safe life, as well as creating an environment conducive to active aging will be further strengthened. In general, current reforms in the system of labor, employment and social protection 
are aimed at legalizing informal employment, improving the quality indicators of the labor market, strengthening the insurance principles in the pension system, expanding social infrastructure, increasing number of electronic services and ensuring access to social services for all citizens, especially the elderly. In order to improve the social well-being of citizens, it's necessary to strengthen the application of technological advantages in the implementation of policies, as well as to increase the knowledge of citizen and exchange of information on digitalization. And of course, for the future of social protection funds and social policies, we think that uh, nowadays the expenditures on the social protection systems are seen uh, not as passive expenditures, but as investments in the economy and stability, along with the strengthening of social protection of population. The volume of these investments directly depends on the use of the economic potential of countries. And the goals of social policy and the opportunity to achieve these goals should be further developed. I would like to note that expenditures for financing social protection payments in Azerbaijan have increased almost 60% over the past three years. But it should be noted that in order to meet modern challenges, both at the regional and global levels, it's very important for countries to hold joint discussion on social issues, which can contribute to building an effective and adequate system of social protection, especially considering the fact that aging happens almost in all European countries today, and it will be happening, increasing the number of people in need of the social protection and decreasing the ratio between working people and people in the pension. So it's a challenge in front of all of us uh, on young nations, on elder nations, where the average age is increasing and more and more uh, people in need for the employment system to cover the expenditures of the social protection system. So that's a major challenge in front of us. And as uh, all countries worldwide, Azerbaijan also uh, struggles on providing further mechanisms to support uh, vulnerable groups of the people. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Your Excellency Babaya, and thank you for presenting these uh, very interesting practices from a young nation and young country. And uh, we particularly appreciated the balanced uh, measures in the domain of social protection and employment, which need to complement each other. Uh, if we don't have further comments, uh, Michael, maybe we can uh, invite our next speaker. We are pleased to invite Dr. Raiko Hayashi from the National Institute of Population and Social Security Research in Japan. The floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, good evening, and good. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me, inviting me over for this important event. I was very um, pleasantly surprised that there is this conference on population aging, population decline, and uh, urban and rural shifts and migration issue, which was. Um, which I see that there is a certain shift of this population global population issue. So having said that, let me just introduce some of the Japanese, oh, I'm from Japan, and so let me try to say, introduce some of the Japanese policies towards this population aging, population decline, and urban rural shifts and migration, because these are the issues we are facing right now, and these are the main policy topics which we are not preparing, but we are living in it. For example, population aging is something that we have been trying hard to cope with it, and now it is becoming a kind of urban rural problem. That is, in rural area of Japan, already population decline is going on, so even the older Older persons, they are not increasing, not so much like 20 years ago. But in the metropolitan area, like near the Tokyo area, Osaka and Nagoya area, there used to be the migration, youth people came in. So now it is their turn to become older persons. So the number of older persons is increasing in the metropolitan area and 
it will create a kind of migration for the caregiver, for the healthcare providers from the rural area to the metropolitan area, which will aggravate the concentration of people in the metropolitan area. So we have to balance between urban and rural, rural, um, rural balance. And also we recently have a kind of um, election, national election, and at the time, people talk a lot for low fertility, how to support the youth, because we have been talking so much for the population aging, and some people started to say that we are spending too much money for older person, not as much for the youth. So now, we are now a kind of trying to balance between the policies for the old persons and the policy for the youth and for the young couples. Dr. Hayashi, can I interrupt you for a second? Could you yes. explain us how these demographic shifts that you're observing in Japan, how would they affect the social systems? You spoke a little bit about the aging of the population, the uneven distribution between the rural and the urban areas, and also about the concentration of healthcare in the urban areas. How do you expect these demographic changes to further challenge the social systems of Japan? Or do you feel Japan has social systems in place that are adequate to deal with these further demographic changes? Dr. Hayashi. So, how to face to this population decline? We are having lower and lower fertility, but we are having longer and longer longevity, and it is the sustainability we have to think about. So, for example, pension system. We have made this macro slide mechanism so that to calculate for the next 100 years so that the pension fund will not expire. And According to this balance, we'll set the pension amount to be paid to the older persons. However, to keep the trust to the pension system, we decided not to increase the proportion of pension premium so that the young people still think that it will be available when they get older. Or we have introduced long-term care insurance in 2000 because before that, um, it was, there was only healthcare insurance and there is a certain burden for the care of the very old people who get disabled. And we have to rebalance this care system. So we separated long-term care from health so that we can contain the cost or so that we can introduce the private public partnership to the service provision. And then also how to cope with this demographic process. One major shift was the policy on the international migration. Since uh, 2016, we, our migration, international migration policy has shifted drastically. We have launched to introduce or to to, to welcome many foreign tourists first to come. And uh, this inbound tourism have promoted the economy and also for the long-term stay here for the workers, we have created many different category of migrants. And also we have started to create many bilateral agreement so that um, the migrants, the international migration, or the migrants who are coming can have the proper protection, which is agreed with Japan and their own country. However, with COVID-19, this international migration trend has been stopped. Dr. Hayashi, thank you very yes. much. Your time is actually up, but I would like to just say that the last point you're raising, I think, is an important point for many countries, my own included, Germany. Uh, in migration, uh, 
uh, is indeed quite important for countries to address all kinds of demographic challenges. Of course, it is also assuming that those migrating into a country will be able to find decent work, will be integrated in the labor market, and can also mm -hmm. benefit from the social systems uh, that are available. But thank you very much uh, for these comments yeah, and for your, for your contribution. Let me turn to the next uh, panelist, Her Excellency Stepankova, the Deputy Minister of Labor and Social Affairs of the Czech Republic. Madam, you have the floor. Good, good afternoon, dear, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, for the possibility to be part of this uh, panel discussion since the uh, demographic change is also a big issue uh, in the Czech Republic. Uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, the social protection system of the Czech Republic should have a quite a lot of space to accommodate population aging. The cost of the Czech social protection system have been below 20% of the GDP for many years. It is, uh, this number is below the EU average, which is uh, currently about 28%. On the other hand, uh, despite those low, low costs, much of the state budget expenditure is already fixed and uh, the room for change is quite limited, especially now when we uh, need to start fiscal consolidation, uh, consolidation after huge deficits caused by the actual pandemics. In the future, tough decisions will have to be made with regard to the limited resources. The, for the Czech Republic, the obvious change is a pension reform that would reflect the demographic reality and provide long-term sustainability of pensions. Now the Czech Republic have pay-as-you-go system. However, the working population is to shrink and the number of pensioners to rise. The population cohorts of uh, 1970s and 80s are numerous and their retirement will bring rapid increase in the number of pensioners and the volume of pensions. So far, uh, the attempts uh, to introduce major reform to the pension system have not been successful. We have made only parametric changes, most notably the gradual increase of retirement age, which is to be 65 for all. Most likely, new, resource, new sources of funding will have to be found outside the pension system to make up for the democratic development. For the Czech Republic, the demographic change is pressing now. In one generation's time, our workforce is to shrink by estimated one million people. It is one worker in six, since our workforce is now six million people. So the Czech market is very tight right now and lack of available workforce limits further economic growth. That is one of the challenges for the future. But we can still do better with the workforce we have. For example, the return of parents of small children to the labor market is difficult. Also, more older workers could remain on the labor market. Uh, the Czech Republic also must establish a comprehensive and transparent system of long-term care. This is one of the big challenges for future futures. Aging will lead to increased demand for such care. And uh, for the future, the key is to reach to find a cooperation between social and health aspect, which in which we hasn't been successful yet. And after that, uh, the issue of funding can be resolved. Apart from that, there will be also the issue of work workforce. Today, it is difficult to find new employees to social or healthcare institutions and the demand will only rise in the future. The technological change may free some workers, but not everybody can work in the, in the care sector. It, it's not only about skills, and in this area, people can't hardly be replaced by machines. Regarding the centralization and the centralization of the social protection, in the Czech Republic, most of the social protection is centralized. All benefits are provided by central government authorities 
and as the Czech Republic is a relatively small country, there is no great need to decentralize the social benefit schemes. What is decentralized to the level of regional and local authorities is most of healthcare and social services. What we still lack is the capacity for more tailored individual case management, which would deal with specific issues through combination of uh, benefits and uh, social work that requires close cooperation between the government and local authorities. And in this area, a lot must be done in the future. We need to seek ways to allow people from remote areas to access services like social service, healthcare, or long-term care. And I also believe that new technology may help with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Stepankova, for the very interesting uh, uh, experiences and practices shared. It was very interesting to note uh, that you mentioned in the end the targeting of services as one of very important measures to be observed. Uh, now we have a pleasure to invite our only in-person uh, uh, panelist today, uh, Mr. Francisco Delgrado Jimenez, Vice Minister for Human Development and Social Inclusion in Costa Rica. The floor is yours. Thank you. Buenas tardes a todas y todos. Firstly, I would like to... ...having us here today discussing such an important issue. Um, and then I would like to share like five or six details about my country, Costa Rica, as a background for those of you that uh, don't know well the, the other side of, of the world. Uh, Costa Rica is an upper middle income country with uh, more or less 5 million inhabitants. Uh, life expectancy is 80 years old. Uh, due to aging population by 2050, uh, the demand of long-term care, long care services will be four times higher than the current uh, level. And currently, uh, half of the women uh, are out of the labor market. So uh, having this in mind, uh, I can go back to, to the questions. Um, Currently, there are uh, many rapid changes, as Michael pointed out at the beginning, happening at the same time, uh, with direct impact on our social protection systems and the way we finance those social services. Uh, demographic change being one, uh, informalization in the context of flexible labor markets and globalization, technological changes. Uh, but if we focus on demographic change only, uh, I think Speaking from a country, we have done the job, the job uh, partially. Uh, we do have a public universal healthcare system. We, um, in the case of pensions, we have a mix of pay-as-you-go, fully funded and non-contributory uh, regimes. Um, with recent, uh, recent changes for its sustainability. And then uh, this year, we have enacted a national public policy on long-term care. Um, which is a milestone itself for a middle-income country, but it also provides a roadmap, a roadmap on how to uh, improve the services that are currently in place, on how to expand the coverage, uh, how to create new services, improve the quality of those services, uh, formalizing jobs, uh, training care providers, etc. It is a policy, uh, I think, with, three, with a triple dividend. It, uh, it recognizes care as a human right. Uh, it promotes gender equality, and it creates conditions for new jobs. Uh, this, however, imposes a debate on, on financing, on, um, which is, I think, a, an essential discussion about our social contracts. Uh, in my view, we need uh, an intergeneration agreement on how young people, like myself, start saving to cover the cost of our probable uh, needs in the future, uh, like an insurance, uh, as we heard from Dr. Hajashi in Japan, we need to create, to create fiscal space um, to expand coverage to middle-income families and also innovative uh, solutions in the fiscal area. For instance, a carbon tax to fund our social protection systems, uh, which at the same time creates incentives to decarbonize our economy. Uh, we know from evidence that having uh, 
a system of social services like this um, would be cheaper than having none. First, because it reduces avoidable medical expenditures, but also, and most importantly, it reduces the burden imposed uh, to women who are usually in charge of providing care to children, people with disabilities, and the older persons. Uh, demographic change might be challenging, but the solution has to be building back better, building a new pillar to our social protection system. Uh, I strongly believe that much more needs to be done uh, to guarantee the social rights uh, and leaving no one behind, uh, but it also creates room for opportunities. Um, it is an opportunity to create jobs in a labor-intensive sector. Uh, robots cannot replace caregivers, I believe. So we need to make sure that the new jobs are formal and the new jobs created, created uh, contribute also to the social protection system itself. Uh, as I said before, it is also an opportunity to eliminate barriers for women entering the labor market. Uh, this means stronger economies, economic empowerment, and building a, a social protection system that works for, for all. Uh, we cannot understand inclusive growth without autonomy uh, of women, for sure. Um, in our view, the steps that we have taken so far are relevant, are feminist, are progressive, and the way we finance this investment should be progressive as well. Uh, let me finish saying this, uh, the historical achievements that Costa Rica has had in the past in the field of social protection make us believe that a more inclusive society is possible. Um, it is up to my generation to close the gaps that erode our democracy, and it is a historical challenge, but it is also a huge opportunity. Thank you. Indeed, thank you so much for your contribution, and I think you two raised a couple of really important points, uh, not just things that can be changed and should be changed, looking into the future and sharing ideas, you know, as regards these changes. You also made an important point that I'm intrigued by, of course, as a macroeconomist. Look, many, many times we look at healthcare expenditures just as a cost, yeah, or it's as pensions, as a cost to a system. But from a macroeconomic perspective, everything that's a cost is income to someone. So spending on healthcare creates jobs in the healthcare sector. Yeah? So what goes around comes around in a certain way and would be really too limited to look at some of these expenditures solely as costs because they're income to people. They can be taxed, they flow back into the system. So I think there's a couple of important points also from an economic perspective that you raised. Now with that, that's a perfect introduction, really, to our next next panelist, uh, Professor Alexia Fürngranz Prischkowitz. If I under, you know, sorry, yeah. um, she's the co-director of the Wittgenstein Center for Demography and Global Human Capital. Alexia, thank you very much for being here. I know you had a super busy schedule and was hard for you to fit it in, but we love to hear from you now how you, from an academic perspective look at, at some of these challenges. Alexia, over to you. Uh, many thanks for the invitation and I feel honored to be part of this panel discussion and I'm learning a lot and I'll try to give you maybe some of our input we are uh, obtaining through our research on these topics and mainly I will focus on the part of social security systems which are related to pension systems. So let me start with the first question we were asked to answer. Are social protection systems and social policies ready for continued demographic change? And here I would argue there's room for improvements. And this judgment uh, is really based on several facts, and I can only mention a few of them. I mean, one of it is my argument there's an outdated definition of old age, there's an outdated definition of family forms, but also outdated definition of employment and work. And also, uh, I would like to argue that there's a very some inequality in access to social policies. So this is just to name a few of the underlying challenges we are facing. Let me define a few of my arguments in a little bit more detail. When I talk about outdated definition of old age, what I really have in mind is to adapt social security systems to an aging population we also need to redefine the concept of aging. 
In generally, we still use the demographic dependency ratio when we argue about the sustainability of our social security systems. However, I think we all know that demographic dependency ratios, they use age as a defining characteristics to differentiate between different population groups, uh, but they are not really taking into account these economic consequences of changing age structures. So in my own work, in a group of many people across the world, we are working on national transfer account, we exactly take up this critique and take it as a starting point. We really try to understand the contributions but also the needs at different ages for different social economic groups across time and across countries. So based on this data, we can get a much better insight into the challenges for our social security systems. Let me just mention two of them. For example, an employment-based dependency ratio is much more adequate, I mean, to cope with these challenges. Here we relate in an employment ratio, we relate uh, in the number of persons who are not employed to the number of employed persons. So this is really what we need to talk about. So there's a large number of people we do know in the working age population who are not employed. And so in fact, an employment dependency ratio is much higher as a poor demographic dependency ratio. Another such ratio could be a transfer-based dependency ratio where we take into account or where we relate in a sense like the public transfers of benefits, but in relation to the taxes and social contributions. So we are really in a sense giving age and meaning by using these different ratios. And this would help us a lot to really, again, I mean, find the challenges and get them right. Now, I also mentioned there's an outdated definition of family forms in many of our discussions. So we do know there's an increasing labor force participation of females. There are much more unstable unions. There are more single households. There are high mobilities when we talk about migration. So this is just to name a few trends we observe nowadays. However, many of our social security systems have not adapted to these changes. And let me just highlight one of them. We do know, for example, that there's a huge transfer, family transfers in terms of time to children and to elderly. And it's mainly uh, to say by females. But on the other uh, side, this is not rewarded in many of our social security systems. So, and in fact, uh, there's a huge gender gap in the claim, in the eligibility, and in the amount of benefits for females, though they are contributing to our society. So I would even argue that there's no free lunch. So if we want to increase labor force participation, I think which is a good thing to include females, to include elderly, et cetera, into our labor market, we also have to think about how we tackle the problem of the transfers, which are taken already now by these people and will then be lost. So this is extremely important. Let me also mention outdated definition of employment and work. What I have in mind here, we are not considering to enough the extent of non-standard employments. Just think of the kick work. We have a lot of really part-time temporary work with almost no social security. So this is a new kind of work we are observing due to technological revolution, etc. But our social security systems have not yet really adapted to this. And the changing life course. So we have phases of education being interrupted also with work and so on. And this needs to be taken into account. And to end up, let me also try to give you some hints where I see a potential of uh, measures and social policies we could really do uh, to adjust to this uh, so far uh, really new forms of families, demographic change. So first of all, and I'm really now referring a lot to many of the Western European countries, especially Austria, we do need a dynamic adjustment of age in the transition from work to retirement. And this should be done according to the healthy aging measures, not just to chronological age. But we have to take care of the heterogeneity. We do know that there is a huge heterogeneity in socioeconomic opportunities. Uh, uh, differences in mortality and all these social security systems, they are then possibly treating them very differently and we need to take care when we implement reforms not to forget about this inequality issue. We need the generally more flexible forms of retirement that allow a better differentiation according to individual circumstances, individual needs, individual preferences, and so on. And uh, let me really say, 
uh, that uh, it's extremely important to consider the gender gap again in pensions because uh, and to re-evaluate, I mean, the contribution of care in our society. So this is extremely important to take this into account. Uh, Though so these measures of increasing labor force, I mean, they will possibly also lead to higher gains in our social security systems. The positive effect, as we know from our research, out, uh, outpaces generally, I mean, these additional gains. So it's really extremely important to include females, unemployed, elderly into the labor market. And last but not least, of course, we do need to have a more risk diverse system, especially in pension systems in Austria. We have uh, a very small base on the second and third pillar, and this needs to be increased definitely in the future to have a multi-pillar pension system, which also helps for risk diversification. But keep in mind, many of these reforms need to consider adverse effects as well. More private pillars in social security system might particularly hit the females who are not yet in the labor force, particularly hit vulnerable groups. So any reform we are taking needs to be accompanied by other reforms like in the labor market or in the healthcare sector, etc. Overall, uh, to end up, demography has not to adjust to the system, but we have to adapt, I think, to the changing demography and that there are costs, but there are opportunities of demographic change, and there's no one-size-fits-all policy. Thank and you, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for these contributions. I think you two raised a number of really important points, and I, I can't possibly repeat all of them, but I think you know one is really also for the audience here to reflect on quite important. The life course has changed completely. You know, we used to have a linear life course, if you like. We went to school, we got a job, we retired. And our social systems have been built around that. Okay? They're supporting education, they're supporting your transition to work. Well, if you become unemployed, there's unemployment benefits. At some point, you have a pension. But you know, the life course isn't like this anymore. The life course is completely different. It's random. You, you, go, you, get, a, you get an education, maybe you get a job. Maybe you lose your job, maybe you become self-employed, uh, self you become an entrepreneur. Maybe you go back to education and training to get another job. Maybe you want to take some time off to t care for your child or to care for an older person. You come back into the labor market. You know, this is the life path of the future. Yeah? And our social systems we don't, really don't match that uh, at all in many ways. So I think that's just one of, the, one of the issues that you've raised. Of course, you also refer to the work of our colleague Sergei Sherbov, that we use prospective aging rather maybe as an indicator of when people get old and maybe can claim pensions. So I think, thank you very much for these contributions. Thank you, Michael, for the comment. And uh, thank you once again, Professor, also for mentioning the national transfer accounts and uh, to inspiring us to review the definition of older age and employment in our analysis, because we uh, do conduct national transfer accounts in several countries of, of the region. Uh, now we would like to uh, get a little bit uh, of perspective from the Parliamentary Commission on Social Protection, Health and Family from the Republic of Moldova. Uh, and we, we invite Dan Persiun uh, to address us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the possibility to uh, be here today. I will try to give you a brief idea of where Moldova is currently standing uh, on this issue. Um, so just a bit of context. So Moldova is a country of about three and a half million people. Uh, of which over 1 million have uh, left the country over the last um, 20 years. We are currently uh, in a situation when we have fewer workers than pensioners, and we expect over the next 10 to 15 years to have up to a third of the population over the age of 60, and up to 25% of the population over the age of uh, 65. Although we have recently raised um, the pension, uh, the minimum pension in the country, it is still uh, somewhere around $120 um, at the moment. And we are also in a region uh, where our current rates of economic growth um, do not match those of our neighbors, 
uh, nor those of the countries uh, where our many of our um, citizens uh, choose to to live. Therefore, uh, we are in a probably in a more complicated situation than uh, some of the other countries that have spoken here today, because we have both a fastly shrinking population. Uh, we are a mid-level income country, and we have modest rates of economic growth, and we have historically had those for. Um, the last uh, 10 to, to 15 years. Um, and this, of course, uh, puts us in a, a rather difficult, uh, difficult situation. We have recently raised the pension age uh, as a solution to ensure the sustainability of the pension fund that is already uh, funded up to 40% from the state budget. Um, and has a significant uh, deficit uh, problem. So um, given this, uh, we are searching for major structural reforms that could be done to, to address um, the, the problems we are facing. Of course, one of the solutions that has been also put forward today refers to active aging uh, and uh, ensuring that people after they retire, they continue to work. In Moldova, actually, we have quite a high rate. We have about 30% of people that continue to work after reaching the pension age. Maybe not so much because we want to, but because the pensions are uh, small enough, uh, too small, so they uh, will continue to be in employment to supplement their income. So um, on this front, perhaps there is less uh, opportunity to, to going even further, but uh, it's something to explore. We have some uh, space for increasing the participation of women uh, on the, in the labor force. And this is something we will consider um, significantly next year. We have just had a change of government 100 days ago. So now we are in the middle of uh, thinking through the, the major things to do uh, over the next two years or so. One of those will be concerning incentivizing women to return sooner to work. Um, another thing would be to increase the participation of people with disabilities, which in the country is very low at the moment compared to uh, other countries in the region, um, and much less than it is in um, uh, the European Union. That could be uh, something to explore. Uh, and then, um, as the colleagues from Japan mentioned, um, the idea or the possibility of creating um, attractive conditions for um, labor force from abroad might be something that we will have to inevitably consider as a country, although it's not a particularly politically popular solution. And I'm skeptical that it will become politically popular anytime soon. But um, given the huge outflow of our citizens to European countries, um, we might find ourselves in such um, a situation. Um, the current uh, uh, life expectancy at birth in Moldova is only 69.7, and we have a pension age of 63. Uh, so the, the, the difference is far smaller than in all the other countries in the region. And of course, such a high pension age creates significant political problems. And as you can imagine, in any country, um, well, we had a, a corruption problem, but in any country uh, with a poverty, significant poverty issues, um, any complicated structural reforms in, in social protection might, um, and on the political significant costs, Mm, are very difficult to, to implement and, and push, push through, and um, they create space for uh, populist uh, approaches and politicians willing to uh, fight against necessary structural changes um, uh, without having kind of a, a long term, a long term, without taking a long long term perspective on on, on this. So. Um, Ooh. Mr. Pershun, 
your that's, time that's your time is up so if you yes. want to summarize maybe your key message yeah, uh, my key message, my key message would be that Moldova is probably in a more difficult situation than most other countries with low economic growth and a quickly shrinking population. And what we will focus on is increasing labor participation, mm. uh, uh, in particular of women, people with disabilities, uh, supporting active aging and uh, exploring the possibility to ease access to uh, foreign uh, workers to, to the country. Thank you so much. Yeah, indeed. I think, you know, your key recommendations that you just outlined now, I think they echo a lot of what has been said by others. You know, a lot of proposals directly or indirectly that were put forward focused on maybe postponing the retirement age, maybe based on prospective aging, keeping all the persons engaged for longer, engaging the inactive, in the, the inactive labor force in the labor market more, in particular women, we heard from Costa Rica, um, potentially migrants, you know, if there is a labor shortage or a skills shortage. So we heard a lot about financing in a way by engaging more people yeah, in the labor market for longer. And that of course contributes to financing through, contrib uh, through contributions, but it is assuming that everybody who's engaged in the labor market does in fact have a productive and remunerative employment and is able to make contributions to the systems. And as we also heard is a lot of jobs are not that formal anymore. The, the jobs are changing. We have platform economies, we have different kinds of work. But our last speaker, he's from the ILO, the International Labor Organization. He's a public finance economist and he's heading currently the department for actuarial analysis. So Helmut Schwarzer, you have the floor. So many thanks, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you very much to the government of Bulgaria and to our sister organization UNFPA for the invitation to the ILO to participate. Also our greetings to the members of the panel. Uh, some of them are uh, our constituents uh, of the ILO, the ministries of labor, workers, employers. We are a tripartite uh, organization. I'm um, I, I'm going to maybe focus on two or three uh, messages uh, given the shortage of time. Um, and so, following the questions, uh, I, I would like to um, of building upon what uh, uh, the previous participants have already said. I, I would like to remind that. Uh, um, ILO has um, an international labor conference, which meets each year where our constituents discuss uh, uh, relevant um, issues of the world of, of work and uh, social protection. And that uh, in 2013, there has been uh, an extensive debate by our constituents on uh, how labor markets and social protection um, conjugate with the new demographic trends uh, in the world and uh, which kind of policies uh, our constituents recommend um, to, uh, to be promoted. And uh, the result was um, uh, quite a, a sum of what has been, uh, been mentioned here in this panel. Uh, so not only reforms of the social protection systems um, are important, they are important, of course, adapting to the to the age increase adapting to the to the changes in in concepts for example the the role of of women in the world of work uh, many systems have been um, designed in uh, with a concept of family which is uh, outdated as uh, professor alexia has has mentioned very well and other concepts uh, also need to be updated but also um, a, a second layer of uh, reforms that uh, countries need to adopt uh, according to our constituents is uh, labor market uh, policies that um, firstly um, promote the creation of employment so we need macroeconomic uh, favorably favorable environment we need um, policies that uh, generate more jobs. Um, this depends, of course, of uh, the development model that the respective countries uh, adopt. Uh, but active labor market policies are extremely relevant. Uh, formalization strategies in those cases where uh, the 
there is a space uh, in terms of formalization of um, part of the enterprises and uh, and jobs in the labor market more jobs adapted to the aged um, it goes uh, even to to issues like um, fighting the discrimination all forms of discrimination in the labor market um, one of the predecessors in this panel mentioned uh, disabled uh, persons um, um, then there is also discrimination uh, against other population groups which needs to be to be addressed so that you can increase the participation rates uh, in the labor market. Um, also, uh, another, another um, um, area where uh, countries can um, uh, strengthen their efforts um, is uh, reducing employment injury cases. Uh, people who, um, who leave the labor force due to sickness or due to accidents uh, increase rehabilitation um, and even issues like traffic accidents in in some countries are still massive uh, issues that um, hit those in productive age and hit those in um, who 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 would be contributors and become early beneficiaries of the of the system instead. So this, uh, I, what I mean is that our constituents have told us um, look at it as an integral issue, not only as a reform of the social protection systems, which is important to keep them actuarially balanced, to adjust the variables of the social protection system, but also um, look at the labor market side, uh, the policies that can help uh, providing a stronger basis for the social protection system. Uh, then I, I go to the uh, International Labor Conference of 2019, uh, shortly before the pandemic uh, erupted. And um, in that labor conference in 2019, because the ILO completed 100 years, there was a centenary declaration on the future of work, which our constituents have uh, issued. And in that, um, in that declaration, um, they uh, recommended us to promote universal social protection as uh, also the mm -hmm. sustainable development goals uh, promote um, and uh, adapt the social security systems, including the contributory systems to all forms of work. So in many countries, we still do not have uh, the self-employed um, as mandatory uh, affiliated to the social protection systems and uh, the new forms of work, which have already been mentioned here by uh, in, in many occasions in this panel, they can also be included and then the systems need to adapt uh, their rules, their administrative rules, their uh, the ways how they communicate with a different uh, population uh, to, to extend that, uh, that uh, contribution. And finally, I, I, I'm not going to take um, much more time because hopefully there is a don't, second round. You don't have much more time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, so I, I really welcome the idea that Professor Alexia uh, Fönkans has mentioned of the multi-pillar systems, you know, because, um, well, in a very simple way, you don't put all eggs in the same basket. You, know? you, you need to have different uh, uh, regimes which run in parallel, which are coordinated, but which work on, on the basis of different principles so that uh, at least one of them uh, can uh, can cover the needs of a certain type of population, and uh, we have the Convention 102 in the ILO that that uh, speaks about the minimum uh, standards that these uh, schemes need to comply with. Uh, many of the countries uh, which are here at this uh, panel and at the conference have ratified Convention 102. And uh, this is, I think, a uh, good guidance for uh, building systems for the future uh, of work and democracy. Thank you, Helmut. Thank you for this contribution. Look, we are going to have a second round, but that's going to be a very quick one. So just to give you, give you a heads up. Um, but let me just reflect on something. You know, this is on the financing of social policies in a new demographic era. And we did speak about finance, you know, even if you didn't hear the word finance a lot, but you heard a lot of the, about integrating people into the labor market. You know, and as I said, in a way, integrating people into the labor market, that is financing because that gives you contributions provided they are in the formal economy 
in some way. So financing about social protection in many ways is really about the right macroeconomic policies, about investment in physical and human capital, about kinds of investments that create a favorable environment for employment. Yeah. So I think that's really the, the flip side, if you like, of financing social protection, and that's key. But you know, there were many things that you've mentioned in this conversation, and uh, we're now going to our final round, or uh, you know, um, or to your final answers to the last question. And for that, I give the floor again to my colleague Borka. Thank you, Michael. Um, and uh, we would like now to just ask a very concrete question, and we will be offering 20 seconds to each of the panelists to give us an inspiring advice on how to focus uh, the policy and practice community on the financing of social policies that we plan to establish and launch after this conference. So what do you think our community of practice should focus on in order to help countries uh, develop demography proof, uh, proof and the resilient social systems? So we will start again for His Excellency Babayev. Uh, thank you very much. Indeed, definitely we should do this dialogue and every nation, every country do have its own particularities, but the general uh, general uh, approach and uh, general challenges across uh, exist in each country. Definitely we are in favor of this their dialogue as well as in favor of the, uh, this type of policy and practice, uh, practice community. And of course, we should focus more and more on social support to the vulnerable uh, groups. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now invite uh, Dr. Hayashi. Um, in 20 seconds, maybe we should say that we should keep on talking and uh, share information, share good practice, and also using ICT this kind of online platform, it will be much easier. And uh, bringing out all the data to share so that each one can understand. Thank you very Thank you. much. Uh, His Excellency Stepankova, what would be your advice? Uh, Thank you very much. Very briefly, maybe just two, two sentences. We know that uh, uh, labor-related revenues won't suffice and some revenues may be linked to production instead of labor so this may be an area to focus on and the second probably uh, is uh, the possibility to focus on better targeting of social policies to people that really need it so the current resources are used uh, in better and in more effective way thank you very much your Excellency, uh, Jimenez. Thank you. I think this conference is a perfect example of things that should be done and could be replicated in different parts of the world to address specific issues. Um, a policy and practice committee should be a platform also to discuss and share experiences about uh, social protection throughout the life cycle, um, how to create bridges with the private sector, and how to create bridges uh, with the academia to produce stronger data and evidence for our policies. Thank you very much. Professor Alexia? Yeah, many thanks. So my suggestion would be to build up resilient systems in social security that adjust to the changing education, changing labor market requirements, but in combination with changing demographic life causes. And secondly, they have to react to unforeseen shocks, which we observed 2008 financial crisis, now the health shocks. These are shocks affecting the employment, affecting interest rates, etc. And thirdly, let me also say we have to start to reduce inequality, not at the end of life, but at the beginning of life to manage to have it reduced at the end of life as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Persio. Yes, uh, for us, uh, the policy and practice community should focus on as much uh, sharing of knowledge as, as possible. We have shared the challenges and I'm sure we can 
learn from one another and uh, there are countries that have more experience with dealing with these issues and have encountered them sooner than us and it would be great uh, for us to explore that uh, that knowledge and, and, to, and to learn from uh, from others and in terms of priorities uh, targeting would be something we would be very interested in and looking at and also a better understanding what opportunities does technological change entail for uh, increasing the sustainability of our of our systems thank you thank you very much and finally helmut from ilo would you have one last advice yeah yeah well i'm um well we are approaching quickly approaching christmas and uh, my wish uh, would be uh, to for for the next biennium because the ILO works uh, in two year cycles i would like to develop um, uh, thinking about how to broaden the taxation basis for social protection and uh, taking into account that uh, the wages as a percentage of GDP have been reduced. Right? The proportion of, of wages as a total of, uh, of production has, has fallen. And on the other hand, uh, this easy way that sometimes uh, has been recommended to increase consumption taxes actually increases inequality. So which other sources of financing could be developed and if there are concrete experiences among the countries to be exchanged, that would be something very interesting. And I like to listen to the uh, suggestion of Costa Rica, for example, of how to use environmental taxation. Um, and maybe there are other similar experiences in among the countries present at this conference. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, all very much. I think it has been a complicated and complex conversation. I think we have also realized that while there are some similarities and similar recommendations that were put forward by the different countries, there are differences between countries. Um, you know, we have some countries that still have a youthful population. We have some that have a much older population like Japan. So there's also opportunity for an exchange of knowledge for mutual learning, and we take this forward as we are designing and thinking about the policy and practice communities that uh, will come out of this conference. So from my side, let me just thank you on behalf of UNFPA and the organizers for being part of this panel, and I'm also looking forward to continuing this conversation with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Um, uh, thank you. And well, I'd like to congratulate again the members of uh, the panel on financing for the excellent uh, and very insightful discussions. Um, we are going to proceed with the closing in just a moment. So I would like to ask you to please do not leave the room. You can stretch, you can stand up. And we will be starting as soon as we can rearrange the stage and get all participants here. Thank you very much.
Yes. Почваме. Уважаеми министри, уважаеми госпожи и... Dear ministers, dear ladies and gentlemen, I uh, am thankful for the privilege to open the closing uh, part. For us, it was a big honor and an extreme uh, uh, pleasure. Bulgaria to be the host of the conference uh, to shape uh, the demographic uh, future of Europe. Uh, it's uh, which has been organized by the Population Fund of the EU. And the final of such a forum presupposes that we have to share uh, impressions about the idea which found an environment which is good for the understanding and development. I allow myself to quote Mrs. Natalia Kanem, Deputy General Secretary of the UN and Executive Director of the Fund of Population. People, not uh, figures, are the driving force for the demographic development of societies. And uh, according to the President of uh, Bulgaria, Roman Radov, people are the most valuable and the most important portion of our civilized community. Uh, and uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, Gulab Donov, added, each person is invaluable. And uh, he appealed for the setup of a, a network of policies for the young people, families, children, and uh, all the people without privileges to a specific age group uh, because every person is of value. It's, uh, we have to note uh, what has been mentioned through the first plenary uh, session. The dark demographic forecast uh, for before seven, eight years uh, did not come true in their most negative part. Uh, according to uh, Mrs. Natalia Kanem, Sophie Alliance is a milestone for the establishment of ideas and solutions for demographic resilience. It's uh, certainly when we speak about the demographic uh, future, the leading role uh, belongs to women and young girls. Uh, it depends on them whether they will create families uh, with uh, a sufficient number of healthy, educated, and active children. Mrs. Cunham uh, turned attention to the importance of setting up uh, societies where the equality of genders is a value, not uh, uh, violence to women. Mm, societies which create conditions for the harmonic uh, matching of uh, family and professional life. The aging of the population, mainly in Europe, uh, is a significant problem of uh, societies. As was emphasized by uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of Bulgaria, Mr. Golub Donev, the process of aging uh, of the population requires adjustment of all uh, public systems for to realize the opportunities uh, uh, provided by the longer life uh, in good health and social activity. The Republic of Bulgaria created demographic strategy addressing, uh, above all, the investment into people. In the ministerial dialogue uh, uh, dedicated to aging, uh, participants as well pointed out the necessity of adapting social systems for care uh, to be able to um, meet the growing number of aging people. The policies uh, for activate for in promotion of active life of uh, aging people to be preserved uh, and uh, establish their link with the society. Uh, overcoming poverty is among serious demographic challenges. Uh, the representatives of uh, um, Central Asia presented their vision about the solution of the problem, which place young people in the focus of policies, creating conditions uh, to obtain good education. 
and uh, to be realized on the labor market. In the same spirit were the, as well the conclusions by academia, which confirmed that a uh, functioning mechanism for the successful overcoming of demographic uh, um, challenges uh, is uh, to stake on well-educated people. It's, of course, necessary to invest both in uh, uh, rural regions in area as well as in whole states uh, where the negative uh, demographic process uh, are being observed. Uh, the uh, reasonable uh, management of uh, migration processes could turn into a main source of uh, demographic benefits through the integration into society and uh, including inclusion with uh, good education. Demographic trends uh, for the um, reduction of fertility, the birth rate, uh, uh, are not uh, an unfavorable forecast. Uh, this is the present which requires to get ready for the future. Our vision for uh, the sustainable demographic development is uh, linked uh, with the idea for investment in people through uh, high quality education and health care quality and safe uh, jobs, uh, uh, support to people in vulnerable situations, policies for early childhood development, promotion of uh, active aging. The decade of demographic resilience has its main uh, goal to set a path uh, to solutions uh, uh, which take people uh, into consideration we, without difference of gender, age, education. We keep the key. The uh, slogan of the Bulgarian capital, which was uh, uh, host of the conference, uh, is grows without aging. Age but, uh, but grows, let's be a message to all of us. So most important is that not words, but the actions of all of us uh, will define the future. I'm opening the decade of demographic resilience. Excellencies, Madam Deputy Minister Nadia Klyususka, Madam Deputy Minister Zaritza Dinkova, Deputy Minister Ivan Krastev, Ambassador Yotov, Ambassador Stoeva, Andreas Edel, who is online with us, I believe, from Population Europe. There you are. Uh, dear partners and friends, it is my great pleasure to offer some closing remarks on behalf of UNFPA, the United Nations Population Fund. And what an amazing two days of discussion it has been. Over 50 countries and over 1,000 participants across three continents have participated in person and online. 750 people visited the Virtual Demographic Resilience Expo, where 38 partners shared evidence and experience and opportunities for networking. Allow me to share a few takeaways from the deliberations from the perspective of UNFPA. First, we have heard a strong and positive vision of what the region's vibrant demographic future can look like. This is in striking contrast to the often negative and crisis-driven narrative that we see in parts of the media and in public discourse. It's a vision of countries and societies that anticipate and understand the demographic changes that they are experiencing. It's a vision grounded on evidence and one that recognizes, as the UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed so eloquently said on day one, that demographic shifts, like other megatrends, cannot be easily undone or changed in the short term, but they can be shaped over time by consistent policy. And as the EU VP for Democracy and Demography said, it's time to switch to actively building demographic resilience. To approach demographic change not in crisis mode with short-term emergency measures, but in a sober, strategic, and comprehensive manner. And a vision that sees demographic change as an opportunity 
to break down rigid categories of age, sex, gender, social status, and build more inclusive, more diverse, and ultimately stronger societies. Stronger, perhaps, not necessarily in numbers, but in human capital, productivity, talent, soft power. As Professor Lutz reminded us, it's not the headcount that matters, but what is in those heads. Second, what has been striking to us at UNFPA is the wealth of experience and know-how that we've had in this room and online in our virtual space. It's clear that there is no one silver bullet to solve the challenges that we face. There also isn't necessarily just one model that's right. Instead, countries are trying out different approaches, reflecting on their very specific economic, social, and cultural contexts. As the Bulgarian Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Labor and Social Policy said yesterday, we are in some ways like a toddler trying to walk in this new demographic reality. Inevitably, not all approaches will work. There will be an element of trial and error. But we believe, and this is my third takeaway, that if we put people with their human rights and choices at the center, including women, young people, older people, and those pushed to the margins, and if policies are firmly grounded in evidence, if they're comprehensive and consistent, we will be successful in making the most of the opportunities that come with demographic change. We also know that more gender equal societies are doing better with dealing with demographic change, and we've heard how demography is so closely intertwined with the future of our democracies. And this is why I'm so excited that we are launching the Decade of Demographic Resilience today. It's our hope that the decade will galvanize action in the region for enabling countries to thrive in a world of rapid de demographic change. Over the next 10 years, we will come together every two years to take stock of progress, sustain political support, and showcase successful new initiatives to address demographic change. And you have all, here and online, shown your commitment to the decade and to the SOFIA Alliance that we're also launching today. This new community of action that brings together governments and policymakers with leading experts and other stakeholders to share lessons learned, good practices and new evidence, and to co-create concrete solutions for the demographic challenges that our countries are facing. We really count on you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, as we're closing this conference, I am confident that we can be optimistic about Europe's demographic future. Let's not lose the momentum. And with that, I'd like to express my deepest gratitude on behalf of UNFPA to all of the participants from government, including local government, uh, civil society, private sector, and the media who shared their insights and experiences, as well as the people that we have here from academia who have given really the state-of-the-art knowledge on so many of the issues we've discussed. Thank you to the dialogue leads and the moderators who steered the discussion so ably. And many thanks to the audience here in Sofia and online for your interest and active engagement. Finally, I'd like to express our deepest gratitude to the government of the Republic of Bulgaria for hosting and co-organizing this event. To His Excellency uh, President Radev to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Labor and Social Policy. Thanks really to everyone behind the scenes who made this event a success, the technical team. I think they deserve a huge round of applause. <laughs> Organizing a hybrid event must be one of the most challenging jobs that anyone, we, we found that out. So thank you so much to the interpreters. Thank you um, to so many staff from the Bulgarian ministries and, of course, my own dear UNFPA colleagues from the regional office, the country offices. Uh, really, thank you all so, so much. Blagodaria, and I wish us all um, a wonderful continuation of this work. Over to you. Thank you. Excellencies, dear participants, 
for the start, I can't resist but mention that I feel so privileged for being part of such a strong female panel. It's quite something. Uh, I would like to thank you all for your active participation in this ministerial conference on demographic resilience, shaping Europe's demographic future. The objective of this conference was to provide a platform for discussing how to address rapid demographic changes and problems in an innovative way. The last two discussions showed that we all face similar demographic challenges and that we are all determined to find solutions. It has also become clear that there isn't a single or quick fix. Countries are only as strong as their population are resilient. For that reason, demographic resilience should to be considered as a matter of priority. The interconnectedness applies also to demography, and we should not forget that demography is the technical term for human capital. Demographic resilience is a sine qua non for achieving the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030. Therefore, the decade of dem demographic resilience, which was just announced, will fit into the decade of action to achieving the CDGs. Demographic resilience means putting people first while leaving no one behind. And this conference has shown that we are all committed to that. Another point that has become evident is that all countries from the region have to work together to ensure that those challenges turn into opportunities. I'm happy that through this conference, the SOFIA Alliance is being launched. It will help bring together interested, government, interested governments and policymakers at national and local level with leading experts from academia, civil society, the private sector, and other relevant stakeholders to share best practices and co-create solutions to the demographic challenges that countries are facing. While we are coming to the end of this conference, this is actually only the beginning of a process. And we have a horizon of 10 years during, during which we can turn the trend and seize the opportunities. Bulgaria is particularly pleased to have co-organized this conference together with UNFPA and looks forward to working closely with all of you to bring to, fu to fruition the innovative ideas that emerged in the last two days. We all need to keep the course as our actions are shaping Europe's, Europe's demographic future. Thank you. Uh, gracias. Спасибо. Merci. Благодаря. Uh, Dr. Andreas Edel, are you still online? There you are. Okay. Yeah, Our apologies. <laughs> Good to yeah, see you connected. Thank you so much, uh, your, your Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me first start with thanking uh, the colleagues uh, at United Nations Population Fund for their excellent work uh, to bring us all together uh, at this exciting conference, also on behalf of all the partners of, of Population Europe. I'm also grateful for the kind invitation to say a few words at this closing session. We all had the privilege uh, to gain many insights in the last two days from a tremendously rich uh, knowledge exchange and inspiring debates. This shows how much we can learn from transdisciplinary dialogue across the different fields of work in the policy arena, as well as in the world of science, and from an international dialogue across borders in Europe and beyond. And the best part is that it came with the promise of a continuation, the SOFIA Alliance. Demographic change has often been considered relevant for a distant future. 
but it's happening now and today. The conference has convincingly shown that this is not a threat, nor a destiny. It's a challenge, but a challenge we can meet. And it's already been met by many on different fronts. A proof of that uh, are all the initiatives and best practices that have been presented at the Demographic Expo. I hope you had the opportunity to visit the booth. I was truly amazed by the richness of all the initiatives. It's now the time to think on what's next. We need to adapt our societies, but also ourselves as individuals to demographic change. And I would highlight here only three points, flexibility, empowerment, and well-being. First, we need more flexible pathways and new forms of working lives. This has been extensively mentioned in the sessions. We have to better understand the pros and cons of new opportunities of the digital world, such as online learning, remote work, and flexible working time arrangements. We have to support more diverse teams in the labor market, more inclusive in terms of age, gender, and ethnicity. Second, we have to invest in empowerment at the same time to make a better use of the human capital we have, as Dr. Kahnem pointed out. We should invest particularly into the education and mobility of younger people, starting from age zero. Lifelong learning, of course, has, is also of key importance. Third, we have also learned in these two days that policies supporting people's well-being bring solid results from avoiding emigration to allowing women to have the numbers of kids they wish to have. COVID-19 was only one of the crises we have witnessed in past decades, and it was probably not the last that generations living today will face in their lifetime. Besides of demographic change, climate change is very obviously the challenge ahead of us, and we have to look more into how both challenges are linked. A sustainable and green future can only be achieved if societies embrace population diversity. If we think about climate change adaptation, it largely depends on whether people have the economic resources at hand, whether they live in metropolitan or rural regions, or whether they have to care for children or dependent family members. If we do not understand the social demographic patterns of our populations and how they change over time, many measures undertaken will not be successful as those uh, they are designed for will not be able to adapt themselves to it. And this does not only apply to climate change, but also to many other policy fields, such as pension reforms or public health. But let me stop here. Conferences like the one we are concluding now are an important way to understand what has been achieved, but more so an important starting point to develop new ways into a better future. Thanks again for UNFPA that they gave us an opportunity to think into a future which has already begun. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Edel. Thank you, all the participants, our partners. Let's work together and let's keep our optimism for the future. Thank you. So, because, because nobody wants to leave, actually, may, maybe we can do a, a photo. But before that, I did want to also thank the Diplomatic Institute, um, because I didn't mention them. But the work that Tanya and her team have been doing has been extraordinary. So thank you all so, so very much. And then, of course, I have to mention Juliana, because I'm mentioning names already. If I keep going, I'll be mentioning everyone in this conference, but Juliana, thank you so much for all your work from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. How about a photo? Do you think we can manage that if we do it masked for those who would like to?